Welcome everyone to this very, very important hearing. Uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, state a few things. Uh, these are some ground rules, pretty much the same as uh, what former chairman and my friend Senator Leahy and others have done, uh, stated in the past. Uh, I want everyone to be able to uh, watch the hearing without obstruction. Uh, if people stand up and block the view of those behind them or speak out of turn, it's not fair or considerate to others. So officers would then remove those individuals. I know that there's a lot to, to protest regarding this administration's policies, but this isn't the time or place to do it. Uh, before I turn to our opening statements, I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items and explain how we're going to proceed. Uh, Senator Leahy and I will give our opening statements. Then I will call on Senators Schumer and Gillibrand to introduce the nominee. Following Ms. Lynch's opening remarks, we'll begin with the first round of questions in which each senator will have 10 minutes. After the first round, we're going to do eight minute rounds of questions. I want everyone to know that I'm prepared to stay here as long as members have questions that they'd like to ask. I think this is the most fair way to proceed both to the uh, responsibilities of the Senate and senators and most importantly to the nominee who has to sit here through all of this and answer our questions. And I think we all know that this is a very important position in the cabinet and we should do what we can to uh, move it along within our rules. 
Uh, we have a lot of ground that we want to cover in live questioning. One final note on scheduling. I, I would like to take a short break of maybe 45 minutes, sometime around 12.30 or 1 o'clock. And I know that we have a series of stacked votes this afternoon. And in regard to, I think, 18 amendments we have to vote on, uh, the plan right now is to keep this hearing going, even though it may be a very chaotic way to do things and maybe not as respectful to the uh, position of attorney general as ought to be, but I don't know how else to get through the process to get every question asked that wants to be asked. So I would ask that all of my colleagues remain uh, very flexible uh, and keep it going, and that means uh, some accommodation by members on my side of the aisle to uh, chair when I can't uh, be here over there voting. With that, I'm going to turn to my opening statement, then immediately go to uh, Senator um, Leahy. Ms. Lynch, uh, I've had a chance to talk to you privately on two occasions. I welcome you uh, to the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's a very big day for you, and especially for family and friends that are proud of you. I congratulate you on your nomination. You've already been confirmed by the Senate as U.S. Attorney, but the process involved to serve as the 83rd Attorney General is a bit more rigorous. For one thing, U.S. Attorneys don't even have hearings, let alone one like this. So I'm, my hope is that we discuss some of the most important matters facing our nation. And in the process of doing that, then we'll get to know you a bit better. The fact of the matter is, this nomination comes at a pivotal time for the Department of Justice and for our country. And as I discuss some of those things, those are probably things you have had nothing to do with. But you have an opportunity to make some changes. The next Attorney General will face some very difficult challenges from combating cybercrime to protecting our children from exploitation to helping fight the war on terror. But I'm not just concerned about the tough decisions that come with the office. There are challenges facing the Department of Justice that go to the heart of our system of government. How about restoring faith in the bedrock principles like respect for the rule of law and the fair and even-handed application of those laws? How about restoring respect for the co-equal branches of government? How about taking care that the law is faithfully executed and not rewrite, rewritten? How about the Department of Justice honoring, once again, its longstanding duty to vigorously defend our nation's laws even when political appointees disagree with the policy? Then there is the Office of Legal Counsel. I'm interested in returning that office to its rightful place as the impartial crown jewel of the Justice Department. Its opinion should be firmly rooted in the Constitution's text, neutral interpretation of statutes, and sound judicial precedent. They shouldn't be transparently self-serving attempts to justify whatever the president or an attorney general wants to do for political reasons. And let me say it right here. The Office of Legal Counsel should be sharing with the American public the opinions it's providing to the president, especially when they supposedly sanction the unprecedented authority that the president claims to possess. And I'm going to work to see that it does. The public's business ought to be public Transparency, I believe, and in fact does bring accountability. These ideals and principles are foundational to the Republic. But ideals and principles aren't simply academic, and they don't exist in a vacuum. Over the last few years, public confidence in the Department's ability to do its job without regard to politics has been shaken with good reason. It's not just Republicans who see the problem or who recognize it as a real-world effects uh, on our own fellow Americans. The department's own inspector general listed as one of its top management challenges, quote, restoring confidence in the integrity, fairness, and accountability of the department, end of quote. The IG cited several examples, including the department's 
falsely denying basic facts in the Fast and Furious controversy, the Inspector General concluded this, quote, resulted in an erosion of trust in the department, end of quote. In that fiasco, our government knowingly allowed firearms to fall into the hands of international gun traffickers, and it led to the death of patrol agent Brian, uh, uh, parole a patrol agent Di uh, Brian Terry. And then after Congress called on the leadership of the department to, to account for this foolish operation, what did they do? Did they apologize to the family and rush to uncover the truth? Quite the opposite. They denied, spun, and hid the facts from Congress and the American people. They bullied and intimidated whistleblowers, members of the press, and anyone who had audacity to investigate and to uncover the truth. The department has also failed to hold another government agency accountable the Internal Revenue Service. We watched with dismay as that powerful agency was weaponized and turned against individual citizens. And why? What exactly did these fellow citizens do to make their government target them? They had the courage to get engaged and speak out in defense of faith, freedom, and our Constitution. And for what? They, they then were targeted by the IRS. What was the Justice Department's reaction uh, to the targeting of citizens based on political beliefs? Well, they appointed a campaign donor to lead an investigation that hasn't gone anywhere and call it then a day. That simply isn't good enough. Meanwhile, the department's top litigator, the nation solicitor general, is arguing in case after case for breathtaking expansion of federal power. I'd like to have you consider this. Had the department prevailed in just some of the arguments that it pressed before the Supreme Court in the last several years, there would be essentially no limit on what the federal government could order states to do as a condition for receiving federal money. Uh, another case, the Environmental Protection Agency could define a homeowner $75,000 a day for not complying with an order and then turn around and deny that homeowner any right to challenge um, the order or those fines in court when the order is issued. The federal government could review decisions by religious organizations regarding who can serve as a minister. The federal government could ban books that expressly advocate for the election or defeat of political candidates. And the Fourth Amendment wouldn't have anything to say about a police attaching a GPS device to a citizen's car without a warrant and constantly tracking their every movement for years or for months and years. These positions aren't mainstream, in my judgment. At the end of the day, the common thread that binds all these challenges together, in my judgment, is a Department of Justice that is very deeply politicized. But that's what happens when an Attorney General of the United States views himself, and these are his own words, as the President's wingman. I don't expect Ms. Lynch, and I will agree on every issue, but I, for one, need to be persuaded that she will be an independent attorney general, and I have no reason to believe at this point she won't be. The attorney general's job is to represent the American people, not just the president, not just the executive branch. So today we will hear from Ms. Lynch. To, uh, uh, as far as I know, Ms. Lynch has nothing to do with the Department of Justice problems that I just outlined. But uh, as new Attorney General, she can fix them. Uh, tomorrow, we'll hear from a second panel of witnesses, many of whom will speak directly to the many challenges facing the Justice Department. Uh, as I listen to both panels, I'll be considering whether Ms. Lynch has what it takes to fix the uh, Obama Justice Department. We need to get back then to first principles and that starts with depoliticizing the Department of Justice because the American people deserve it together. So I hope Ms. Lynch can fix these flaws. Senator Leahy. Thank you. I, um, I won't speak as long because I just want to focus on Loretta Lynch and not on all the problems that some may see in this country. It is a pleasure to welcome her to this committee. She's smart, she's tough, she's hardworking, independent. She's a prosecutor's prosecutor, and her qualifications are beyond reproach. She's been unanimously confirmed by the Senate twice before to serve as the top federal prosecutor based in Brooklyn, New York. 
And I hope we have another swift confirmation for Ms. Lynch. As U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, she's brought terrorists and cyber criminals to justice. She's obtained convictions against corrupt public officials from both political parties. <clears throat> she's fought tirelessly against violent crime and financial fraud. She's remained determined to protect the rights of victims. Ms. Lynch has worked hard to improve the relationships between law enforcement and the communities they serve. And probably that's one of the reasons why her, her nomination enjoys strong support from both. She has prosecuted those who have committed crimes against police officers, as well as police officers who have committed crimes. Her record shows that, as Attorney General, Ms. Lynch will effectively, fairly, and independently enforce the law. I hope we all remember that she is the nomination for Attorney General, and that's why I'm focusing on her. She's born in North Carolina, the daughter of a Baptist preacher and a school librarian. And we're honored to have members of her family here with us today, and I know you'll be introducing them later. She grew up hearing her family speak about living in the Jim Crow South, but she never lost faith that the way to obtain justice is through our legal system. And her nomination is historic. When she's confirmed as the 83rd Attorney General of the United States, she'll be the first African-American woman to lead the Department of Justice. Really, I can't think of anyone more deserving of that honor. She's going to lead a Justice Department that faces complex challenges. Nearly one-third of its budget goes to the Bureau of Prisons, and that drains vital resources from nearly all other public safety priorities. Think of that third. The budget goes to prisons. And a significant factor leading to this budget imbalance is the unnecessary creation of more and more mandatory minimum sentences. Passing new mandatory minimum laws become a convenient way for lawmakers to claim they're tough on crime, even when there's no evidence these sentences keep us safer. And it's one of the reasons why we have the largest prison population in the world why I oppose mandatory minimums. I hope we can find a way to face this mass incarceration problem. And the Justice Department needs strong leadership to keep up with the rapid development of technology. We must stay ahead of the curve to prevent and fight threats to cybersecurity and data privacy. I think what it would have been like the last few days in the Northeast if a cyber terrorist could have closed down all our electrical grids. The growing threat of cybercrime is very real, but also the specter of unchecked government intrusion into our private lives, particularly dragnet surveillance programs directed at American citizens. The intelligence community faced a critical deadline this June. Three sections of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act are set to expire. I believe we have to protect our national security, but we also have to protect our civil liberties, which make us unique as a country. So we have to reform our nation's surveillance laws so we can realize both goals. The next Attorney General is going to play an essential role in protecting all Americans, all Americans. The President's selection for Attorney General, no matter who the President is, deserves to be considered swiftly, fairly, and on the nominee's own record. I believe Americans realize that a role this important cannot be used as just one more sound bite Washington political football. I'm confident that if we stay focused on Ms. Lynch's impeccable qualifications and fierce independence, she's going to be confirmed quickly by the Senate. She deserves a fair, thoughtful, and respectful confirmation process. And the American people deserve an attorney general like Ms. Lynch. So I thank you for your years of public service. I look forward to your testimony. Uh, for those of you who are new to a hearing, it's tradition that uh, senators from home state uh, introduce nominees from their state. So I'm now going to call on well, Senator Schumer and then Senator Gillibrand, senators from New York, uh, to do that. And uh, uh, since we're under such a tight schedule, if I could ask you minutes would be very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Leahy and the members of the committee. 
It's my great privilege to introduce Loretta Lynch, a proud New Yorker and the nominee to be the next Attorney General of the United States. Born in North Carolina, her father was a fourth generation Baptist minister, a man who grew up in the segregated South, and her mother picked cotton when she was a girl so her daughter would never have to. Well, their daughter grew up to be one of the keenest legal minds that our country has to offer, someone who has excelled at every stage of her education and her career, while cultivating a reputation as someone who is level-headed, fair, judicious, and eminently likable. If there's an American dream story, Miss Lynch is it, and adding to the American dream story, Miss Lynch's late brother Lorenzo was a Navy SEAL. Still, despite her intellectual and career achievements, Miss Lynch has always been a nose to the grindstone type, rarely seeking acclaim, only a job well done. She has earned a reputation for keeping her head down and avoiding the spotlight, just like me. <laughs> At just over five foot, and with her consistent, understated approach to the public spotlight, some might underestimate Miss Lynch. But as hundreds of criminals have learned the hard way, looks can be deceiving, and Miss Lynch packs a powerful punch. When you look at the breadth and depth of the cases she's handled, it's clear Loretta Lynch is law enforcement's renaissance woman. One I would mention, the Abner Louima case, where she convicted police officers who horribly abused a Haitian immigrant. As we have seen, these types of cases can create great tension between the police and the community. But despite the high-running emotions that accompanied this notorious case, Ms. Lynch was praised by lawyers on both sides, as well as community leaders and police officials for her, her judicious, balanced, and careful approach. Mr. Chairman, Members of this committee, in this age of global terrorism, the AG's role in national security has never been more important. It makes apparent that the confirmation of a new attorney general cannot and should not be delayed any longer. Today, we've already heard, and we'll hear a lot more, about issues completely unrelated to Ms. Lynch's experience and her qualifications. If anything, that just goes to show how qualified she is. No one can assail Loretta Lynch, and no one has, who she is, what she has done, and how good an attorney general she would be. So instead, some are trying to drag extraneous issues, executive orders on immigration, the IRS, into the fray to challenge her nomination because they can't find anything in her record to point to. Let me be clear. Attempts to politicize this nomination to turn this exceptional nominee into a political point scoring exercise are a disservice to the qualified candidate we have before us today. I originally recommended Loretta Lynch for the position of U.S. Attorney in 1999 because I thought she was excellent. Sure enough, she was. When President Bush took office, she went to the private sector to earn some money. But when I had the opportunity to recommend a candidate to President Obama, I was certain I wanted Ms. Lynch to serve again. So I called her on a Friday afternoon. She was happy with her life in the law firm. But I was confident that with the weekend to think it over, she'd be drawn to answer the call to public service. And sure enough, her commitment to public service was so strong that she called me back on Monday to say yes. She passed unanimously out of the Senate twice already. Wouldn't it be nice if we could pass her unanimously out of the Senate a third time? Based on her record, we should. Mr. President, if we can't confirm Loretta Lynch, then I don't believe we can confirm anyone. And I would like to remind my colleagues that the President's immigration policies are not seeking confirmation today. Loretta Lynch is. When we move to vote, hopefully sooner rather than later, you won't be voting for or against the president's policies. You'll be voting on this eminently qualified law enforcement professional, first-rate legal mind, and someone who is committed in her bones to the equal application of justice for all people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Gillibrand. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Leahy. I am honored to be here today with Senator Schumer to introduce United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, Loretta Lynch, as President Obama's nominee to serve as the next Attorney General for the United States. To serve as United States Attorney General requires deep experience in the field of law. It also requires a brilliant intellect, and it requires a steady moral compass. I have met with Ms. Lynch two months ago, and I can tell you she meets all of those all of those criteria. She is strong, tough, independent, and fearless. And as one of our country's most accomplished and distinguished women serving in law enforcement, I urge my colleagues to support her nomination. She is an outstanding candidate for this job. Ms. Lynch began her service as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York in 1990, where she rose quickly to serve as Chief of the Long Island Office and then Deputy Chief of General Crimes and Chief of Intake and Arraignments. For 15 years, she has been a prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, and since 2010, she has served admirably as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. In that position, she has demonstrated a superior sense of judgment and remarkable legal expertise. Ms. Lynch has dealt with an oppressive array of cases on subjects ranging from civil rights to organized crime to terrorism. These are each issues that our new Attorney General will have to engage with constantly from day one of her tenure. Ms. Lynch's experience as a federal prosecutor in New York will undoubtedly serve her exceptionally well in Washington. She is extraordinarily well qualified, and I believe she deserves a quick confirmation process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Uh, it's now, just as soon as the table is cleared, uh, it's going to give Ms. Lynch an opportunity to come, and before Would you uh, take an oath, please? Would you raise your hand? And I'll give the oath. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Uh, the committee welcomes you, uh, and I know that it's an honor for uh, all of us to have you before us, but it's also an honor for you to be selected by the President, and it's quite an honor for your family. So I would ask if, before you make your statement, uh, if you would like to introduce uh, anybody to the committee uh, and uh, speak about them any way you want to. And then if there's people that uh, aren't uh, uh, introduced by you that you would like to have their name in the record and you'd submit their names, I'd be glad to include that in the record. So. Would you proceed as you choose? Senator, I I, I, yeah, I think the microphone is not automatic. Thank you, Senator. Let me introduce for the record, I'm delighted to welcome numerous family and friends here with me today. I'd like to introduce first and foremost my father, the source of my inspiration in so many ways. He's to my immediate left, the Reverend Lorenzo Lynch. Thank you. Immediately to his left is my husband, Stephen Hargrove, who has supported me in all of my endeavors, no matter how poor they make us. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately to his left is my younger brother, the Reverend Leonzo Lynch, who is the fifth generation of ministers in a direct line in my family, and my, my sister-in-law, Nicole Lynch. Okay. I'm also here with several other family members and friends whom I would love to introduce, but I am informed that you have a schedule for the afternoon, so I will keep to that. But let me say to all of them how tremendously gratified I am for their support, not just today, but over the years. Chairman Grassley, Senator Leahy, distinguished members of this committee, I'm honored to appear before you in this historic chamber among so many dedicated public servants. 
I want to thank you for your time this morning, and I also want to thank President Obama for the trust he has placed in me by nominating me to serve as Attorney General of the United States. It's a particular privilege to be joined here today by the members of my family that I've introduced, as well as the other numerous family and friends who have come to support me and who, for whose uh, travel and service I'm so appreciative. Mr. Chairman, one of the privileges, and in fact one of my favorite things, in my position as United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York is welcoming new attorneys into my office and administering to them the oath of office. It is a transformative moment in the life of a young prosecutor and one that I actually remember well. And as they stand before me, prepared to pledge their honor and their integrity, I remind them that they are making their oath not to me, not to the office, not even to the Attorney General, but to our Constitution, the fundamental foundation for all that we do. It is to that document and the ideals embodied therein that I have devoted my professional life. And Senators, if confirmed as Attorney General, I pledge to you today and to the American people that the Constitution, the bedrock of our system of justice, will be my lodestar as I exercise the power and the responsibility of that position. I owe so much to those who have worked to make the promise of that document real for all Americans, beginning with my own family. All of them and so many others have supported me on the path that has brought me to this moment, not only through their unwavering and love and support, which is so beautifully on display today, but through their examples and the values that have shaped my upbringing. My mother, Loreen, who was unable to travel here today, is a retired English teacher and librarian for whom education was the key to a better life. She still recalls people in her rural North Carolina community pressing a dime or a quarter into her hands to help support her college education. As a young woman, she refused to use segregated restrooms because they did not represent the America in which she believed. She instilled in me an abiding love of literature and learning and taught me the value of hard work and sacrifice. My father, Lorenzo, who is here with me today, is a fourth generation Baptist preacher who in the early 1960s opened his Greensboro church to those planning sit-ins and marches, standing with them while carrying me on his shoulders. He has always matched his principles with his actions, encouraging me to think for myself, but reminding me that we all gain the most when we act in service to others. It was the values my parents instilled in me that led me to the Eastern District of New York. And from my parents, I gained the tenacity and the resolve to take on violent criminals, to confront political corruption, and to disrupt organized crime. They also gave me the insight and the compassion to sit with the victims of crime and share their loss. Their values have sustained me as I have twice had the privilege, indeed the honor, of serving as United States Attorney, leading an exceptional office staffed by outstanding public servants, and their values guide and motivate me even today. Senators, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, my highest priorities will continue to be to ensure the safety of all of our citizens, to protect the most vulnerable among us from crime and abuse, and to strengthen the vital relationships between America's brave law enforcement officers and the communities they are entrusted to serve. In a world of complex and evolving threats, protecting the American people from terrorism must remain the primary mission of today's Department of Justice. If confirmed, I will work with colleagues across the executive branch to use every available tool to continue disrupting the catastrophic attacks planned against our homeland and to bring terrorists to justice. I will draw upon my extensive experience in the Eastern District of New York, which has tried more terrorism cases since 9-11 than any other office. We have investigated and prosecuted terrorist individuals and groups that threaten our nation and its people, including those who have plotted to attack New York City's subway system, John F. Kennedy Airport, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and U.S. troops stationed abroad, as well as those who have provided material support to foreign terrorist organizations. And I pledge to discharge my duties, always mindful of the need to protect not just American citizens, 
but American values. If confirmed, I intend to expand and enhance our capabilities in order to effectively prevent ever-revolving attacks in cyberspace, to expose those wrongdoers and bring those perpetrators to justice as well. In my current position, I'm proud to lead an office that has significant experience prosecuting complex international cybercrime, including high-tech intrusions at key financial and public sector institutions. If I am confirmed, I will continue to use the combined skills and experience of our law enforcement partners, the department's criminal and national security divisions, and the United States attorney community to defeat and hold accountable those who would imperil the safety and security of our citizens through cybercrime. I will also do everything I can to ensure that we are safeguarding the most vulnerable among us. During my tenure as U.S. Attorney, the Eastern District of New York has led the prosecution against financial fraudsters who have callously targeted hardworking Americans, including the deaf, the elderly, and stolen not just their trust, but their hard-earned savings. We have taken action against abusers in over 100 child exploitation and child pornography cases, and we have prosecuted brutal international human trafficking rings that have sold, sold victims as young as 14 and 15 into sexual slavery. If confirmed as Attorney General, I will continue to build upon the Department's record of vigorously prosecuting those who prey on those most in need of our protection, and I will continue to provide strong and effective assistance to survivors who we must both support and empower. Senators, throughout my career as a prosecutor, it has been my signal honor to work hand in hand with dedicated law enforcement officers and agents who risk their lives every day in the protection of the communities we all serve. I have served with them. I have learned from them. I am a better prosecutor because of them. Few things have pained me more than the recent reports of tension and division between law enforcement and the communities we serve. If confirmed as Attorney General, one of my key priorities would be to work to strengthen the vital relationships between our courageous law enforcement personnel and all of the communities we serve. In my career, I have seen this relationship flourish. I have seen law enforcement forge unbreakable bonds with community residents, and I have seen violence-ravaged communities come together to honor officers who have risked all to protect them. And as Attorney General, I will draw all voices into this important discussion. In that same spirit, I look forward to fostering a new and improved relationship with this committee, the United States Senate, and the entire United States Congress a relationship based on mutual respect and constitutional balance. Ultimately, I know we all share the same goal and commitment to protect and to serve the American people. Now, I recognize that we face many challenges in the years ahead, but I have seen in my own life and in my own family how dedicated men and women can answer the call to achieve great things for themselves, for their country, and for generations to come. My father, that young minister who carried me on his shoulders, has answered that call. As has my mother, that courageous young teacher who refused to let Jim Crow define her. Standing with them are my uncles and cousins who served in Vietnam, one of whom is here to support me today, and my older brother, a Navy SEAL, all of whom answered that call with their service to our country. Senators, as I come before you today in this historic chamber, I still stand on my father's shoulders, as well as on the shoulders of all of those who have gone before me and who dreamed of making the promise of America a reality for all and worked to achieve that goal. I believe in the promise of America because I have lived the promise of America. And if confirmed to be Attorney General of the United States, I pledge to all of you and the American people that I will fulfill my responsibilities with integrity and independence. I will never forget that I serve the American people from all walks of life who continue to make our nation great, as well as the legacy of all of those whose sacrifices have made us free. And I will always strive to uphold the trust 
that has been placed in me to protect and defend our Constitution, to safeguard our people, and to stand as the leader and public servant that they deserve. Thank you all, once again, for your time and your consideration. I greatly appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to your questions and to all that we may accomplish in the days ahead, together, in the spirit of cooperation, shared responsibility, and justice. Thank you for your time today. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Lynch, for that statement. Uh, before my 10 minutes starts for the first round, I'd like to talk to my colleagues just a minute because of the 18 votes that are coming up this afternoon and because of the uh, chaotic situation. And the most important thing is uh, getting this hearing over in one sitting uh, in one day, even if it goes into the evening. I hope my colleagues will uh, be cognizant of, uh, of what we normally do between Senator Leahy and I. We're fairly liberal on letting people go over. Uh, and whether we have five, seven, or 10 minute uh, rounds in any hearing, my practice is generally if you got one second left, you can ask a question. And, uh, and, but this time, I would prefer that uh, you kind of stick to the 10 minutes. And I'm not very good at gaveling people down. So uh, take, uh, uh, take uh, care of my timidity, will you please? Uh, now. Uh, again, before the first 10 minutes starts, I'd like to make something clear just for myself. I can't speak for my colleagues. And it takes off on two things. One, what you said about you want to improve relationships with the committee and with Congress. Uh, I, we welcome that very much, and that will be very, very helpful, particularly in regard to our responsibilities of oversight. Uh, secondly, taking off on something Senator Schumer said, and just speaking for myself, if I use this subject or that subject or another as, an, as a, a basis of uh, maybe questioning what the president or an attorney general has done, I want it clear that that's not the issue for me now. The issue is whether or not the Constitution or the laws have been violated or whether the Justice Department has acted in an appropriate way. So now I would start with my questions. Uh, on November the 20th last year, uh, President Obama announced that he would defer deportation of millions of individuals in the country undocumented. Not only is this action contrary to our laws, it's a dangerous abuse of executive authority. Uh, if you're confirmed as an ex Attorney General before you take office, you will take an oath. Uh, you will raise your right hand and swear quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States and to bear true and false faith, true faith and allegiance to the same, end of quote. Your duty as Attorney General is not to defend the President and his policies. Your duty uh, is your oath to defend the Constitution. So my first question, with that oath in mind, I ask you, do you believe that the President has the legal authority to unilaterally defraud deportations in a blanket manner for millions of individuals in the country illegally and grant them permits and other benefits regardless of what the U.S. Constitution or imitation law, immigration laws say. Thank you for the question, Senator. And you've raised a very important issue of how we manage the issue of undocumented immigrants here in our country while still welcoming those who bring such great value to our shores, to our business community, and to our culture. Certainly, I was not involved in the decisions that led to the executive actions that you reference. Um, and I am not aware of, of, at this point, how the Department of Homeland Security has set forth regulations to actually implement that. So I can't comment on the particulars of what will happen. I have had occasion to look at the Office of Legal Counsel opinion uh, through which the Department of Homeland Security sought legal guidance there, as well as some of the letters from constitutional scholars who've looked at the similar issue. And certainly, it seems to be a, a reasonable discussion of legal precedent, the relevant statute, congressional actions, uh, along with the enforcement discretion of the, of the agency. Um, and I don't see any reason to doubt the reasonableness of those views. I do think, however, that the ultimate responsibility of the Department of Justice is to always, when presented with issues by the White House or any agency, to review those issues carefully, to apply the relevant law, and make a determination as to whether or not there is a legal framework that supports 
the requested action. And I found it interesting as I was reading the legal counsel opinion that some of the proposals that were, that were set forth and um, asked about, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel opined did not in fact have a legal framework. And I don't believe that those were actually implemented. So I do think it is very important that as the Department of Justice, through any of its agencies, be it the Office of Legal Counsel or in a direct conversation with the President or any other member of Cabinet, always ensure that they are operating from a position of whether or not there is a legal framework that supports the requested action. And the advice provided must be thorough, it must be objective, and it must be completely independent. Let me take off on one word you use, discretion, and I presume that may have applied to prosecutorial discretion. That was part of the President's rationale. Uh, if this is lawfully exercised on an individual basis, uh, depending on the facts of a specific case, it is in fact case by case. So this is not so much a philosophical question as a practical thing. What, what it doesn't allow uh, anybody to do is tell whole categories of people that the law won't apply to them going forward. No one seriously disputes these broad principles. Even the Office of Legal Counsel opinion on the President's executive action accepts them. So let me ask you this. What are the outer limits of the doctrine of prosecutorial discretion? And why don't the President's actions exceed those boundaries? When we're talking about millions of people, how does this action realistically allow for a case-by-case -case exercise of discretion? Senator, as I reviewed the opinion and looked at the issues presented therein, from the perspective of my career as a prosecutor and as a United States attorney, and applying those principles of the exercise of discretion, I viewed it as a way in which the Department of Homeland Security was seeking legal guidance on the most effective way to prioritize the removal of large numbers of individual individuals, given that the resources would not permit removal of everyone who fell within the respected cat respective category. Um, and that certainly was the framework from which I viewed that. And looking at it from that perspective, the Department of Homeland Security's request and, and suggestion that they in fact prioritize the removal of the most dangerous of the undocumented immigrants among us, those who have uh, criminal records, those who are involved in national security and terrorism, those who are involved in gang activity, violent crime, along with, I believe, people who have recently entered um, and could pose a threat to our system, seem to be a reasonable way to marshal limited resources to deal with the problem. As a prosecutor, however, I've had experience, obviously, in, in doing similar things, in finding the best way to attack a serious problem with limited resources. But as a prosecutor, I always want the ability to still take some sort of action against those who may not be in my initial category as the most serious threat. And I didn't see anything in the opinion that prevented um, action being taken from individuals who might otherwise qualify for the deferral. Um, again, I'm not aware of how the department will actually go forward and implement by regulation this matter. I haven't had the occasion to study that, and I don't know, in fact, if those are out. Um, certainly, if I'm confirmed as Attorney General, I look forward to learning more about that process and making sure that we're using all of our resources to protect the American people, particularly against the dangerous offenders who rightfully stand at the top of the removal list. Yeah. Well, I think you're telling me that you can do it for a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of people that uh, maybe have committed a crime or something, but it seems to me to be common sense would dictate that it's, in, that it's impossible to do prosecutorial discretion the way it's traditionally been done on an individual basis for the millions that are left over. I, I, let's move on. I'd like to move away from the President's refusal to enforce the law and talk to, a little bit about this administration's failure to apply the law in an even-handed way. According to the, this goes to the IRS. According to the uh, Treasury Department, Inspector General, now that's not me, the Inspector General, the IRS used inappropriate criteria to deny tax exempt status to predominantly conservative organizations, ask unnecessary questions, and lastly, slowed approval of their application. Initially, President Obama remarked that any IRS actions to the 
to target conservatives would be, quote, unquote, outrageous. Then last February, the President said there wasn't, quote, even a smidgen of corruption in what occurred at the IRS, a smidgen of corruption, unquote. Yet a few months later, in June, the director of the FBI, Director Comey, testified before the House Judiciary Committee that there was a, quote, very active, unquote, ongoing criminal investigation into the matter. So this brings me to these questions. I'd like to know how to reconcile these two statements. If what the President said was accurate, then why in the world would the FBI be conducting an ongoing criminal investigation? A rhetorical question. Would the FBI investigation be just for show? I'd like, uh, I, I'm going to take Director Comey at his word. So if there is an ongoing criminal investigation at the FBI, then how could it be possible, be appropriate for the President to reach a conclusion about the facts uh, before uh, Director Comey? Thank you, sir. And let me state at the outset that with regards to the actions of any of the agencies of our government, there is certainly no place for bias or favoritism or anything other than the even-handed application of the relevant laws and regulations. And certainly that has always been my goal as a prosecutor and would be my continued goal should I be confirmed. With respect to the IRS investigation, I am generally aware that there is an investigation going on, but it's not a matter that is either being conducted by my office or that I've been briefed on as United States Attorney. So I'm not able to comment on the status now, except and, to state that I do. Based on what you just said, then I can shorten this up by uh, asking you this question. Uh, you've spent a career in law enforcement. When would it ever be appropriate for any president to know the results of a criminal investigation and then comment on it publicly while the investigation is still ongoing? Senator, it, uh, with respect to this investigation or any other, I'm not aware of the context or the basis for the President's remarks, so I'm not able to determine whether or not they were in fact done after any evaluation of the investigation or whether they were a matter of opinion. So I'm not able to comment on that specific remark. Certainly, as part of the Department of Justice exercise of its powers, whether at the U.S. Attorney level or here in Washington, investigations are handled independently <clears throat> and without um, provision of materials or information about them before their conclusion to others in the executive branch or other agencies. Senator Leahy, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been fortunate that my native state of Vermont has allowed me to serve here for four decades. I've listened in several different committees. I've been on to a lot of statements by nominees. I cannot think of one that is so moving as your statement. And I, and I intend to make sure I have some copies to all members of my family and, and other friends. You told me that last night. You know, I, my years in law enforcement as state's attorney in Vermont gave me a lot of respect for the difficult and dangerous work we ask police officers to do every day. I know the toll it can take not only on the officer, but oftentimes on their, on their families. I, I have tried to support the work of law enforcement to keep our community safe. They have to have the resources they need, whether it's bulletproof vests or, or funding for innovative um, criminal justice efforts. I've also been deeply moved by the tragic events in Ferguson, New York. They have focused on what we know is a reality, oftentimes or sometimes, strain relations between law enforcement and the communities they serve. I appreciate your reference to that in your statement. But you've worked very hard as a U.S. attorney to bring both law enforcement and the communities together. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, thank you, Senator. I think you've raised one of the most important issues facing our country today, which is the need to resolve the tensions that appear to be discussed and appear to be rising between law enforcement and the communities that we serve. In my experience as a prosecutor and United States attorney, these tensions are best dealt with by having discussions between all parties so that everyone feels that their voice has been heard. With respect to our brave law enforcement officers, we ask so much of them. We ask them to keep us safe. We ask them to protect us literally from ourselves. 
and we ask them to do it, often without the resources that they need to be safe and secure themselves. Yet they still stand up every day and risk their lives for us. Many of our community residents, because of a host of factors, feel disconnected from government in general today, and when they interact with law enforcement, transfer that feeling to them as well, even if someone is there to help. What I have found most effective is getting people together and simply listening to their concerns, being open, helping them see that, in fact, we are all in this together and that the concerns of law enforcement, a safe society, a free society, are the exact same concerns of every resident of every community there. And would you agree that that's something that has to be considered by not only federal law enforcement, but by state and local law enforcement, and that the federal government can help the state and local law enforcement in that respect? Absolutely, Senator. One of the most important roles that the Department of Justice plays is not necessarily its most visible role, but it is the support that we provide to state and local law enforcement partners through our grant program and through our training program. We try our best to provide them with the resources that they need to carry out their jobs safely and effectively. You know, I, um, we all know that no prosecutor's office has the resources to prosecute every single crime before it. And you have to decide which ones have priority. Let me take, let me talk about one. Uh, in state court, there is a case where a child rapist received two years. Uh, you obviously disagreed with that. You brought uh, federal charges. And I think of uh, Bill O'Reilly on, on Fox called you a hero and said, quote, you should be respected by all Americans for standing up to gross injustice. And I agree, uh, I agree with uh, Bill O'Reilly on that. How do you make, well, let me back up. More and more of the Justice Department's budget, as I said earlier, is going now into our federal prison system. So you have limited resources. How do you make these kind of judgments? How do you determine which cases are the important ones you have to go, and also the very difficult thing, realizing if you go after certain cases, it means you don't have the resources to go after others. Certainly, Senator. One of the privileges of being the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York has been the ability to work with so many of my United States Attorney colleagues across the country. All of us engage in this process every day, and we start with a full and frank evaluation with our law enforcement partners of the, of the crime issues facing our particular districts. We try and determine what are the greatest threats to the people that we have sworn to serve. And that is what I do in the Eastern District of New York every day. We then look at our resources and set priorities and goals to achieve the safest communities that we can. But, Senator, we do have to always, always maintain the flexibility to look at specific cases, such as the Goodman case, and determine if a federal interest exists, and if, in fact, a victim has not been protected and has not been heard, and use federal resources there as well. Well, let me, let me go into one that takes resources, but uh, we've had some people say, gosh, you've got terrorists, lock them up in Guantanamo, even though uh, we know what that has cost the American people, both in respect abroad and in dollars. Uh, you've successfully prosecuted a number of terrorism cases in the Eastern District of New York, cases against individuals, as you said, plotting against John F. Kennedy Airport, Federal Reserve Bank, and so on. Uh, just this month, you charged two al-Qaeda members for attacking American troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I've been impressed not only in your district, but in other parts of the country, where we've actually brought these uh, terrorists to trial in our federal courts. We've shown the rest of the world we can do it. There's been convictions, uh, Osama bin Laden's son-in-law being one, and then they've been locked up. Now, do you find the criminal justice system, I think I know your answer, as an important counterterrorism tool? Senator, it is certainly an important counterterrorism tool in the arsenal of tools that we have to deal with this ever-growing and ever-evolving threat. Let me say that at the outset, my view is 
that if terrorists threaten American citizens here or abroad, they will face American justice. Uh, we work with our counterparts throughout the executive branch to determine, based on every case, the most appropriate venue for bringing terrorists to justice, as our primary goal is to incapacitate them and prevent further destruction. Certainly within my own career as U.S. Attorney, when cases, when it, the, the decision has been made that the case should be handled by a U.S. Attorney's Office, we proceed in that fashion. We also work closely, however, with the Office of Military Commissions and consult with them and, and share information to make those decisions as to how, what is, in fact, the best way to manage every case. The, um, and then as these cases come to you, uh, I'm going to ask you a question I've asked um, each of the most recent Attorney General nominees. And I, I say this because I think of the tremendous effort uh, the Senator from California, Senator Feinstein, is sitting here her tremendous efforts to confront um, acts of torture carried out in our country's name. Do you agree that waterboarding is torture and that it's illegal? Waterboarding is torture, Senator. And thus illegal. And thus illegal. Thank you. And I know you're going to be asked a lot about immigration. Well, it's, it makes me think we should be focusing on your, your qualifications for this job. We might even Asking those questions might speak also to some of the qualifications of Congress. We worked for months in this committee, night and day, hundreds of hours, hearings, markups, debate, and we passed by a strong bipartisan uh, majority an immigration bill that referenced so, so many of these things that we now hear discussed. My opinion, there were votes enough to pass it in the House of Representatives, but their leadership decided not to bring it up. I think that was a mistake. So now we deal with the question of executive action. You didn't write the executive action. You weren't consulted about it, were you? No, I was not aware of it until it was rendered. And would you um, say if you got millions of, of people in this country who may not be in a, a valid or legal status, it would perhaps strain our resources to think about how we would deport 10 to 12 million people. Would that be a fair statement? I believe that statement is fair, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Hatch is the next one, but I wanted to inform all the committee members that since everybody on the committee was here at the fall of the gavel, uh, it will be done on a seniority basis uh, as opposed to first-come, first-serve basis. Senator Hatch is next. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Lynch, uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Appreciate the service you've given in this country. I'm impressed with your qualifications, and I hope I can support your nomination. It's important to hear what you understand your role and, and duty will be. Do you agree that when the constitutionality of a law is challenged, the Attorney General has a duty uh, to defend that law if reasonable arguments can be made? Senator, I believe that one of the first and foremost duties of the Department of Justice is to defend the laws as passed by this body. Okay. Now, I'd like you to answer these questions. I, I'm, I'm trying to get through a, a number of them. I think you can answer most of them yes or no, if you, if you can. Uh, if you are confirmed, will you commit to enforce and defend the, the laws and the Constitution of the United States, regardless of your personal and philosophical views on, them, on an, any matter? Absolutely, sir. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. Attorney General Holder answered that same question in the same way. The Justice Department had made reasonable arguments that the Defense of Marriage Act is constitutional, but then the Attorney General chose to step, stop making those arguments because of his personal views. And by breaking his promise, he cast doubt ab about others who make the same commitment as you did today. Now, I don't doubt your sin sin sincerity. We've met together, and I have a high opinion of you. But is there any more assurance that you can give us on something like that? Senator, it's my view that when it comes to the position of the Attorney General and the role of the Department of Justice in defending the statutes as passed by this Congress, the issue is not my personal view or any, any issue of bias or, or policy even. 
but it is the, the uh, duty and responsibility of the Department of Justice to defend those statutes. Certainly, as we've seen, there may be rare instances where, and again, I was not involved in, those, in, in that analysis, but there may be certain circumstances where careful legal analysis raises constitutional issues. But, but I anticipate would those would be few and far between. I also think that should we reach that point, if there is a matter, it's a matter that I would prefer to, to have discussion about. Okay. I appreciate that answer. I'm concerned that the administration has exceeded its lawful authority in several ways in an effort to avoid working with us up here in Congress. Now, I understand why they might not want to work with Congress from time to time, but, but unfortunately the Constitution requires us to work together. And, and that the Justice Department has actually facilitated this pattern of behavior, some people believe. The Department has done so in a number of ways in exceeding and, e and even contravening lawful authority in the programs it helps administer, such as with the latest executive actions on immigration, uh, in purporting to provide legal justification for other agencies to ignore the law, as apparently occurred with the transfer of Taliban terrorists out of Guantanamo without notifying Congress, which is an obligation, and in taking some extreme litigation positions, which by my count, the Supreme Court has unanimously rebuked a record 20 times. Uh, given these disturbing patterns, how can you assure us that you'll be independent, that you'll say no to the White House or other executive branch agencies when they wish to act beyond the law as it's written? Senator, I think one of the most important functions of the Department of Justice is to provide a legal framework if it exists when questions are raised. Right. But consistent with that, every good lawyer knows you must also provide the information that indicates that the legal framework may not exist uh, for certain actions that, that someone may want to take. Every lawyer has to be independent. The Attorney General even more so. And I pledge to you that I, that I uh, take that independence very seriously. Well, you did that in my office, and I appreciate that, because I think you'll be a great Attorney General if you'll, if you'll do that. Last August, you gave a speech in Switzerland in which you praised Attorney General Holder's initiative to limit mandatory minimum sentences only to some of the criminals who Congress said should receive them. But prosecutors, including even the Attorney General, do not have authority to, de to decide that entire categories of defendants will not re receive a sentence that the Congress has mandated. Isn't that another example of using prosecutorial discretion to really, in effect, change the law without Congress? Senator, with respect to um the material that you're referring to when I did give that speech, I was referring to the department's Smart on Crime initiative, which seeks to manage a, a, another intractable problem of the large number of narcotics defendants and the limited resources that we have to handle those defendants and, and prosecute them. I want to help you with that. Yes, and prosecute them effectively. Um, in fact, in my own experience, both as an assistant United States attorney and United States attorney, we've had to deal with similar issues in the Eastern District of New York. We've had tremendous issues with narcotics importations over the years, and we have had to work out ways of resolving those cases. Many of them go to trial, but we also have had to, to prioritize the cases that we will seek mandatory minimums for and those which we will seek guideline sentences for. But importantly, with respect to the Smart on Crime initiative, as pushed out and has been implemented in the field, every prosecutor from the United States Attorney on down to line assistants are encouraged to still consider cases that might fall into a category where initially you would not seek a mandatory minimum, but consider whether they would be appropriate. Okay. And those cases have occurred, and they will continue to occur. Okay, I understand. So it's currently written the Electronic uh, Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA, requires only a subpoena for law enforcement to access email that has been opened, even though a, a uh, search warrant would be required for a printout of the same communication sitting uh, on a desk. To make matters more complicated, ECPA is silent on the privacy standard for accessing data stored abroad. Without an actual legal framework in place, this puts the privacy of American citizens at risk for intrusion by foreign governments. In the coming days, I intend to reintroduce the Leeds Act, which will promote international comedy and law enforcement cooperation. Will you commit to working with me on this important subject? Because it's, it's important we solve these problems. Senator, the subject of electronic privacy is central to so many of our freedoms. And as you point out, 
in an era of ever-changing technology, we have to be vigilant to make sure that we are not only providing law enforcement the tools it needs, but protecting our citizens' privacy. And I certainly commit to you to working with you on this important legislation and all the issues that will flow from it. Well, thank you so much. Trade secrets are among the most valuable assets for American companies and currently are protected under federal criminal law by the Economic Espionage Act and by an array of state civil laws. Unlike other forms of intellectual property, however, there is no federal civil remedy for trade secret, secret owners. I will reintroduce the Defend Trade Secrets Act in the coming days with Senator Coons uh, to provide an efficient federal remedy for trade secret owners. Do you agree that trade secret owners should have the same access to a federal remedy as owners of other forms of intellectual property? Senator, I think that the issue of trade secrets, again, particularly as American technology becomes ever more complex and becomes ever more a target uh, from, from those both in the U.S. and without who would seek to steal it, is an increasingly important issue. And I look forward to working with you to consider that statute. I'm not familiar with the provision that you raised, but it certainly touches on an important issue of making sure that our, our, our companies and their technology are protected. Well, thank you so much. I'm today introducing legislation to help victims of child pornography receive the, rest, uh, the restitution that Congress has already said they deserve. The Supreme Court said last year that the current restriction statute enacted more than 20 years ago does not work for child pornography victims, and this legislation will change that. I am joined by more than 30 uh, senators on both sides of the aisle, including 14 on this committee. Do I have your commitment that under your leadership, the Justice Department will aggressively prosecute child pornography and use tools like this legislation to help victims get the restitution they need to put their lives back together? Senator, throughout my career, I've, I have uh, expressed a commitment to prosecuting those who would seek to harm our children, be it through child pornography or the actual abuse of children, um, which often go hand in hand. You certainly raise important issues about how can we make these victims whole? And I look forward to working with you and the members of this committee in reviewing that legislation Thank as you well. Thank so much. Now, I recently led a powerful, read a powerful book, read it in one day. It's titled License to Lie, Uncovering Corruption in the Department of Justice. The author writes about many things, including the debacle that occurred in the misguided prosecution of Senator Ted Stevens, which I thought was out of this world bad. Uh, I was one of the people who testified as to his character, and he was a person of great character. And as you know, he lost the Senate race because of this type of prosecution. I know that case. Ted Stevens was a dear friend of mine, and I testified on his behalf, as I said. Only after he was convicted did we learn that the Justice Department prosecutors intentionally hid exculpatory evidence that could have helped his case. Now, there were not mis these were not mistakes. They were corrupt acts that violated every prosecutor's duty under the Brady v. Maryland decision to turn over exculpatory evidence so that the trial will be fair. Now, I recommend that you read this book, because if, you, if, if, you, if even half of it is true, and I believe it is true, you have a lot of work to do to, to clean up the, that apartment, department. Will you consider doing that for me? Thank you, sir. I will. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Uh, yeah. Chairman. Before I call on Senator Feinstein, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, just as soon as the Finance Committee convenes, I'm going to offer an amendment. So I'd ask the most senior Republican to watch the time and call on the next pe person in seniority order, Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mrs. Lynch, I sat through six opening statements by potential attorneys general. And I just want to tell you, yours was the best. Um, Thank you. I see the combination of steel and velvet. I see your effectiveness before a jury. I see your love for the Constitution. And I see the determination which is in, in your heart and I think your being. And um, it's very, very impressive. So I want to thank you for really 30 years of service. Um, thank you, Senator. And I hope it'll be a lot longer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to p place in the record um, Los Angeles Police Department's chiefs, uh, Charlie Beckett's written testimony on the subject of the President's executive action on immigration. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Ms. Lynch, I'm going to ask you the three questions. The first is on expiring provisions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which will come to this committee before June of this year, and also before the Intelligence Committee on which I serve. Uh, a question about Office of Legal Counsel opinions, and a question on the State Secrets Act. Let me begin with FISA. The three provisions that are going to expire on June 1 yes. are first, the roving wiretap authority. This provision enables the government to maintain surveillance on a target when he or she switches phone numbers or email addresses without seeking a new court order. The second is the lone wolf authority, which enables the government to conduct surveillance of a non-United States person engaged in international terrorism without demonstrating that they are affiliated with a particular international terrorist group, such as ISIS or Al-Qaeda. And the third is the Business Records Authority, uh, which carries with it Section 215 of the National Security Administration. This enables the government to obtain a court order directing the pro production of, quote, any tangible thing, end quote, that's relevant to an authorized national security investigation. Can you describe for us the importance of these three provisions and what would be the operational impact if the three were allowed to sunset in June? Thank you, Senator. Uh, you certainly raise important issues about the need to have a full panoply of investigative tools and techniques to deal with the ever-evolving threat uh, that terrorism presents against us. Um, with respect to um, the provisions that you refer to, I think it's, I've always found it most interesting that the roving wiretap provision is actually a provision that was incorporated into the FISA statute after being utilized extensively for several years in narcotics prosecutions. It was one with which I was familiar as a young prosecutor, as many of my colleagues across the country were as well. And the ability um, to, to describe to a court the nature of the offense, the nature of the activity, and the use of um, attempts to shield oneself from electronic surveillance, which is part of what must be set forth in an application, have been invaluable tools. Of particular importance is the fact that all of this must go to a court. Obviously, in the narcotics area, it was an Article III court. In the FISA area, it is to the FISA court. Uh, but there is judicial review for this, and it has been an important part of the techniques we have used in the war on terror, as have the other two provisions that you mentioned. Um, I do think, however, that with respect to FISA, um, there's always the ability, there's always the need to make sure that we are current, not just with technology, but with the most effective way to protect privacy as we go forward in this important act. I know that's something that you've spent a great deal of time on, as well as many of your colleagues on this committee, as well as on the Intelligence Committee. And I look forward to continuing those discussions with you, should I be confirmed. Uh, with respect to the lone wolf provision, Again, I think we have to obviously examine it carefully. Recent events, however, have underscored the importance of this as an issue in the war on terror. And so I would hope that we could move forward with any proposed changes to FISA with a full and complete understanding of the risks that, are, that we are still facing. And if any changes need to be made, again, after full and fair consideration with this committee, with the Intelligence Committee, and the discussions that we need to have, making sure that we can still provide law enforcement with the tools that they need. Similarly, with Section 215, I believe that the court order provision in there is an effective check and certainly a necessary check as we gather data from all types of sources. As, as I've always said, I'm certainly open to discussions about how they can be best modified if we need to modify them, consistent with the goals of protecting the American people. And I commit to you, Senator, and indeed to all of this committee, that I will always listen to all those concerns be it about the FISA statute or any of the techniques we are using in the war on terror. Thank you very much. Um, as a member of both judiciary and intelligence, we have on both committees sought access to Office of Legal Counsel opinions called OLC opinions. And these opinions often represent the best and most comprehensive expression of the legal basis for intelligence activities 
Congress is actually charged with overseeing. Mm -hmm. So without these opinions, you don't really know the legal basis upon which an administration has made, uh, has based certain activities. And it's been very frustrating uh, to us. Um, in particular, executive branch officials have previously advised the committee of the existence of a seminal OLC opinion written by Ted Olson decades ago governing the, con the conduct of collection activities under ex Executive Order 12 Triple Three. My question is, could we have your commitment that you will make a copy of this OLC opinion available to members of both the Intelligence and the Judiciary Committee? Probably your first tough question. <laughs> Well, Senator, I think that with respect to the OLC opinions, you are correct. They do represent um, a discussion and an analysis of legal issues on a wide variety of subjects. Uh, when a variety of agencies come to the department for that, um, that independent advice that we must provide them. Certainly, I'm not aware of the discussions that have been had about this previous opinion in terms of providing it. Um, certainly, I will commit to you to work with this committee as well as the Intelligence Committee to find a way to, to provide the information that you need consistent with the Department's own law enforcement and investigative uh, priorities. Thank you very much. Um, this particular opinion is important, and it would be useful if we can review it. So thank you. On state secrets, on September 23, 2009, the Attorney General issued a memorandum establishing new procedures and standards to govern DOJ's defense of an assertion of the state secrets privilege in litigation. Among other things, the memorandum stated that the DOJ would provide the periodic reports to Congress on the exercise of the state secrets privilege. Since 2009, only one such report from April 2011 has been provided. That report discussed the two cases in which the privilege had been invoked under the new policy, but those are no longer the only two cases. So I'd like to ask you if you could provide the appropriate oversight committees with the second periodic report on the exercise of state secret privileges that discusses those cases which the privilege has been invoked on since April of 2011. Senator, you raised the important issue of the need to work with the oversight committees, be they this committee or intelligence, in reviewing the actions of the Department of Justice, not, not just so that the committees can carry out their work, but so that the American people can be aware of how the department carries out its work. I'm not familiar with the reports that you referred at this point. I certainly look forward to reviewing this issue, and I certainly commit to you that I will do my best to ensure that the department lives up to its obligations that it has set forth. Good. And um, I will come back. This is an important question to us, so I will come back uh, and hopefully can get this, um, get an answer, yes or no, uh, within the next couple of weeks. So thank you very much. Senator, I look forward to learning more about the issue, and I look forward to sharing that with you, should I be confirmed, um, as well as any issues of concern that this committee or others have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Now it's Senator Sessions' turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it is great to have you here. Thank I you, appreciate sir. the opportunity to uh, have a good discussion, I think, in our office. And um, having had, I think I just passed my time in the Senate longer than I spent in the uh, Department of Justice. And it was a great honor to serve that. And I have high ideals for this department. And we understand that the Attorney General is the premier law enforcement officer, the senior law enforcement officer in America. He, he or she sets the tone uh, for law in America, the commitment to law, and must resist politicizing law and do the right thing on a daily basis. And on occasion, you are called upon to issue opinions. OLC works for you, the Office of Legal Counsel, who issues these opinions. And you'll have to tell the president yes or no on something that he may want to do. Are you able and willing to, to tell the President of the United States no if he asks to 
a mission or a legal opinion that supports an action you believe is wrong? Senator, I believe you have touched upon one of the most important responsibilities of the Attorney General. And let me say also that I appreciated very much the, ability, the, the opportunity to meet with you and discuss these important issues. The Attorney General's position as a Cabinet member is perhaps unique from all of the Cabinet members. Yes, a member of the President's Cabinet, but the Attorney General has a unique response, independent and objective advice to the President or any agency um, when it is sought, and sometimes perhaps even when it is not sought. With respect to the Office of Legal Counsel... And just... So you understand that your role is such that on occasion you have to say no to the person who actually appointed you to the job and who you support? Senator, I, I do understand that that is, in fact, the role and the responsibility of the Attorney General and, in fact, a necessary uh, obligation on their part. Well, you know, you people have agendas and attorneys general sometimes do, and they have to guard against that and be objective as you basically said to me now in, in committee. On April 24th of 2013, Attorney General Holder said this, and I'm raising this fundamentally because I think there's a lot of confusion about the, how we should think about immigration in America, what our duties and what our responsibilities are. He said this, quote, creating a pathway to earn citizenship for the 11 million unauthorized immigrants in our country is essential. The way we treat our friends and neighbors who are undocumented by creating a mechanism for them to earn citizenship and move out of the shadows transcends the issue of immigration status. This is a matter of civil and human rights. So um, let me ask you, uh, do you believe that a person who enters the country unlawfully, uh, that is perhaps used false documents or otherwise entered here uh, has a civil right to citizenship? Well, Senator, um, I'm not familiar with the context of those comments. I certainly think that you do touch upon the difficult issue of how do we handle the undocumented, in undocumented immigrants who come to our country, I believe, for the life that we offer. I believe because of the values that well, we espouse. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but just the question is, do you agree with that statement? that uh, there, it's a matter of civil rights and citizenship and work authority, uh, right to work in America, for someone who enters the country unlawfully, uh, that's a civil right? Senator, I haven't studied the issue enough to come to a legal conclusion on that. I certainly think that um, people who come to this country in a variety of ways can rehabilitate themselves and apply, but that would have to be something that would be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Well. I'd just like to hear you answer that. Is, um, it, is there a civil right uh, for a person who enters the country unlawfully, uh, who would like to work and like to be a citizen, to demand that uh, contrary to the laws of the United States? And when Congress doesn't pass it, is that a, um, a right that they are entitled to demand? So I don't think that's, I think that citizenship is a privilege. Certainly it's a right for those of us born here. I think it's a privilege that has to be earned. And within the panoply of civil rights that are recognized uh, by our jurisprudence now, I don't see one that you, as such as the, that you are describing. I certainly agree. I'm a little surprised it took you that long, but the Attorney General statement was breathtaking to me. Now, Peter Kersenow, who's a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, responded to that some time ago, and here's what he said, quote, to equate amnesty for breaking the nation's immigration laws with civil rights betrays an incoherent and ahistorical understanding of the civil rights movement. Law-abiding black citizens of the United States were not seeking exemption from law. They were seeking application of such laws in the same manner that was applied to whites, close quote. Would you agree with Mr. Kersenow's analysis? Well, certainly, I think with respect to the civil rights movement um, and the, the role of African Americans in it, it certainly was a movement designed to assure equal access to law and equal application of law. Well, on the 50th anniversary of the Selma March, it's approaching, uh, people were denied systematically fundamental rights as citizens of the United States of America. And uh, that was a historic event. It changed America. And, I think it's important that that be remembered.
But I will just tell you, it's quite different, as I think Mr. Kirsten now points out, to demand your lawful rights as an American and uh, to uh, uh, ask for, uh, insist that civil rights apply uh, to those who enter the country unlawfully to have these uh, benefits. Well, the president's action would give people who came here unlawfully uh, the right to work, the right to participate in social, in social security and Medicare, when Congress has not a, a done that, allows them to stay for at least a period lawfully. Uh, let me ask you this. In the workplace of America today, when we have a high de number of unemployed, we've had declining wages for many years, we have the lowest percentage of Americans working, who has more right to a job in this country? A lawful immigrant who's here, a green card holder, or a citizen? or a person who entered the country unlawfully? Well, Senator, I believe that um, the right and the obligation to work is one that's shared by everyone in this country, uh, regardless of how they came here. And certainly, if someone is here, regardless of status, I would prefer that they be participating in the workplace than not participating in the workplace. With respect to... Well, um, what, no, no, that was... A, uh, so you think that a person that's... Anybody that's here lawfully or unlawfully is entitled to work in America? Well, Senator, I'm not sure if I know, that, if I um, understand the basis for your question as, as to whether or not there's a legal basis for them to work or not. Um, I ask you, who had, we're talking about rights, who has the most rights? Mm -hmm. Does a, a lawful American immigrant or citizen have the right to have the laws of the United States enforced so that they might be able to work? or does a person who came here unlawfully have a right to demand a job? Certainly the benefits of citizenship confer greater rights on those of us who are citizens and those than those who are not. Well, do you think a person that's here unlawfully is entitled to work in the United States when the law says that employers can't hire somebody unlawfully in America? I I'm believe that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, sir. I think that certainly the provision that you refer to regarding to uh, the role of the employer in ensuring the legal status of those who are here is an important one and that we have to look at in conjunction with this issue uh, in terms of preventing um, uh, undocumented workers who, as you've indicated before, are seeking employment. Again, we want everyone to seek employment, but we have in, in place at this point in time a legal framework that requests or requires employers to both pro provide information about citizenship as well as not hire individuals All without right. citizenship. D do you think that someone given, you, I understand that you support the, um, the executive order and OLC's opinion, is that correct? I, believe I don't believe my role at this point is to support or not support it. My review of it was to, to see whether or not it did outline a legal framework for some of the actions that were requested. And as noted, it indicated that there was not a legal framework for other actions well, that were requested. Just let me wrap up by asking this. Um, are you, if, if a person uh, comes here and is given a lawful right under the president's executive amnesty to have a social security and a work authorization card, what if somebody prefers to hire uh, an American citizen first? Uh, would you take action against them? Do you understand this to mean that those who are given executive amnesty are entitled as much as anybody else in America to compete for a job in America? Well, I don't believe that it would give anyone any greater access to the workforce, and certainly an employer um, would be looking at the issues of citizenship and making those determinations. Would you take uh, action against an employer who says, no, I prefer to hire somebody that came to the country lawfully rather than someone given executive amnesty by the president? Would when the you, Department of Justice take action against them? When you answer that, I'll move on. Then. Thank you, sir. With respect to the, the provision about temporary deferral, I did not read it as providing a legal amnesty, that is, that permanent... Um, uh, status there, but a temporary deferral. With respect to whether or not uh, those individuals would be able to seek redress for employment discrimination, if, if that is the purpose of your question, again, I haven't studied that legal issue. I certainly think you raise an important point and would look forward to discussing it with you and using and relying upon your thoughts and experience uh, as we consider that point. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Session. Now, Senator Schumer. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I think that even in the short while here, it's clear to my colleagues uh, why you are such a tremendous, why you've been such a tremendous U.S. attorney in my home uh, state of New York, in her home borough of Brooklyn, and why you'd make such a great attorney general. You've just, you know, you're just knocking them out of the park. And so, speaking of <laughs> sports analogies, there's another point I'd like my colleagues to know, another testament to your perseverance, to your loyalty in the face of incredible adversity. With all due respect to Mr. Tillis, you're not a Tar Heel or a Blue Devil. You're a Knicks fan. That takes, that's, it's a lot tougher being a Knicks fan than going through these questions here today. Um, but anyway, I have a couple of, I'd like to just go over a couple of points some of my colleagues made. First, on prosecutorial discretion. There's a myth out there that prosecutorial discretion policies are tantamount to an illegal failure to force the law. And uh, we know that you have enforced the law aggressively and will continue to do so, uh, as has the administration. My friends, some of my friends across the aisle seem to be suggesting that the President's announcement of the enforcement policies for the Department of Homeland Security is tantamount to an announcement that we won't enforce our immigration laws, but that's absurd. We know we have 11 million undocumented immigrants living in the United States. Congress, this body, only allocates enough money for DHS to deport 400,000 of them. 11 million illegal immigrants, enough money to deport 400,000. Obviously, you have to make some choices here. And I'm sure when my dear friend Jeff Sessions, and he is a dear friend, um, was a U.S. attorney in Alabama, he used prosecutorial discretion. I know he did a good job going after violent drug dealers and criminals. Would we want, our we want our prosecutors to go after the highest level crimes if they don't have the resources to do all of them. Doesn't it make sense to have a general rule uh, to prosecute in a prosecutorial office with limited resources to go after bank robbers before you go after shoplifters? Now, obviously, there can be an occasional exception. As you mentioned, the President's executive order allows for that occasional exception, but this idea that going after, having an office uh, go after the higher level, more dangerous crimes first is part of how law enforcement has gone on for hundreds of years, and it should. So I don't even get this idea that this is a, a, an illegal uh, act by the President. We arm our law enforcement officials with an array of laws but limited resources. They have to make hard choices. And a straightforward allocation of resources is not political activism. It's what prosecutors are doing in every jurisdiction of this land right now. Immigration is like any other issue. We have limited resources. It makes eminent sense to go after the hardened criminals before going after lower-level offenders. So just let me ask you a couple of questions here. Don't U.S. attorney offices all over the country consistently have to make these general type of prosecutorial decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, and how do you? How do you? Yes, Senator. With respect to um, the exercise of discretion and the setting of priorities, one of the privileges that I have had is of being uh, the U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of New York uh, and working with my colleagues across the country has been getting to know them and learning about how different every district is, how a crime problem in Brooklyn may not even appear on the West Coast, and how a crime problem in the Midwest that has seen an increase in crime due to the, the happy accident um, of increased oil reserves may present issues that I would never face in an urban environment. Um, my colleagues and I work together, and we share our thoughts on the best ways to deploy our limited resources to deal with the crime problems in our districts. My colleagues that have a large number of Native American reservations in their districts, for example, have a very different base of problems than I do, but they are just as committed and just as focused on keeping those citizens safe as well. So all of us look at the crime problems in our districts. To do that, we work very closely with our law enforcement partners in, in looking at how they have determined the nature of the threat, be it terrorism, be it narcotics, be it those who would target children. Uh, we also work closely with our state 
and local counterparts, not just the law enforcement counterparts, but our prosecutive counterparts in the district attorney's offices. Many times I will have a matter in my office that is subject to both federal and state jurisdiction, and it may be more appropriate for the district attorney to prosecute that type of crime because of the nature of the sentence that can be achieved, because of the impact on a particular victim or community, or because of a legal issue with, uh, involving proof and the admissibility thereof. All of these things go into the consideration of how we manage individual cases, but also how we set priorities and then deploy our limited resources to best protect the people of our district. Exactly. Every prosecutor, every, whether it's the Justice Department, the U.S. Attorney's Office sets priorities and has to. And that's just what the President did, in my opinion, in the executive order. Next one. We're hearing a lot about executive action uh, being unconstitutional. And so I'd like to just talk about that. That's another myth that's out there. Uh, now, no federal court has struck down executive action. The most recent federal court to hand down a decision supported it. Uh, I've heard it suggested federal courts have declared executive action unconstitutional. It so happens, in, fa in fact, dating back to Chief Justice Rehnquist, the Supreme Court has repeatedly bolstered executive discretion and refused to review agency decisions that are within the law with respect to this executive action, there have been two federal cases filed. One here in Washington by Sheriff Arpaio, notoriously anti-immigration activist. That's been dismissed. The second suit was filed in Texas and is still pending. Now we're hearing that so no courts have struck down executive action. Now we're hearing uh, that Speaker Boehner and House Republicans will be suing the President on, exec on this executive action. I don't think that's a responsible use of taxpayer dollars, but at least Speaker Boehner and I agree on one thing. If Republicans disagree with, the, with President Obama over the legality of this policy, they can sue him and let the courts decide. The confirmation of America's highest law enforcement officer is not the time or place to vent frustration. So. Uh, let me just ask you a couple of questions. You've answered them, but I want to underscore them because some people are concerned that the, quote, rogue Obama administration is lawless. Will you commit to following court decisions and legal process? Absolutely, Senator. That's my first point of reference. And specifically, if a court happens to strike down executive action, will you respect that court decision? I will respect that court decision. And let's imagine Congress, I don't think this will happen, I would try to prevent it as best I could, but let's say Congress were to pass a bill explicitly prohibiting President Obama's immigration actions, a bill I find hard to imagine the President would sign. But let's just imagine, for the sake of argument, happened. If that such a bill passed, will you commit to following the new law? I will commit to following the, all the laws duly executed by this body. Thank you. Okay, just one other issue, since I have a little more time. Um, work permits, which might good friend again, Jeff brought, uh, Senator Sessions brought up. Some have suggested it's illegal for the administration to issue work permits for recipients of <coughs> deferred action. Again, they imply this is unprecedented. That's misleading. Guess who did it in 1982? Ronald Reagan. They published INS regulations authorizing work permits for recipients of deferred action. 1982, the Reagan administration. That's not to say workplace enforcement isn't unnecessary, isn't necessary. It is. And in fact, isn't it true, Ms. Lynch, that you have a strong record of enforcing workplace immigration rules? Just tell us a little about the 7-Eleven stores case that you brought on Long Island. Thank you, Senator. Um, the case against the 7-Eleven stores and various franchises was a very important one to my office because it was one in which we saw a corporate entity deliberately flouting the, the, the labor laws. Um, individuals um, of mostly of, of a particular ethnic group who owned franchises at 7-Eleven were reaching out to their own community members and hiring them to work in the stores. Um, this would have been an opportunity for individuals to earn money for their families and to essentially become part of the American dream. Instead, however, the workers were systematically victimized. They were forced to work double shifts, triple shifts, yet only paid for working part-time hours. Um, they were only given their money in either a 7-Eleven debit card or, or cash as deemed appropriate by the manager. Um, more, even, even worse than this, 
was the evidence that we uncovered that the stores were aware that they were violating the labor laws um, and simply flouting them. Uh, they also requested, or they also required the workers to all live together in company-sanctioned housing. Uh, we essentially were creating a modern-day plantation system on Long Island and also throughout the Virginia area uh, with co-conspirators of, uh, of these franchise owners. We spent a long time working on the investigation in conjunction with our, our law enforcement partners. Um, the matter is still being reviewed with respect to other states. Uh, and wherever we find workers uh, being victimized and being discriminated against, certainly my office has never hesitated to take action. Thank you. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I would offer for the record a consent that an article from the Atlantic saying, headline from, by David Frum, uh, Reagan and Bush offer no precedent for Obama's amnesty order, and I think that's crystal clear. Uh, Senator Cornyn, Justice Cornyn, is next. Good morning, Ms. Good Lynch. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations again to you on your nomination, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for coming to my office last, I guess it was last Friday, yes. uh, to visit about uh, this hearing, and, and, uh, and I should say uh, congratulations to you for an outstanding uh, career as a United States attorney. Um, the challenge, I think, that people have when they come to Washington, D.C., and they assume jobs that have political um, implications is that they sort of forget their basic mooring in the law, and they become politicians masquerading as law enforcement officers. And that's a real challenge. And I won't claim that it's only a challenge for Democrats. It's a challenge, has been a challenge for Republicans as well. But um, I, I am concerned, uh, well, let me, let me, for Senator Schumer's benefit, let me just stipulate, you're not Eric Holder, are you? No, I'm not, sir. Okay. <laughs> so no one's suggesting that you are, but of course, uh, Attorney General Holder's record is uh, heavy on our minds now. And, uh, and I agree with the chairman uh, about his concerns when the Attorney General refers to himself as the president's wingman, uh, suggesting that he is not, does not uh, exercise independent legal judgment as the chief law enforcement officer uh, for the country. Um, you wouldn't consider yourself to be a uh, political arm of the White House as Attorney General, would you? No, Senator. That would be a totally inappropriate view of the position uh, of Attorney General. Which and you're, must and I'm sorry. And, you're, and you, you'd be willing to tell your friends no if, in your judgment, uh, the law required that? Sir, I think that I have to be willing to tell not just my friends and acquaintances, but colleagues, uh, no, if the law requires it. And that would be the pres include the President of the United States? I think that the obligation of the Attorney General is to, when presented with matters by the President, to provide a full, thorough, independent, substantive legal analysis and give the President the best independent judgment that there is. And that may be a judgment that says that there is a legal framework for certain actions, and it may be a judgment that says that there is not a legal framework for certain actions. And while we've stipulated you're not Eric Holder, um, Mr. Holder's uh, record is um, certainly on our minds, uh, because I can't think of an attorney general who so misevaluated the independent role of the chief law enforcement officer and taken on that aspect of the president's wingman and operated as a politician uh, using the awesome power conferred by our laws on the Attorney General. Uh, the Attorney General has been openly contemptuous of the oversight responsibilities of a co-equal branch of government. He's uh, stonewalled uh, legitimate investigations by the, uh, by the Congress, including the investigation into the Fast and Furious episode that uh, Senator Grassley referred to earlier, making bogus claims of executive privilege in order to keep Congress and the American people from finding out the facts. Um, we know that the Attorney General has repeatedly uh, made legal arguments that have been rejected as unconstitutional um, by the United States Supreme Court. And he's harassed states like mine, and I suspect you'll hear from another colleague about his state on matters like voter ID uh, when the United States Supreme Court has upheld uh, the validity of voter ID as a means to protect the integrity of the ballot for people who are qualified to vote. And at the same time, um, the, the Attorney General has 
failed to implement laws that Congress has passed in order to provide uh, to protect the voting rights of our military deployed overseas. He's also politicized the war on terror. Um, he's declassified top secret legal memos exposing uh, public officials in the intelligence community to not only ridicule but threats, uh, legal and otherwise, for performing actions that they were told uh, by the highest legal authorities uh, were legal and were uh, necessary to save American lives. And indeed, uh, he reopened a criminal uh, investigation into those same members of the intelligence community after a previous investigation had not revealed any basis for uh, criminal charges. So how do we know you're not going to uh, perform uh, your duties of office as Attorney General uh, the way Eric Holder has performed his duties? How are you going to be different? Senator, um, if confirmed as Attorney General, um, I will be myself. I will be Loretta Lynch. And I, and I would refer you to my record as United States Attorney on two occasions, uh, as well as a practicing lawyer, to see the independence and that I've always brought to every particular matter. I certainly think that going forward, while I'm not familiar with the particulars of the issues that you raise, um, they clearly are of concern to you and perhaps to this committee. And I do pledge to this committee that I want to hear your concerns, I want to listen to your concerns, and I will always be open to discussing those issues with you. Senator, I'm sure that as we go forward, should I be confirmed, while it would be wonderful to think that you would agree with everything that I would do, that may not be the case. You may but not agree with everything we do. And that is, that is perfectly appropriate. But Senator, I will always be open to discussing with you why I have done something and the basis for which I have made an action to the extent that I am able to do so. I have found that to be the most effective way of not just for me in terms of learning from people with whom I disagree, but also working effectively with people with whom I may disagree on various points, but with whom, like you, we share a common goal. Ms. Lynch, I've been married 35 years, and I can guarantee you that 100 percent agreement is an impossible standard <laughs> for anybody to comply with. So we don't expect, we don't expect that, obviously. But I, I want to ask you about your commitment to working with the committee and Congress and respecting our congressional oversight authority. Um, Senator, uh, a recent letter sent to Senator Leahy on behalf of Attorney General Holder was dated uh, December the 5th, 2014, and it responds to questions for the record that arose in an appearance before this committee on March the 6th, 2013. So, um, obviously about, this looks roughly a year and a half, more than a year and a half later. Can we expect a more timely uh, response from you and the Department of Justice to the legitimate inquiries of this committee? Certainly, Senator. I believe that the oversight responsibility of this committee is important, not just for the, re the functioning of the committee, but also to the American people in terms of helping them understand the way in which the department operates and the way in which we all work to keep them safe. I commit to you absolutely that I will work with this committee to ensure that we provide as timely a response as possible. I'm not sure of the particulars of the matter that you raised, so I, I, I'm not able to comment on that. But certainly I would hope to be able to provide you with the information that you need in as timely a manner as possible, consistent with the department's litigation and enforcement responsibilities. I think it would make it possible for you to be a more effective attorney general, and it would make it possible for us to be more effective in our respective roles as member of Congress, uh, exercising our responsibilities as well. Uh, I want to just ask you a little bit about prosecutorial discretion, which you've heard something about here. Um, my only regret from this morning's hearing is that the uh, Senator Schumer, the uh, senior senator from New York who introduced you, he wasn't available for cross-examination <laughs> by members of the committee, uh, but we'll have a chance to talk later. But he, he was somewhat some dismissive of concerns about this um, massive, uh, what I would consider in essence refusal to enforce existing law uh, that is involved in these executive actions. Um, there is a difference to your mind, isn't there, between a case-by-case exercise of prosecutorial discretion and a refusal to enforce uh, the laws that are on the books. There is a difference, isn't there? 
Senator, there, there is a difference, um, and I do not view the Department of Justice, certainly in my own practice, as refusing to enforce laws, but rather attempting to set priorities and then exercising discretion within those priorities. Well, let me ask you about that. Isn't it a incumbent upon the Department of Justice to ask Congress for the resources to do the job that Congress has said uh, the, the Department must perform before you can come back and say, well, uh, we're just not going to pursue those crimes and those offenses because we don't have enough money. I mean, isn't it your responsibility? Won't it be your responsibility as the next Attorney General to come to us and ask us for those resources? I can't imagine if uh, Attorney General Holder or the President of the United States or Secretary Johnson or others had come to us and said, we don't have the resources to enforce the immigration laws, so we're going to have to, we're going to have to, in essence, decline to enforce them because we don't have those. I mean, don't you have that responsibility to ask for those resources before you decline to enforce the law based on lack of resources? Certainly, Senator. I'm not aware of the Department of Homeland Security's um, budget request before this, this, uh, this body or Congress in general. With respect to the Department of Justice, I have been involved in reviewing the budget um, as part of the, my work on the Attorney General's Advisory Committee, and certainly during sequestration, spent a great deal of time looking at the budget to ensure that we did uh, maintain the appropriate resources to carry out our core mission of protecting the American people within the constraints that were placed upon us at that time. And it's my understanding that with respect to budget requests that the Department of Justice makes, that those requests do include information about goals and priorities across the board uh, in, as a way of explaining to Congress why specific resources are needed. So you do need more money. I would probably join all of my agencies in saying that, sir, but I can't speak for them. <laughs> That's what I thought. Thank Sen you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, now Senator Durbin, then the next Republican will be Senator Lindsey Graham. <clears throat> Ms. Lynch, thank you for being here. I will be objective, although I am deferential to women named Loretta. <laughs> I've been married to one for 47 years, and I'm glad that you're here today. When your father lifted you up on his shoulders at that Greensboro church, you were a young girl at the time, but a witness to a moment in history that changed America forever and literally changed your life. There was no way you could know that. One of the central issues that was raised during the Civil Rights Movement was the right to vote, a right which Chief Justice Roberts said, sitting in that very same place in quoting a court decision, is preservative of all rights. We are now in a unique position, some 50 years later, about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder struck down major provisions of the Voting Rights Act, and Congress, which historically had renewed the Voting Rights Act on a bipartisan basis, is now, with few rare exceptions, split along partisan lines as to whether or not there will be a renewal of some sections. We are finding states across the nation, many states, that are changing the requirements for voting. I chaired the Constitution Subcommittee of Judiciary. I took um, the subcommittee to public hearings in Ohio and Florida, where there were new restrictions placed on voting by state legislatures. I called the election officials of both political parties in those states and asked them if there was any evidence of voter fraud or voter abuse that led to these legislative changes, and to a person they said virtually none. What has happened is that the Department of Justice has stepped in, in some cases that they considered to be extreme and unfair, and worked to stop the implementation of these state laws that restricted the right to vote. As you embark on the possibility of making that decision as Attorney General, how do you view the state of voting rights in America today, and what do you view as your responsibility should you be our next Attorney General? Thank you, Senator. Certainly, I believe that the right to vote is the cornerstone of a free democracy, and one that every citizen has the right, and in fact, some would argue the obligation to exercise. Um, with respect, to how voting rights are, men are being handled in the country now. I think we are in a time of great debate over these issues, those are important issues, 
and I'm certainly open to hearing all sides of it. With respect to how, and I also think that every state does have the responsibility and obligation to regulate the voter rolls and to ensure that the vote is, vote is carried out freely and openly and fairly. Um, and I do believe that that is the goal of many of our elected officials, if not most of our elected officials, who deal with these issues every day. The concerns that are raised, Senator, are when acts that are taken with a goal towards protecting and preserving uh, the integrity of the vote act in a different way and act to suppress the vote or in some way uh, prevent people from exercising the franchise. I would hope that uh, at, at the first outset, through the political discourse and discussion, that we could have conversation about that and come to a resolution of practices and procedures that would ensure the right to vote for all citizens while still protecting the integrity of everyone's ballot. Absent that, I believe that when laws are passed, the Department of Justice has to look very carefully at their impact in making a decision as to how to proceed. Certainly, there have been instances when voter ID laws have received approval from the department under what was previously known as preclearance, uh, because they sought to simply regulate and protect the ballot as opposed to act in a different way. Um, and But where there is an indication that, that uh, the vote will somehow be harmed, I believe the Department of Justice certainly has the obligation to review that matter, to look carefully at all of the facts and evidence, and then proceed accordingly. I couldn't agree with you more, and I find it ironic and painful that at this moment in our history, as we celebrate with the movie Selma and talk about 50-year anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, that states, many states, on a systematic basis are making it more difficult for Americans to vote without any evidence of voter fraud to back up those changes. In one southern state, it's estimated that some 600,000 voters were basically precluded from voting in an election because of new voter ID requirements. Uh, in that same state, a 93-year-old veteran was turned away, a 70-year-old doctor turned away, people who were proud to vote, wanted to vote, turned away by new laws. These were people who had a right to vote. And it troubles me that amidst all the celebration of the civil rights movement, we are finding a reversal of the most fundamental principle in preserving that right to vote. I appreciate what you had to say about it. I would say a word uh, about the Smarter Sentencing Act, which I introduced with uh, Senator Lee, who may be still here today, from Utah, a bipartisan measure with 32 co-sponsors in an effort to take a look at the reality that not only does the United States have more prisoners per capita than any other nation, uh, but in many instances, lengthy prison sentences do not serve the cause of justice and deny us resources we need to keep our communities safe. Um, Attorney General Holder, who is not held in the highest regard by some members of this committee, has been uh, an outspoken supporter of this bipartisan measure, and I hope that you would consider supporting it too, although I won't put you on the spot to do that without giving uh, you a chance to look at it. Uh, let me add one other element. As chairman of the Constitution and Human Rights and Civil Rights Committee, which was its name before this new Congress, we also had a hearing on solitary confinement. It turns out the United States in its prison system has more prisoners in solitary confinement than any other nation. And we had testimony from those who had spent 10 years on death row in solitary confinement in Texas, in even longer period of time in solitary confinement on death row in the state of Louisiana and ultimately exonerated. They were not found to be guilty. The devastating impact that has on the human mind and spirit for so many of these people who serve time in solitary confinement, many of whom are going to be ultimately released, is something the Federal Bureau of Prisons is now addressing. You've been a prosecutor for many years. What is your view when it comes to incarceration and segregation or solitary confinement. Senator, you raise important um, issues about the management of our prison system, which are charged with the ultimate, being the ultimate repository for those that we have concluded are seeking to harm Americans, but are also charged with doing so in a manner that is constitutional, that is effective, and that protects the safety of both the inmates and those who are guarding them. So these are balances that we have to strike. 
And I take the view that certainly as we look at these issues, one of the benefits, I believe, of discourse like this and that I hope to have going forward with this committee is continued discussion on those issues. There are a number of, uh, of uh, municipalities, for example, that are looking at this very same issue. Uh, New York City is looking at it with respect to juvenile detention and, 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 and looking to remove solitary confinement as an option for juvenile detention as well, based on many of the similar studies that you are talking about. I believe we have to look at those studies. We have to listen to the evidence that comes before us and make the best determination about how to handle what can be a dangerous prison population, but how to handle that prison population in a way that's both constitutional and effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, uh, Senator Graham is the next person. Yeah, thank I'm you. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Lynch, and congratulations on being chosen by the President. This is truly an honor, I'm sure. Uh, do you support the death penalty? Senator, I believe that the death penalty is an effective penalty. In fact, my office most recently was able to achieve How about a, yes? a death verdict there. Yes. So we have sought it, yes. Yeah, okay. That's good. Uh, well, that's good from my point of view. <laughs> I don't know about other people. Uh, sequestration. Have you had a chance to look at the impact sequestration will uh, create on your uh, ability to defend this nation as Attorney General, all those who work for you? Senator, with respect to sequestration, I have had an opportunity to review that matter very closely uh, through my work on the Attorney General's Advisory Committee and also as, you, as, as United States Attorney dealing with the budgetary limits um, that, that came down with the implementation of sequestration. Um, as you are familiar with the history perhaps far more than I, it did constrain the federal budget uh, greatly um, about, uh, about 18 months ago. Is this a fair ago. statement? If Congress continues to implement sequestration, it will devastate the Department of Justice's ability to effectively defend this country. Senator, I believe that that is not only a fair statement, but it is one that warrants serious discussion about how we manage budgets uh, in a responsible manner, which I know is important to this body, but also uh, giving us the tools that we need to protect the American people. In your time in this business, have you ever seen more threats to our country than are presented today? Certainly throughout my career as a prosecutor and U.S. attorney, we are seeing an increased number and probably the highest number of threats that I have seen, not just from terrorist activity, but the increased uh, activity in terms of cyber crime is one that is not only increased numerically, but, qu but uh, qualitatively in the type of threat that we face. So we need to up our game in the cybersecurity area fairly quickly. Do you agree with that? We do need to make sure we have the resources we need to keep up with cyber crimes and also to get ahead of these criminals in terms of detection, in terms of prevention, even before we get to the apprehension of these criminals. And there's just not criminals. Terrorists also are in the cyber business. Is that correct? Senator, you've outlined perhaps the greatest fear of any prosecutor is that the combination of a cyber attack uh, being carried out on behalf of a, a terrorist entity is one that uh, we take great pains to prevent, to detect, and to disrupt. But it is certainly an emerging threat and recalls for resources beyond just mere personnel, but in terms of our own technology also. Does it also cry out for Congress to take a comprehensive uh, uh, approach to our cyber problems and pass legislation that would modernize our ability to deal with this threat? Certainly a comprehensive approach is necessary. In my experience, both in the Eastern District of New York and in talking to my colleagues, all of us are struck by the prevalence of cyber issues in every type of case that we prosecute now, much more so than even five or ten years ago. And so we must have not only a comprehensive approach, but one that allows government to work with private industry as well to come up with ways to best protect us against this threat. Could you give us an estimate, if not now in the future, what it would cost to deport 11 million people? Certainly, Senator, I, can, I, can, um, I wouldn't be able to give you that estimate right. now um, and would probably have to reach out to the Department of Homeland Security, who would be charged with that particular action, to see if they could provide that information to you. Okay. Do you have a role in the deportation of uh, people here illegally in the Department of Justice? Do you have any role at all there? Well, that role is initially, in terms of deportation, the role is initially handled by the Department of Homeland Security. There is, uh, there are the immigration courts 
uh, through which individuals can seek either asylum or redress from deportation orders that are handled by the Department of Justice. But that would be um, simply actually further along in the process. But that's part of the process. Yes, it is. If you could maybe give us an estimate of what it would take to deport 11 million people from your lane, call the Department of Justice and see what they say, I think it would be instructive to us to see what the bill actually would be. Uh, now, do you think the national NSA terrorist surveillance program is constitutional as it is today? I'm sorry? Do you think the NSA program, terrorist surveillance program that we have in effect today is constitutional? Senator, I believe that it's not only it's, it's constitutional and effective, I know that there are court challenges to it, and certainly we will abide by those court regulations. Right. Uh, but it has been a very effective tool in managing But you're that. okay with it being constitutional from your viewpoint? Certainly constitutional and effective. Thank you. Uh, marijuana. There are a lot of states legalizing marijuana for personal consumption. Is it a crime at the federal level to possess marijuana? Marijuana is still a criminal substance under federal law. Um, and it is still a crime, um, not only to possess, but to distribute under federal law. Under the doctrine of preemption, would the federal law preempt states who are trying to legalize the substance? Senator, I think you raised very important questions about the relation of the federal criminal system with the states um, and, their own, and their ability to regulate criminal law that they also have, because as there is concurrent jurisdiction, and in terms of matters in which citizens of various states have voted. With respect to the marijuana enforcement laws, it is still the policy of the administration and certainly would be my policy if confirmed as Attorney General to continue enforcing the marijuana laws, particularly with respect to the money laundering aspect of it, um, where, we, where we see uh, the evidence that marijuana, as I've noticed in cases in my own district, brings with it not only organized crime activity, but great levels of violence. Have you, do you know of Michelle uh, Leonhart? the DEA administrator? I don't know if I said her name right. She is the administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration. Have you ever had a discussion with her about her views of legalizing marijuana? Michelle and I have not had that discussion, although we have spoken on any number of other could, could issues. Could you maybe have that discussion and report back to me as to what the results were? Certainly, Senator. I look forward to speaking to not just Ms. Leonard, but with you on this issue. In August 29, 2013, I think uh, Deputy Attorney General James M. Cole advised all U.S. attorneys that enforcing marijuana laws against those that are in compliance with state marijuana laws would not be a priority of the DOJ. Did you get that memo? All U.S. attorneys <clears throat> received that memo, I did, as did I. Do you think that is a good policy? I believe that the Deputy Attorney General's policy seeks to try and work with state systems that have chosen to take admittedly a different approach from the federal government with respect to marijuana and determine the most effective way to still pursue marijuana cases uh, consistent with the states and the choices that they have made. The Deputy Attorney General's policy, as both as I understood it and has been implemented, still requires federal prosecutors to seek prosecution of, of marijuana cases, particularly where we have situations where children are at, at risk, um, where marijuana is crossing state lines, particularly where you have marijuana being trafficked from a state that has chosen a legal framework into a state that has not chosen a legal framework and the attendant harms therein, as well as those who are driving under the influence of this. A great concern, certainly within the department and those of us who are looking at these issues, is the availability of the edible products um, and the risk of those falling into the hands of children and causing great harm there. <coughs> If a state is uh, intending to try to legalize uh, personal consumption at a small level of marijuana, what would your advice be to that state? Well, certainly I'm not sure that uh, if, a if a state were to reach out to the department for its views, um, and I don't know if that's happened or what advice has been given, but certainly I believe the department would have an obligation to inform them of the current federal status of narcotics laws and the department's position uh, that, that, um, that the federal narcotics laws will still be enforced um, by the Department of Justice. In 2006, you, you uh, signed an amicus brief supporting Planned Parenthood's uh, opposition to partial birth abortion ban. Is that correct? 
Yes, I was one of a number of former Department of Justice officials, although the amicus brief that we signed was focused on the issue of the uh, facial issues of the law and how it might impact the perception of law enforcement's discretion and independence. Okay. The only reason I mention that is that if there's a Republican president in the future and an attorney general nominee takes an opposite view on an issue like abortion, I hope our friends on the other side will acknowledge it's okay to be an advocate for a cause as their lawyer. That doesn't disqualify you from serving. Uh, Same-sex marriage, the courts are wrestling with this issue right I'm sorry, now. sorry. Same-sex marriage, there, this may go to the Supreme Court very soon. <clears throat> if the Supreme Court rules that same-sex uh, marriage bans are unconstitutional, it violates the U.S. Constitution for a state try to limit marriage between a man and a woman. That's clearly the law of the land, unless there's a constitutional amendment to change it. What legal rationale would be in play that would prohibit polygamy? What's the legal difference between a state, a, a ban on same-sex marriage being unconstitutional, but a ban on polygamy being constitutional? Could you try to articulate how one w could be banned under the Constitution and the other not? Well, Senator, I have not uh, been involved in the argument or analysis of the cases that have gone before the Supreme Court. So, um, and I'm not comfortable undertaking legal analysis without having had the ability to undertake a review of the relevant facts and the precedent there. So I certainly would not be able to provide you with that analysis at this point in time, but I look forward to continuing the discussions with you. From Rhode Island, ask his questions. It, this would be my plan, and you tell me if this will give you enough time. The Rhode Island Senator, Senator Lee, and then Senator Klobuchar, that'll take us till about 1245. And I was thinking of coming back about 130. Is that Thank going, you, Senator. Is that going to give you enough time? Yes, indeed. Thank you, okay. Senator. Uh, Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Lynch, welcome to the committee, and congratulations on your nomination. I look forward to working with you on a considerable number of issues as we go forward. Um, since there has been a significant amount of commentary um, about the President's immigration measures, um, the ranking member has asked me to put into the record letters from law enforcement leaders in uh, Ohio, Utah, Iowa, Indiana, and Wisconsin supporting the President's uh, policies and saying, concluding, while the executive reforms improve a broken immigration system, they can achieve only a fraction of what can be accomplished by broad congressional action. We continue to recognize that what our broken system truly needs is a permanent legislative solution and urge Congress to enact comprehensive immigration reform legislation. Uh, there is a similar letter from the member organizations of the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, and a, a similar statement for the record of Stan Marek of Texas, the president and CEO of the Marek family of companies. If I may ask unanimous consent that those be made a part of the record. Without objection. Um, there has also been considerable commentary about uh, Attorney General Holder in a hearing at which he does not have the opportunity to defend himself. And it's my view that a significant amount of that commentary would not withstand his ability to defend himself if he were here. So um, let me say in response to that, um, there are legal arguments and policies that fall outside a particular political ideology. That does not make them outside the mainstream. And it does not politicize a department to make those arguments or pursue those policies. I'd argue, actually, that it's the effort to constrain the department within that ideology that would be politicizing. I'd further note, as a former United States attorney, that the department that Attorney General Holder inherited was in a very grave state of disarray. And that's not just a matter of opinion. The Office of Legal Counsel wrote opinions that were so bad 
so ill-informed, so ill-cited to the case law that pertained, that when they were finally exposed to peer review, they were widely ridiculed and ultimately withdrawn uh, by the previous administration. Uh, we witnessed efforts to manipulate United States attorneys, and I know that you are one, Ms. Lynch, that caused a very public rebellion among sitting U.S. attorneys at the time and that drew in past U.S. attorneys appointed by both Republican and Democratic presidents. presidents. Uh, we were uh, exposed to hiring practices within the department that were on their face overtly political and had political litmus tests for hiring, a first in the department's history, haven't gone down that way before, and ultimately a series of other uh, issues as well as those led to the resignation of the Attorney General of the United States. So it's easy to critique Attorney General Holder and blame him for politicizing the department, but I think history's calm and dispassionate judgment will reflect that Attorney General actually brought the department back from a place where it had been sadly politicized. And I can say firsthand that a lot of my U.S. Attorney colleagues, both from Republican and Democratic administrations, were very, very concerned about what was happening to the department back then. So I shouldn't waste the time of this hearing on that, but with all the things that have been said about Attorney General Holder without him having the opportunity to defend and rebut, I wanted to say that. So some of the areas I think we need to work together, uh, Ms. Lynch, when you're confirmed, which, as I hope you will be. Um, Senator Graham raised the issue of cybersecurity. And he has been an extraordinarily helpful and forward-leaning member of the Senate on protecting our country from the dangers of cyber attacks, whether it's ordinary criminal activity or the theft of intellectual property wholesale on behalf of Chinese industries, or the really dangerous threat of laying in the tr cyber sabotage traps that can be detonated uh, later on in the event of a, of a conflict. Um, I'm concerned about the structure within the department for handling cybersecurity. At an investigative level, it's spread across primarily the FBI, secondarily Secret Service, and to a degree Homeland Security. Within the department, it falls under the rubric both of the Criminal Division and of the National Security Division. And I hope that with the assistance of the Office of Management and Budget, you and I and the Office of Management and Budget and other interested senators can continue a conversation about what the deployment of resources and structure should look like against the cybersecurity threat in the future. Will you agree to participate in such a process? Certainly, Senator. I think you've outlined an important issue um, and if confirmed as Attorney General, I look forward to working with you and all of the relevant partners on this committee and throughout Congress in making sure that the Department is best situated to handle this growing threat. There is uh, considerable bipartisan legislation in the Senate on this subject, and I hope it's one where we can uh, get something serious accomplished in the, in the months ahead. Another area where there is considerable uh, bipartisan legislation is on sentencing reform. Senator Durbin mentioned his and Senator Lee's legislation that is at the front end, at the sentencing end. Um, Senator Cornyn and I have a almost parallel bill that relates to the end of the sentence and how to encourage incarcerated people to get the type of job training, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, anger management, mental health care, family reconciliation, job training, whatever it is that they need, so that when they're put back into society, they have a less chance of going back to a life of crime, of recidivating, as they say. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress on that, and I think we have very good legislation, and I hope that uh, you and the department will continue to be supportive of our efforts. Certainly, Senator. You, you've raised, I think, the next challenge as we look at how to manage our prison population and the issue of crime, which is how do we help people who are going to be released return to the communities from which they came and become productive citizens as opposed to returning to the prior behavior, criminal behavior, that not only landed them in prison but creates new victims. 
Um, and that, is, that will certainly be an important part of my focus. Within the Eastern District of New York, we are very strong participants in reentry programs that are sponsored um, by our colleagues at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office uh, in one of the most difficult neighborhoods in my district, in Brownsville. Uh, we work extensively with those reentry efforts, um, and those reentry efforts work exactly as you said in focusing on job training and focusing on building skills so that those coming out of prisons can become productive members of society as opposed to those who will continue to harm others in society. So you certainly have raised very important issues and I look forward to continuing the, the discussion with you and people on this committee and throughout this body on those issues. Thank you. Um, another piece of legislation we'll be working on, thanks to the uh, courtesy and care of our uh, chairman, Senator Grassley, is a reauthorization of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, which has been now 12 years since its last reauthorization. And I uh, appreciate very much that the chairman has been willing to work on this and has made it one of the priorities for this committee. Obviously, the way in which juveniles are treated in our correction system and as they're uh, detained has been an important issue for the Justice Department. And I would ask again for your cooperation and, and active support of uh, our process going forward to reauthorize the JJDPA. Certainly, Senator. I think that the, the way in which we handle juveniles within the criminal justice system um, is something that, that is of great concern to me in terms of both my practice in the Eastern District of New York and also talking to my colleagues, the other U.S. attorneys across the country who face these issues. I believe it certainly is incumbent upon all of us to look at the latest research on issues of how juveniles develop and how they manage um, their, their themselves in, in certain uh, environments and in always my, be open to reviewing those. I look forward to working with you and others in it, discussing that statute. In my last uh, seconds, um, you and I have both had the experience of being United States attorneys, and I suspect we both had the experience of finding people who were targets of our criminal enforcement efforts who, if we look back into their past, might have avoided our attention had they managed their drug or alcohol addiction Certainly. or gotten the mental health treatment that they needed. And it's sort of a I guess it's almost, it's a societal sorrow when somebody like that doesn't get the treatment that they need and ends up in the criminal justice system, and it's a great burden for the taxpayer. Uh, we have other legislation, the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, that I hope you will also work with us on to try to make sure that where we can intervene with appropriate addiction treatment and mental health treatment, we can move people to a more appropriate setting rather than burden the criminal justice system uh, with what is often an inappropriate response to their conduct and to their condition. Certainly, Senator, in my own district, our court has been very forward-thinking and very uh, effective in, in setting up diversion programs and a pretrial opportunity program that has provided great support for people and enabled them to provide treatment and learn to become productive members of society and therefore escape uh, being trapped into a spiral of criminal behavior and the results thereof. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you very much. And now, Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Lynch, uh, for joining us today. Thanks for your service to our country. Um, I also appreciated uh, our, our visit uh, recently when you came to my office, and I'm grateful to you for your support uh, for sentencing reform. Uh, the, the bipartisan legislation that I'm working on with Senator Durbin uh, that he referenced a few minutes ago is, is important, and I, I, I appreciate your views on that as well. I want to speak with you briefly going back to uh, prosecutorial discretion. As a former prosecutor, I, I, I assume you'd agree with me that there are limits to prosecutorial discretion in the sense, at least, that it's intended to be an exception to the rule and, and not to swallow the rule itself. Would you agree with me that far? That Certainly, sir. I believe that in every instance, every prosecutor has to make the best determination of the problems presented in their own area, in my case, in my district, and set priorities, and within those priorities, exercise discretion. Right. And so prosecutors uh, inevitably have limited resources. And so it's understandable why they would choose when they've got to prioritize to perhaps put more resources um, into punishing, for example, bank robberies than they do uh, into punishing pickpocketers. And perhaps they might put more resources into going after pickpocketers than they do going after people who exceed the speed limit. Um, 
But at some point, there are limits to this, and that, that doesn't mean that it, it would be okay, that it would be a pros proper exercise of prosecutorial discretion to issue permits for people to speed, right? Certainly, sir. I think that if you, if a prosecutor were, were to come to the view that they had to prioritize one crime over another, you would always still want to retain the ability, even if there was an area that was not an immediate priority, if, for example, it became one because a particular neighborhood was being victimized, or, again, to use your issue of speeding, there were deaths resulting from that, you would want to have the ability to still, if you could, take resources and focus on that issue. It and might not be the first priority, but you would want to have the ability to go back and deal with that issue. And for that reason, prosecutorial authorities or law enforcement authorities typically don't go out and say, um, we're only going to punish you for a civil violation involving a traffic offense if you speed and then it results in, in an accident with injuries. Um, they, they leave open the very real possibility, indeed the likelihood, that someone can and will be um, uh, brought to justice in one way or another for any civil violation they, they commit while speeding. Well, certainly I can't speak to all law enforcement agencies. I know that depending upon the agency, sometimes the priorities are known, sometimes they're expressed. Um, every office has guidelines. Certainly the law enforcement agencies are aware of certain guidelines in terms of, for example, a dollar amount involving but certain types of crimes. If someone went out and said, I'm going to issue a, a permit to someone saying that they may speed, saying they may go up to 100 miles an hour without receiving a ticket, that would, uh, unless that person were also in charge of making the law in that jurisdiction, that would be a usurpation of the system by which our laws are made. Would you agree with that? Again, without knowing more about it, I, I'm not able to respond to the hypothetical. It certainly doesn't sound like something that a law enforcement officer would be engaged in. Uh, but again, without knowing more of, of the facts that I'm, I'm not able to really respond to your hypothetical. Okay, thank you. Um, let's shift gears for a minute. Um, do you agree that uh, citizens and groups of citizens uh, should not be targeted by government, uh, should not be the recipients of um, adverse action by the government based on their exercise of their First Amendment rights? Certainly, I think that the First Amendment is one of the cornerstones of a free society. Um, and I believe that our jurisprudence has set forth great protections for individuals as well as groups um, in, the, in the exercise of their First Amendment rights to make sure that they are protected and not targeted. I also would say that um, certainly uh, as, as, a, as a career prosecutor and U.S. attorney, there is really no place for bias or personal view in terms of how we approach um, the types of crimes that we pursue. And presumably you'd say the same with respect to someone's exercise of their rights under the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment or the Sixth or the Seventh or the Eighth. Uh, under any of those protections, somebody shouldn't be punished by government for exercising their rights under those provisions of the Constitution. Certainly I believe that there are safeguards in place to prevent that. I think we always certainly have to balance that with, with, some, with the possibility of an extreme situation in which um, you know, we may have to move quickly, for example, to protect someone or there's an imminent threat therein. But I believe that there are protections set up for that very purpose. Second Amendment rights as well, presumably, then, right? I believe that certainly the Supreme Court has set forth um, clarity on this issue, and so therefore that regardless of the amendment, that, um, that certainly that is a protected right. Are, are you aware that there's a, a, a program called Operation Choke Point within the Department of Justice? And that um, uh, through this program, the Department of Justice and uh, some other federal law enforcement agencies have on some occasions put financial pressure on legal businesses, including uh, hardworking Americans who happen to be involved in the business of selling firearms and ammunition, uh, by essentially telling banks not to do business with them. I'm, I'm generally familiar with the, the name Operation Choke Point, and my understanding of it with respect to uh, the Department of Justice current work, again, I haven't been involved in either the, the, uh, the implementation or the creation of it, but my general understanding of it is that it looks to, to target financial institutions that are involved in perpetrating frauds upon consumers. Um, and where there might be a financial institution that is facilitating, for example, consumer bank accounts being looted or consumers um, essentially losing their bank accounts, that that's the target of that. Again, I'm not familiar enough with the specifics of it to know 
about the underlying businesses that the transaction might have, initi might have originated from, uh, but that's my understanding of the program. Okay. I, I assume it's safe to assume that uh, should you be confirmed, you'll work with me to make sure that legitimate law-abiding Americans aren't targeted for their exercise of their Second Amendment rights. Uh, on that and any other issue of importance to you, Senator, I look forward to hearing your concerns and working with you on them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about civil forfeiture uh, uh, for a minute. Do you think it's, it's fundamentally just and fair uh, for the government to be able to seize property from a citizen uh, without having to prove that the citizen was guilty of any crime and, and, and based solely on a showing that there was probable cause to believe that that property was in some way used in connection with a crime? Senator, I believe that civil forfeiture, civil and criminal forfeiture, are very important tools of the Department of Justice as well as our state and local counterparts through, through state laws in essentially uh, managing or, or taking care of the first order of business, which is to take the profit out of criminal activity. With respect to civil forfeiture, certainly as implemented by the Department, um, it is done pursuant to uh, supervision by a court. It's done pursuant to court order, and I believe that the protections are there. What I will also, I'm but, sorry. What if you just ask the average person on the, on the street whether they thought the government could or should be able to do that? Uh, should the government be able to take your property absent of showing that you did anything wrong? Um, uh, 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 thereafter requiring you as a condition for getting your property back, whether it's a bank account that's been seized um, uh, or frozen, whether it's a, a vehicle that's been seized, uh, that you would have to go back and prove your innocence. So you're, you're guilty, uh, in essence, until proven innocent, at least guilty in the sense that your property's gone. You think your average citizen would be comfortable with that? Well, I certainly can't speak in terms of what the average citizen would or would not be aware of there. I certainly understand that there has been a lot of discussion and concern over, uh, over asset forfeiture as a program as expressed by a number of people. And particularly at the state level, such that some states have adopted uh, in response to a pretty widespread citizen outcry, uh, laws uh, significantly strict restricting the use of uh, civil forfeiture proceedings for that very reason. Um, which, which leads to why I raise this with you. It's my understanding that the Department of Justice has, in many instances, uh, been used as a conduit through which law enforcement officials at the state and local level can circumvent state laws restricting the use of civil forfeiture within the state court system. In other words, where under the state court's uh, state law established system, that kind of forfeiture is, is prohibited. Uh, people can go through, through the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice will take out a fee, maybe 20 percent of the value of the assets seized, and then those can be returned. It's a process known as adoption. Um, uh, don't you think most Americans would find that concerning if the federal government is facilitating uh, efforts to circumvent state laws that are designed to prohibit the very thing that they're doing? I think that um, a number of people would have questions about how the Department of Justice manages its asset forfeiture program, and my understanding is that those questions have been raised about various aspects of it. My understanding is that the Department is undertaking a review of its asset forfeiture program. And certainly, as U.S. Attorney, uh, I'm aware of the fact that the adoption program that you have just described, uh, which did raise significant concerns from a number of parties, has actually been discontinued by the Department. That's the guidance that we have recently received, with some exceptions for things like items of danger, explosives, and the like. Um, but it is part of an ongoing review of the asset forfeiture program. And certainly, should I be confirmed, I look forward to continuing that review. I would also say, Senator, that I look forward to continuing discuss these discussions with you as you express concerns and interests on behalf of constituents or others as an important part of the department being as transparent as possible in explaining how it operates. Asset forfeiture is a wonderful tool. We return money to victims. We take the profit out of crime. But as with everything that we do, we want to make sure that we're being as responsive as possible to the people that we are serving. Uh, thank you. I look forward to those additional discussions. And I see my time's expired. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Lee and Senator Well, thank you very much. And <clears throat> thank you so much uh, to you. I understand I'm the only thing that stands between you and your lunch, and this entire room and their lunch. So we will have a good 10 minutes here. Your dad seemed to enjoy that, this lunch. <laughs> um, 
I, I think everyone knows you have an impressive resume. And the one thing uh, that uh, has not been brought up was something I actually read this weekend in the profile about you. Um, as I was thinking about this old saying we have in our household that the obstacles on life's path are not just obstacles, they are the path. And no one represents that better than you, Loretta Lynch. Uh, when I read about the story of you scoring so well on a test in elementary school that they didn't believe uh, that you'd taken that test and then you took it again and scored even higher. <laughs> the obstacles are the path. Or the time uh, that you became the valedictorian of your class and the school officials said that it would be too controversial uh, if you were the only valedictorian. And so they added some other students to be valedictorian. I was thinking of all the senators in this building. We may have more than a few valedictorians and I don't think that ever happened to them. Uh, so I thank you for your courage and your perseverance and your parents' courage and perseverance that brought you to us today. Um, I was going to start uh, with a question. I know you touched on it with Senator Schumer. As you know, I'm a former prosecutor. Uh, my office, and we had about 400 people. We worked really well with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, some of the U.S. Attorneys you know that I worked with, um, uh, Todd Jones, uh, who's now the head of our uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, um, and then also uh, Tom Heffelfinger. Uh, who was the uh, U.S. attorney under Bush. Uh, now we have a guy named Andy Luger, uh, who you're also aware of. And it's been very important, that relationship uh, that we've had with local prosecutors and the U.S. attorney's office. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit more about how you would view that as the attorney general in terms of how you would like your U.S. attorneys to work with the local prosecutors. You know, can be very inundated with a lot of cases. And sure. sometimes we would view the U.S. attorney's office as getting the luxury to spend a lot of time on cases while we would be handling literally tens of thousands thousands of cases coming in our doors. Well, thank you, Senator. Um, you touch upon an important part of my practice. Um, one of the benefits of being the U.S. Attorney, as you've noted, is getting to know the other prosecutors, not just my fellow U.S. Attorneys, but also the numerous state and local prosecutors with whom we work so well. I'm, I am so privileged uh, in Brooklyn to have a strong relationship with the district attorneys in my district in all five counties, but also even outside of my district into Manhattan, into the Bronx, and beyond. Um, we talk often on issues affecting our community. We talk often on issues affecting the entire district. I was privileged to be able to share uh, starting my prescription drug initiative with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and also work closely with district attorneys in Nassau and Suffolk County in handling the problem of prescription drug abuse, which has spiked, unfortunately, and led to violence and, in fact, death. I think you know that the, the stats lately are that four out of five of uh, heroin uh, users started with prescription drugs and then they turned to heroin. I think people are shocked by that, but you see that connection with the heroin as well. We do indeed because of the opioid uh, mm -hmm. substance of both drugs. And we are in fact seeing a resurgence in heroin, not just in my district, but unfortunately across the country. This problem, like so many others, is one that must be dealt with in a cooperative and collaborative manner. And I am incredibly proud to say that all of my United States Attorney's colleagues take very seriously the opportunity and, and the privilege to work with our state and local counterparts in crafting prescription drug initiatives, heroin initiatives, along with our violent crime initiatives. We work closely with our state and local counterparts to determine where is the best place for a case to be brought. We look at things like the type of sentence that can be achieved or the type of evidence that is admissible in the different proceedings. And we cannot have those discussions without building on the, a positive working relationship. And it has really been a hallmark of this U.S. attorney community. Okay. Should I be confirmed as attorney general, I intend to draw upon that strength of my U.S. attorney colleagues as well as all of my state and local counterparts throughout the country. People who are at the ground zero of these problems often come up with the best solutions. They pull in the healthcare community. They pull in parents. They pull in community leaders. And they come up with a solution that works that can often be replicated in other places. I've seen that happen in my, with my U.S. Attorney colleagues, particularly in the area of heroin abuse um, and some of the initiatives that they are working on as well. So if confirmed as Attorney General, I intend to rely very heavily on my, my prosecutorial colleagues. Well, thank you very much for that answer. And at some point, I think we've talked about this before, but Senator Cornyn and I did the uh, drug take back 
bill, and we finally gotten the rules out from DEA on that, and we want to would look forward to working with you on that. Uh, something else, I, would, I think I'll talk to you later about your work in Rwanda, but uh, the fact that you've done some very important international work as well, but you've also done prosecution of international terrorists here at home. Um, and what lessons have you taken from those cases? I'll tell you why this is important uh, from a home state perspective. As you know, we have uh, our U.S. Attorney's Office in Minnesota indicted and successfully prosecuted a number of al-Shabaab uh, members uh, who had gone over to Somalia. We also had the first person killed in Syria uh, fighting with ISIS uh, was actually a Minnesotan. And our U.S. Attorney recently um, issued some indictments against others that have been recruited uh, to fight over in Syria. Uh, there's a pilot program that the Justice Department has involving three cities, L.A., Boston, and Minneapolis-St. Paul. Uh, there's going to be an extremism conference coming up, but could you, uh, one, talk about your experience with these kind of cases, and two, um, how you think that this pilot program should be funded? We're concerned because it's coming out of general funds, and if you would support some kind of specific funding for the program. Thank you. Certainly, just, just, just talking um, initially on the subject of combating violent extremism, um, one, of the, one of the most difficult things to see are young men uh, and increasingly young women um, many of them American citizens who are turning to this radical brand of terror um, and being recruited to go overseas and become trained and are being sent back uh, to perpetrate threats against the homeland. And the, the sources of this and the reasons for this are debated endlessly, and I think we need further discussion about that. But we must take steps to combat this. We must take steps to understand the level of disaffection that these individuals are feeling with their current uh, society, um, and also help them and their families understand the risks that they are facing. Um, some of the most difficult conversations I have had have been when I have visited um, the mosques in, in, in my district and had, frankly, wonderful interaction with the participants there and wonderful interaction with the residents there. But we've talked about violent extremism, and I've talked to parents who have said to me, you know, I just don't understand why the government is targeting my youth. And we've had very frank discussions about how it's difficult for any parent to know what their children are seeing on the Internet and how they are responding to what is being put forth on the Internet and the harm that it does, not just to our society, but also to those families, because they lose their children. They absolutely lose them when they are sucked up by this radical extremism and only to come back uh, to be dealt with, as they will, um, by American justice. Uh, certainly with respect to the number of, to the types of cases that my office have seen, we have seen individuals who started off um, as, as relatively peaceful individuals from what we could tell, but were brought, were dragged into radical extremism, did travel overseas, were recruited to then return to the U.S. and set and perpetrate attacks there. Um, we've seen that on more than one occasion. Okay. And the funding, if, if you're aware of the pilot program that we have going in the Twin Cities? Yes, yes, a very important program, given the nature of, uh, of the problems that have emanated from that community and how it, the devastation that it, is, that it is essentially wrought within those families and within that community. I think those issues are very, very important. Certainly, I look forward to working with you on finding the most effective way to fund those programs because they have a lot to, to teach mm -hmm. all of us who are working in this issue. Thank you. And the last thing I'm going to ask about is uh, sex trafficking. And I know you've done an impressive job are prioritizing the investigation and the prosecution of trafficking cases. Uh, this is something uh, Senator Cornyn and I, again, uh, have a bill on uh, sex trafficking, which called the Safe Harbor Bill, which is supported by a lot of the groups, which creates incentives for states uh, to enact laws uh, which treat the victims of sex trafficking, the children, as true uh, victims um, and not as perpetrators themselves. We think we can build better cases that way so people will come and testify against those that are running the sex rings. Uh, could you talk about uh, the, your work in this area and how you view these safe harbor laws? Certainly, I think these safe harbor laws are an essential next step in helping the victims of this horrible scourge. Uh, my office has been privileged to lead the, Kate, lead the way in prosecuting numerous individuals who have essentially um, tricked women um, through lies, deceit, also coercion and duress, even rape, 
uh, before they are brought to this country and forced to work here as sexual slaves. It is a tremendously degrading process to these women um, and one in which they find it difficult to escape because of either a language barrier or the fact that, sadly, often their children are being held in their home country to force them to behave and to force them to continue this activity. Mm -hmm. And certainly some of the work I am most proud of has been the efforts my office has undertaken with a number of the organizations that help victims of human trafficking and also with other governments to reunite these children with their mothers after the cases are over. Thank you, and I also look forward to working with you. We also have a number of domestic victims that I think 80% of the victims actually are from the U.S. as well. Absolutely. Especially when you get to the oil patch of North Dakota and those kinds of places where the U.S. Attorney's Office has played a major role. So thank you very much. Thank you for your grace under pressure today, <laughs> and I hope the Chairman will let you get some lunch. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Senator. It's going okay for you, Ms. Yes, Lynch. and thank you for inquiring, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, we will uh, now adjourn till 1.35. <clears throat>
want to do is maintain this 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 uh, this show. Good. Let's ask. Let's ask the Capitol Police. Let's ask. Good. Let's go ask specifically for Sergeant. Lee.
Welcome back, Ms. Lynch. Ho hope you're ready to continue. Thank you, Senator. Okay, and uh, according to the seniority arrangements that we're doing, Senator Cruz of Texas is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Ms. Lynch. Good afternoon, Senator. And congratulations on your nomination. Congratulations to your family, who I know are justifiably proud of you uh, for being nominated to this. Thank point. you, sir. Uh, you know, I'll note a number of my friends and colleagues who practice law in New York uh, have reached out to me with, with words of praise for you, uh, describing your tenure as U.S. Attorney there as that of a no-nonsense prosecutor uh, and as a U.S. attorney who honored and respected the law. And, and so for that, I congratulate you. You began your remarks by describing how, with new attorneys in your office, you remind them that they take an oath, not to the Attorney General, but to the Constitution. That same thing is true for the Attorney General of the United States. And I have long expressed my very deep concerns with the conduct of the current Attorney General, Eric Holder. The Attorney General has a long and distinguished history, a bipartisan history, of being willing to stand up to the presidents who appointed them. Attorneys general in both parties have demonstrated fidelity to law and to the Constitution, even when it meant telling the president of their own party no. Now, that is never easy to do. But part of what's made the Department of Justice special is that attorneys general, both Democrat and Republican, have honored that commitment, as you noted to your young lawyers, to the Constitution, not to the president who has appointed me. My single greatest concern with the tenure of Attorney General Eric Holder is that I do not believe he has upheld that tradition. I believe the Department of Justice has behaved more like a partisan operation for the President than an impartial law enforcement agency. And so I want to ask you at the outset the simple question of, if confirmed, how would your tenure as Attorney General differ from that of Eric Holder's? Well, Senator, I think you have um, raised an important issue of the role of the Attorney General. <clears throat> As we've discussed, it is an incredibly important cabinet member, but, it is, but the Attorney General is a cabinet member unlike other cabinet members in that the obligation of the Attorney General is first and foremost to represent the American people, uh, to protect and defend the Constitution, and to faithfully execute the laws as passed by this body. In interacting with the White House or any agency, if confirmed as Attorney General, I would do so in the manner in which I've conducted myself as United States Attorney, with a full and fair evaluation of every matter brought before me, with a full and fair review of all of the relevant laws, with discussion with career prosecutors, as well as even the most junior people, whom I have found to ha often have the best insight into matters. Uh, and only then will I make a determination as to the step to be taken. Going forward, every Attorney General creates their own path. You've asked how I will be different from Eric Holder. I will be Loretta Lynch. I will be the person that I've always been as I've led my office through two terms as United States Attorney, focusing solely on the protection of the people of my district, and if confirmed as Attorney General, on the protection of all of the American people. One thing I do wish to say, Senator, is that with respect to the issues that you raise, I greatly appreciate your sharing them with me, both now and during the discussion that we had in your office. Um, I look forward to more discussions with you and your colleagues, and I want to all pledge to you now that I will always listen to your concerns. I will consult with this body where appropriate, because there's a great collective wisdom here and experience, both prosecutorial and legal, and I look forward to having a dialogue with you and, frankly, crafting a positive relationship, not just with this committee, but with Congress. Well, Ms. Lynch, I thank you for that. That commitment is, is welcome and, and would mark a sharped, sharp break from the practices of the current Department of Justice. One of the frustrations of a number of members of this committee is that the Department has not been responsive to this committee's request. And indeed, uh, that had, it, were that to change, that would be highly welcome. Let me focus on 
one, and if time allows, two specific areas where I believe the Department has gone with partisan politics instead of upholding the law. And let's start with immigration, which has been a topic of much discussion already. Thank you. You mentioned in your opening statement that you had now taken the opportunity to review carefully the OLC opinion on the President's executive amnesty. Do you agree with the illegal analysis in the OLC opinion? Senator, I have had occasion to review the OLC opinion that dealt with the Department of Homeland Security's request for a legal framework in how to prioritize removal of certain undocumented immigrants, or really all the undocumented immigrants, under their jurisdiction. Um, I did not see a grant of amnesty there or a pathway to citizenship. Certainly, as I reviewed the opinion, uh, as well as the letters from some scholars who, who wrote in support of it, it seemed to be a way to look for the legal framework based upon case law, precedent, prior action of Congress, um, as well as the discretionary authority of the Department of Homeland Security to prioritize this removal, and certainly placing those most dangerous of the undocumented immigrants at the top of that list seemed to me to be a very reasonable exercise. M M certainly, I, I would want to hope, I would hope that the protection of those communities where undocumented immigrants involved in, for example, violent crime, gang activity, terrorism, would be at the top of the list. Ms. Lynch, you said now and before in your opening statement that you found the legal analysis reasonable. Uh, OLC operates in the place of the Attorney General of the United States, and an OLC opinion operates as the legal judgment of the Attorney General as the chief legal officer for the United States. And so my question is quite simply, do you agree with the legal analysis in that memorandum? Would it have been your legal analysis had you been asked the same question? Well, Senator, I certainly am not able to say at this point what my, if my legal analysis would have taken the same pathway and the same steps because I have not reviewed all of the cases and reviewed all of the memorandum that I'm sure went into that. Um, but what I can say is that, again, as the opinion seeks to talk about the exercise of executive discretion, it seemed to be looking at precedent, actions of Congress, as well as the immigration laws to see if there was a legal framework for the requested actions. And what I noted was that for some of the actions, the Office of Legal Counsel found that there was a legal framework for some of the actions that the Department of Homeland Security wanted to set in place, uh, but, but, but for some of the requested actions, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel found that there was not the appropriate legal framework for some of those actions and instead, in my understanding, is advised the uh, Department of Homeland Security that they, they should not proceed along certain, uh, certain ways. And my understanding is that that advice was taken. So I do believe that the Office of Legal Counsel has the important obligation to look at the law, look at the facts, look at the action that is being brought before it and say where there is an appropriate legal framework as well as where there is not an appropriate legal framework. Uh, but, but Ms. Lynch, I, I would note that I've twice asked you if you agree with the analysis and, and you are a very talented no lawyer and so uh, I, I suspect it is not an accident that twice you have not answered that question. You, you have described what OLC did but have not given a simple answer. Do you agree with that analysis or not? Senator, I've told you that I did find the analysis to be reasonable. I did find it to recognize the issues, and it did seem to provide a reasonable basis. Well, in 2011, before the last election, President Obama said, quote, with respect to the notion that I can just suspend deportations through executive order, that's just not the case, because there are laws in the books that Congress has passed. Now, do you agree with what President Obama said in 2011? Senator, I don't know what um, uh, legal opinion he was relying on at the time. Certainly the subsequent legal opinion um, talks about the temporary deferral of deportation uh, in a way that does provide a legal framework for it. But I don't know if the President was speaking of this exact same issue or not. I simply couldn't provide a legal opinion about the President's comments at this time. Now, the executive action, in my view, the, the OLC opinion has no legal basis whatsoever. It hinges upon the notion of prosecutorial discretion, and you rightly described how any prosecutor will prioritize some cases over others, for example, focusing on more violent criminals. In your office as U.S. Attorney, you certainly exercise prosecutorial discretion. Was it your practice for any, any category of crimes 
to suggest to those who may have violated the criminal laws that they can come into your office and seek a written authorization exonerating them of their past crimes and authorizing them to continue carrying out crimes for a large categorical group of offenders. Senator, we would not have that type of direct dealing with offenders. They would come to our attention as part of an investigation or part of an issue where they would already be under um, suspicion of some sort of wrongdoing. So we would, not in, we would not have that type of discussion with someone who might be represented or might have other rights. Uh, we would not have that type of discussion with someone. So that's not anything you ever did? Yeah. No. We do have priorities within my office. We do have guidelines within my office. Those are shared with our law enforcement colleagues. We also share them with many of our state and local colleagues as we, dis as we discuss where to best place certain types of cases. Senator, Th thank you very much, and, and we will continue thank uh, you, later Senator on. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Uh, Senator Franken now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations on being the chairman. Thank you. I'm glad to be chairman. Uh, I can yeah, tell you that. I know, I, I know, I know you are. <laughs> Ms. Lynch, uh, uh, congratulations on your nomination. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it was you very, uh, it was great meeting with you. Uh, your reputation for uh, smart and tough uh, preceded you, and you didn't disappoint in our meeting, and thank you for the wide-ranging conversation. We, how was lunch? Excellent. Thank you, sir. Yeah. You enjoyed lunch? Yes, sir. Good. Um, I, I, wanted to, uh, I, I discussed a couple things, or a number of things, when, when you were in my office, and I want to bring them up again and talk about them. Uh, one is our, our, just our prison system. We have I'm sorry, uh, five... Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Our prison system. I want to talk about our yes. uh, prison system. Uh, we have... The United States has 5% uh, of the world's population, 25% of the prison population. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems is that we've used our criminal justice system as a substitute uh, for a well-functioning mental health system. And we have a lot of people in prison, uh, in jails in this country, who shouldn't be, probably shouldn't be there, and uh, who it's not serving anybody any purpose. Uh, we have uh, young people with, uh, and others with mental illness who are in solitary confinement and just makes their, their mental health uh, worse. Um, it, it, and so what I, what I want to do to address that is something called the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Act. It's a reauthorization of my OTCRA, which is uh, the Mentally Ill Offender Treatment and Rehabilitation mm -hmm. uh, Act, uh, which has been very bipartisan in the past, and this should be bipartisan. In fact, it is bipartisan. Uh, it's been carried by a Republican in the House. And I, I just uh, want to ask you for your support as we go forward in making sure that our criminal justice system isn't not just wasting money, but wasting lives, and that, um, that you will work together with me on that. Senator, I look forward to working together with you on that as well as other important issues. I think you've highlighted um, one of the most important developments in criminal justice research and literature has been the ongoing um, research that has been done into the root causes of so many, so much of our criminal activity, in particular where the mental, mentally ill are involved, we continue to learn more and more about how that illness impacts them as they make their way through the criminal justice system. And I look forward to taking advantage of that new knowledge with you and working with you on that and other important issues. Yeah, some of this involves, uh, I don't know if you've heard of crisis intervention training, but crisis inter intervention training is uh, teaching both police uh, on, the, on the ground and uh, corrections officials in prisons to recognize when they're seeing someone with a, with a mental health problem and uh, to deal with it in the correct way. Certainly, certainly, because I think the research has shown, and it's certainly anyone with experience uh, with a family member or friend um, who has a mental illness knows that sometimes conditions may manifest themselves in ways that appear to be disruptive, but are in fact a reflection of the illness. And so what, what, what I'll be doing with this is, is uh, doing uh, mental health courts, 
so that if a prosecutor and an arresting officer and uh, the defense attorney and the judge say, this person bel belongs in a mental health court and, not, and so that they can be treated and not go to prison where it's going to clog up the prison system and make this person's condition worse, then we'll do that. And also to do uh, veterans' courts, because we have so many veterans that are coming back with invisible wounds. Yes. And sometimes those invisible wounds will be medicated uh, by drugs or by alcohol. And instead of going to to prison, maybe it's time to go. Uh, we, we can go to a veterans' court. Certainly, Senator, I know that some of my U.S. Attorney colleagues have been instrumental in working on the concept of veterans courts in particular as part of the Department's strong commitment to protecting the, all of the rights of veterans. You are so correct. Uh, we ask so much of our men and women in uniform, and they come back to us often different from how they left, with wounds that we can see and wounds that we often cannot see. And I believe we have an obligation to provide them the best treatment to thank them for their service to our country. Fabulous. I look forward to working with you that, should you uh, be confirmed, which I, I, I hope you will. Um, uh, let me get move on to something kind of specific. Uh, I, I um, was chair and now will be ranking member of the uh, Privacy Technology and the Law Subcommittee. And uh, there is a lot of technology out there that's new that we're, we're learning about some um, unforeseen consequences of it. There's a thing called stalking apps. I don't know if you know about it. Yeah, we, we discussed this. And uh, incredible, uh, when I f first did location privacy uh, subcommittee hearing, my first hearing, I got some testimony from the Minnesota Coalition uh, for Battered Women. And they told us a story about a woman uh, who had an abusive uh, partner and she went to a, uh, a county building in, uh, uh, it was in St. Louis County in northern Minnesota. And while she was there, on her phone, she got a text from her abuser, why are you in the county building? Are you going to the domestic violence place? Well, it scared her so much they took her to the courthouse to get a, a, to file a, a, an order against them. While she's there, she gets it from him saying, why are you at the courthouse? Are you getting a restraining order against me? It's terrified her. And it turns out, we've had testimony on this, this is very common. Now, you, DOJ does have the authority under existing wiretap laws to prosecute creator of apps uh, that allow stalkers to listen to their victims' phone calls, intercept text messages, or otherwise intercept content from victims' phones. And DOJ has prosecuted one app developer who uh, create an app to do this thing, and I'd ask that you continue to do that. But looking ahead, uh, would you work with me? I have a bill to stop these things, to stop uh, the uh, marketing, the, the mar manufacturer of, of stalking apps. So, and also would ask the DOJ uh, keep data on this, because the last real data we have on this is like from 2006 when I don't know how much you keep up with technology, but since then, a lot more people have these smartphones. And uh, this is a real problem. Senator, I think you've outlined a very important issue as it relates to the victims of domestic violence or anyone who fears that someone that they thought was close to them might turn on them instead. And certainly, I look forward to working with you and keeping you apprised not only of the department's efforts in the continued prosecution of these matters, but to look at the statute with you and provide whatever assistance we can. Thank you. Look forward to that as well. One last thing. I have about two minutes. Um, I am uh, very concerned about uh, the uh, telecommunications industry uh, consolidating. And I'm specifically concerned about Comcast's proposed acquisition of Time Warner Cable. This is the largest cable provider and the second largest uh, cable provider. It is the largest internet, broadband internet provider, and the third largest <laughs> broadband internet provider. To me, this is just too big. And they would have unprecedented power in the telecommunications industry. Um, I have there's been a lot of comment on this, including uh, m my comment on this to the, to the antitrust division. Um, will you 
commit to reviewing the serious concerns about the proposed uh, Comcast Time Warner deal uh, that I and so many others have raised and uh, just uh, do all that you can to ensure that the antitrust division is empowered to stand up to telecommunications giants like Comcast if that's what it deems necessary? Certainly, Senator. The antitrust division plays an extremely important role in keeping our markets competitive and open for everyone. And I look forward to learning more about this case, to reviewing those issues, and to working with you to make sure that all of the concerns about this are brought to our attention so that they can be dealt with by the antitrust division as we move forward. Okay, then I'll probably vote for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator from Minnesota. Now we go to Senator Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Lynch. Um, appreciated uh, hearing your life story and uh, seeing your family here, and appreciated the meeting we had in, our, in my office uh, a few months ago as well. Yes. Um, I, I brought something up there, and I'll bring it up uh, to you again uh, with regard to the border situation in Arizona. We have had, uh, obviously, ongoing problems uh, on the border. We share such a large border with Mexico. Um, but there have been some considerable successes. And one of the successes over the past several years has been in the so-called Yuma sector, uh, where we have seen apprehensions go from uh, about 140,000 in fiscal year 2005 to about 6,000 last year. Mm -hmm. And so considerable success. Um, that con contrasts with the Tucson sector, which has seen a drop, I think, because of the economy, we've seen a drop anyway, but not nearly as significant. In fact, there were about uh, 87,000 apprehensions in the Tucson sector. One of the things that I think just about everybody attributes uh, the success in the Yuma sector to is something called Operation Streamline. And it allows uh, the so-called consequences program uh, to be implemented where first-time crossers uh, are met with consequences. And uh, it has, it's, it's pointed to by certainly uh, law enforcement organizations uh, in, in Yuma and along that sector and, and just about everyone else recognizes it's been successful. Uh, the problem is just uh, last year it looks like DOJ has said that they're no longer going to implement uh, parts of that and that first-time offenders, unless there's some other circumstance, they will not be prosecuted. Um, what, uh, what are the specifics of this new policy, as you understand it, uh, with Operation Streamline? Certainly, uh, US, uh, Senator, I've had the opportunity to um, know somewhat about this matter from my discussions with my colleagues, the U.S. attorneys, not just along the Arizona border, but also in Texas and California. Um, and they, they work hard every day to keep our borders safe um, and essentially to protect the people in their districts, but also to deal with this, this ever-growing problem. Um, and I believe that, um, again, I'm not familiar with the current status of Operation Streamline, but as it, as it, as it relates to first-time prosecutions of individuals, individuals are still being prosecuted. Um, and to the extent that a first-time crosser would not be prosecuted, they still would be subject to just pure removal without there being a criminal case involved. Uh, and I believe that the issues in managing the program have had a great deal to do with resources, particularly with the budget constraints that offices have found themselves under in recent years. But I can assure you, Senator, that the commitment to protect the border is strong, not only among the U.S. attorneys who work on the border, but throughout the U.S. attorney community and the department, and would be one of my priorities also as Attorney General. As I mentioned, uh this is what distinguishes the Yuma sector from the others, is the success with this program. Um, if you're mentioning, if you're saying now that it's a budget issue, uh, why haven't we seen uh, concern about the budget or those budget aspects? Why hasn't DOJ come to Congress and said, we are having issues here? Um, and so uh, uh, in order to continue with this program, uh, we're going to need additional funding. To your knowledge, has that happened? I'm not aware of what's gone into the specifics of the department's budget. I'm generally aware of the budget as it relates to U.S. attorneys generally, but not the department as a whole, or as it relates to specific programs. So I'm not able to provide that information to you. I certainly, it is certainly something that I would be working closely on should I be confirmed as attorney general. 
I guess I'll put it this way, barring budget issues, is this a program that you're committed to or do you have other issues with it? Certainly it's a program that I think has been effective. Um, I think there, there have been concerns raised about resources um, and about the way the program has been managed uh, from the judiciary and others. We're always trying to be responsive to all of the parties involved in these. But with respect to the issue itself, I'm certainly committed to working on that issue with you and the members of this committee, be it through Operation Streamline, if it can be maintained, or in an, in an equally effective program. Okay. Well, for the record, uh, we've not, to my knowledge, received any concerns about uh, budget issues with regard to Operation Streamline. It seems to have been another decision that was made, and, uh, and I will be following up with you. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, let me just step back. I, I believe we need to do a lot with regard to immigration policy. I'm a sponsor of the comprehensive bill uh, that went through the Congress uh, last or two years ago through the House, or I'm sorry, through the Senate, didn't get quite through the House. Um, so this isn't all we need to do, but it's a significant part of what we need to do. And Arizonans have paid the price, uh, a disproportionate price for a long time for the federal government's uh, failure to have a secure border. And so when we have programs like this that work and we, we see uh, you know, success in, in one sector, and, and everybody can point to that, then it's very disturbing uh, when DOJ pulls back on that. And uh, we fear that, uh, that Yuma sector, as the economy kicks up again and crossings uh, are, are more frequent, that uh, we're going to have the same problems that we had a few years ago. And, and that just, uh, we can't go on with that. Uh, Secretary Johnson is in Arizona or just visited Arizona, visited the border. Uh, he's, he's done that a few times. Uh, met with the ranchers with some of their concerns, particularly in the Tucson sector. And uh, there's still a lot that needs to be done, and it's going to require a real partnership uh, w between a lot of people um, to make sure that it works. Um, switching gears, uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned uh, trade secrets uh, and uh, e economic espionage, um, but just to focus specifically on the theft of trade secrets. Uh, and foreign governments. Uh, last May, the Department of Justice announced indictments of five uh, Chinese military hackers for foreign theft of trade secrets and economic espionage, among other crimes. Uh, when announcing these charges, uh, Attorney General Holder said the administration will not tolerate actions by any nation that seeks to illegal sa illegally sabotage American companies and undermine the integrity of fair competition and free markets. Uh, this uh, case will serve as a wake-up call to the seriousness of ongoing cyber threat. He said, would you agree with Secretary Holder, I'm sorry, Attorney General Holder's statement as well as other statements by the executive branch uh, that this is a growing and persistent threat? Senator, I, I would agree with those statements and I would add that I have seen through cases in my own district that this is a growing and increasing threat. Uh, my office has also worked on matters involving foreign nations attempting to obtain technology under false pretenses. We've worked closely with our colleagues in other agencies to bring these cases uh, to fruition. I'm very proud of the work that we've done. And it is an ever-growing concern, certainly, and has also been expressed by the FBI, not only under the, the current director, but under former Director Mueller. Mm -hmm. um, so I look forward to working closely with our law enforcement partners and with this body to deal with the numerous ways that we have to fight this problem. Uh, last Congress, I introduced the Future of America Innovation and Research Act, or the FAIR Act, that provides companies with a legal remedy uh, to uh, when their trade secrets are stolen from abroad. Uh, the, 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 you know, the concern is that, uh, you know, since the Economic Espionage Act was enacted in 1996, I think there have only been 10 uh, convictions um, under Section 1831. That's, that's a, a lot of time for just a few convictions. Uh, since the FBI can't investigate and DOJ can't pr prosecute uh, every single theft of trade secrets, does it make sense uh, that there might be a, a you know, federal civil action uh, cause of action that could help these companies uh, through another remedy? Does that make any sense? Well, certainly, Senator, um, from my experience in advising companies, boards, and general counsel, I understand the importance of corporations being empowered to act on their own behalf and protect their intellectual property and their trade secrets. I haven't had the opportunity to study the bill that you discuss, but I certainly look forward to doing so and having further discussions with you. Well, I appreciate that. Um, victim uh, services, another area that uh, has been of some concern. Last year, Congress passed the uh, 
Victim of Child Abuse Recognition, or I'm sorry, Victim of Child Abuse Act reauthorization. And I was pleased that the sponsors of the bill agreed to include an important provision that clarified uh, Congress's intent that the, uh, the money from the Crime Victims Fund should only be used to assist victims of crime. Uh, will you commit to, to follow that new law and direct the uh, victim advocates in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Attorney's offices uh, that this money only be used for victims? Uh, in the past, we've seen it uh, used for witness travel, other administrative duties, and not actually focus on the victims. Certainly, um, the, the, um, the management of the issue of how to provide not only restitution but support to victims is an important one to the department and to me as a United States attorney. Um, and I think that we'd have to, to uh, work to implement the law that you have discussed. My understanding is that it is being implemented, certainly that guidance has gone out to ensure that the victim, uh, uh, victim advocates and offices are being appropriately focused. I know in my own office we have victim advocates who work closely with the victims of crimes, families who've suffered incredible loss and provide great support to them, and I fully support empowering those professionals. So yes, Senator, I believe that you, um, that the law that you mentioned is one that is being implemented. I certainly will commit uh, to ensuring that it is so. Okay. Thank you, and should you be confirmed, I look forward to working with you. Thank you, sir. Next person is Senator Blumenthal, and uh, uh, when Senator Coons comes back, obviously we skipped over him. I'll call on him as the next Democrat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for your courtesy and thoughtfulness in the way that you've conducted this hearing, and I'm proud to serve under you as chairman. Thank you. And uh, you thank you, uh, U.S. Attorney Lynch, for being here today and uh, also for having your family, uh, welcome to your husband, Stephen, and uh, your dad, Lorenzo. The two most common words, I think, that have been used to describe you are smart and tough. And uh, I can see from your dad, and I'm sure it's true of your mom, that uh, you come by those qualities honestly. Yes. <laughs> In the best sense of the word, sir. <laughs> Uh, and you should be very proud of your daughter. Uh, your testimony has been uh, among the most accomplished and impressive that I've seen as a member of this committee, and I'm sure you've done yourself a lot of good today. Not that you necessarily needed it, but uh, thank you for your very forthright and uh, erudite answers. I, I want to begin uh, uh, by uh, focusing on human trafficking. You have a great record on human trafficking. I count 10 major uh, prosecutions that you've done while United States Attorney, focusing particularly on targeted sex trafficking uh, while also pursuing labor trafficking. And uh, in a case that you brought against the 7-Eleven franchisees, you stated publicly that the defendants were running a modern-day plantation system, and the system looked a lot like modern-day slavery. Slavery, you brought the case relying on statutes relating to immigration enforcement and identity theft and wire fraud, not on the statutes that specifically focus on criminalizing human trafficking. I wonder whether you could uh, relate to us whether you think those statutes need to be strengthened if you couldn't, in a sense, rely on them to bring those cases based on human trafficking, whether we should perhaps strengthen them. And in particular, uh, uh, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 provided mandatory restitution for trafficking victims, a provision that is unfortunately more unenforced than enforced, in fact, rarely enforced, I think, to provide for restitution. Uh, a recent study by the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center uh, took a look at how this requirement works in practice, and they found that only about 36.6 percent of the cases uh, did prosecutors bother to request restitution. So my question is really twofold. Number one, do the statutes need to be strengthened, and number two, can you and would you do more to make sure that restitution is provided to the victims of human trafficking? Certainly, Senator. 
The issue of restitution for the victims of human trafficking is an important one, particularly as we do increase the number of cases that we bring. Certainly, sometimes there are situations where a court may not impose restitution because the, the funds are not there um, or for other legal reasons. But where, where we can, we always do seek a restitution order for the victims. We, in particular, have worked um, with other governments to us provide them information where we have found, for example, that certain small cities in Mexico have been a prime source of those who would traffic women into the United States, into the Eastern District of New York. We have worked with the Mexican government to provide them information so that they could possibly affect seizures that we could not uh, with, under our particular asset forfeiture laws. So it's a very, very important issue to me as United States Attorney, and should I be confirmed as Attorney General, would be one that I would look forward to working with you on to make sure that all of the laws involving victim protection are as strong as possible. With respect to the 7-Eleven case, we did not have the evidence that the workers had been moved across state lines to effectuate the crime, and so therefore we would not have been able to use the trafficking laws per se. Uh, but as with that case, with every case, we look at the, at the relevant facts and the laws and bring the strongest case that we can. And certainly where we have seen numerous, numerous incidences of children and, and women being trafficked from within the United States, um, sometimes even simply just crossing one state border, as well as from overseas, we've never hesitated to act. And should I become Attorney General, it will be one of my priorities. I would welcome that uh, priority very much as the co-chairman of the Human Trafficking Caucus in the Senate. It's a very bipartisan one. The co-chairman is Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, so I look forward to working with you on it. Let me ask you, uh, and, and first of all, welcome your comments about the invisible wounds of war. Uh, thank you to your uncles and cousins for their service in Vietnam, yes. and to your brother for his service as a Navy SEAL. I say that as a dad of a Marine Corps Reserve veteran who served in Afghanistan, and a, another son who is currently in the Navy. Uh, and I would hope that you will continue to focus on those issues relating to post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury as they may be a cause of certain kinds of conduct that may be unwelcome, may even be criminal, because what we found is that a better understanding of those invisible wounds of war and the inner demons that many of our veterans bring back with them can lead to more thoughtful and humane treatment through our criminal justice system. I want to uh, ask you, uh, finally, in the time that I have, about uh, one of the criticisms that has been made of the Department of Justice uh, in its allegedly too lenient treatment of certain, certain corporate defendants as being too big to jail, so to speak. Uh, in remarks that you made after the Department of Justice entered into a settlement with HSBC for money laundering, I'm sure you recall it, you s said that the settlement had deterred that company, uh, but you weren't sure that it would deter other companies. So my question is uh, whether more can be done to more aggressively prosecute mm. white collar crime, corporate crime, to dispel at least the widespread impression or perception that perhaps the Department of Justice has been too lenient. Uh, and in particular, uh, would you work with me on a bill that I've offered that would make certain corporate officers criminally liable if they are aware of significant, potentially deadly risks to workers, workplace safety problems, and fail to act? or make it public. So this bill is called uh, Hide No Harm. It's a bill that's designed to protect workers on their jobs, and it focuses on that part of the potential wrongdoing that may be committed by corporate officers. But also, again, a two-part question, would you uh, consider pursuing more aggressively criminal laws that may be applied to corporate officers who are involved in malfeasance or violations of federal criminal laws generally. 
Certainly, Senator. Um, when it comes to white-collar crime or any kind of crime, um, as a career prosecutor and as U.S. attorney, I've been very aggressive in pursuing those types of cases. With respect to um, should I become confirmed as attorney general, I would continue that and direct that the Department of Justice continue its focus on examining the facts of every case, following the law wherever it took us. At the outset, no individual is too big to jail, uh, and no one is above the law. Some, there are certain situations where we may come to a different resolution or may decide that a civil resolution is appropriate, but that is only after a full and fair analysis of all of the facts and the law and the relevant burdens under the criminal justice system or the civil system. But that being said, Senator, I believe if you look at the record of the Eastern District of New York, we have prosecuted a number of corporate officers uh, for, for insider trading with respect to the Brooks case and corporate malfeasance in other cases, as well as for violations of the FCPA. Um, we have struck significant, uh, wrung significant concessions from corporations and made major changes in the way in which corporations and financial institutions are structured and operate uh, that act as a deterrent. And we have been very clear with respect to the industries within which we are looking that um, should a corporation not engage in preventive behavior or should they not take seriously the type of investigation that we bring, that criminal charges will be brought. Thank you. And I know of your very aggressive and distinguished record in this area, and it's one of the reasons why I strongly support you and I look forward to voting for you and working with you on all of these topics and uh, also reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Yes. As you know, I've advocated a public advocate to defend and, and advocate constitutional liberties in the course of this secret proceeding, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to commit on that issue, but I hope that you will work with me on it as well as these other issues. And I very much uh, appreciate your being here today and your public service and your family service. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank thank you, you, Senator. Thank you, Senator <clears throat> Blumenthal. Now I go to Senator Bitter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam U.S. Attorney. Uh, and thank you for the meeting in my office. As I told you at the time, I was pretty disappointed and frustrated because you didn't respond directly to any of my big topics, and you said you'd look into these matters and, and consider them. And, and as I promised, I restated the big questions in writing, and, and I was further disappointed when yesterday I got a letter saying there would be no response to that. But, but maybe the third time is a charm for me asking them, so we'll try here. Um, as I told you in my office, like many, many citizens and members of the Senate, I have a huge concern regarding what I think is the President's illegal, unconstitutional executive amnesty. And I have a huge concern of the fact that um, you think it is within the law, and we were talking about that. So I'm going to put up what is um, the central statutory argument that the President's lawyers point to in terms of his allegedly having authority for this executive amnesty. Um, and it talks about uh, granting uh, parole only on a case-by-case -case basis. So I guess one of my key questions, which we talked about in my office, is do you really think his granting this uh, amnesty, this new status, to about 5 million illegal aliens is acting on a case-by-case -case basis as mandated by the statute. Senator, I, I greatly appreciate the question as well as the opportunity that we had to discuss the matters in your office. Uh, with respect, again, to my review of the opinion supporting the Department of Homeland Security's request for a legal basis for taking certain actions and prioritizing removal, as indicated, I did find it to be reasonable that we would prioritize removal of the most dangerous undocumented immigrants uh, with our limited resources, uh, particularly those who were involved in violent crime, terrorism, recent crossers, those with criminal records. That seemed to me to be acting in the interest of public safety and appropriate. With respect to other individuals who may not be as high on that priority list, 
Uh, my understanding is that that is a, a status that they will have for a brief period of time. Um, and certainly, as you look at the issue of executive discretion or prosecutorial discretion, you always want to have the ability to still look at individuals and make a determination as to whether or not um, they should be in that lower priority. And Ms. I didn't Lynch, see as we, as we talked about in my office, though, his action goes well beyond setting prosecutorial priorities, doesn't it? Apart from that, he goes further in granting this broad category of folks a certain status for three years at a time, and then he takes another affirmative step in giving them a work permit. So those two steps are going beyond setting priorities for prosecution, are they not? Well, certainly, Senator, as relates to how the Department of Homeland Security manages the removal process for those in the low priority um, category, however they may be determined to be, Again, I'm not aware of if, there, if those regulations have been set forth yet, so I can't comment on how they'll be implemented. Does but his plan go beyond setting priorities for prosecution or not? Does it, doesn't it, in fact, go beyond that by granting these folks a parole status and giving them a work permit? Isn't that something additional to simply setting internal priorities for prosecution of these cases? Well, Senator, just um, one minor point at the outset. I believe that the Department of Homeland Security's uh, um, action refers to removal and not necessarily prosecution. Certainly with respect to prosecution, there is still robust prosecution in, in, under the immigration laws. And in my own district, they are a tool that I use quite frequently. Um, with respect also to what would happen to those individuals who would be in a lower priority status, for lack of a better word. Again, I'm not sure how the department will go about implementing that. My understanding is that the issue was, was there a legal framework for establishing such a, a, uh, a program? And the opinion indicated that there was. Um, I Do you agree with that opinion? I believe individuals still have to apply, at which point there would have to be a review of their eligibility and the like. Fundamentally, do you agree with the legal opinion we're talking about? The I thought that the opinion was reasonable. Okay. I also thought that it made distinctions. Again, going back to that legal opinion, th this, put that back up, this is a key element of it. So do you think that action that's applying to about 5 million illegal aliens is operating on a case-by-case -case basis? Senator, again, I'm not familiar with how the Department of Homeland Security will be actually implementing the orders. That it will be uh, that it will be reviewing and the applications that it will be reviewing. So I'm not able to provide you with the specifics. But you've read the orders. Do you think that lays out a system that is operated on a case by case basis? With respect to my review of the legal office of legal counsel opinion, it did provide a reasonable basis both for the removal and for the prioritization of certain people as it came to removal. When it what? came to the issue of whether or not there could be a program. Uh, for deferral, it seemed to refer to legal precedent, to the statute itself, and to actions by this body, among others. So it certainly seemed to provide a legal framework for that. And I, I believe also what I thought was, was noteworthy was that with respect to the opinion, some of the requested actions by the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of Legal Counsel found did not have the appropriate legal framework that would have made them something that could be carried out. Um, under the current legal system, and so the, the advice was not to go forward with okay. certain Okay, well, I'll take it as a yes that this is operating on a case-by-case -case basis, and I, and I just think that's really a clear, obvious stretch to say that this action that's going to affect 5 million people is following the law on a case-by-case -case basis. The law also says, in fact, this same specific citation, it says, this decision on a case-by-case -case basis has to be made by the Attorney General. Now, is it your understanding under the President's plan that if you're the Attorney General, you're going to be in the middle of that process making those decisions? Well, Senator, I'm not aware of, of the, um, f uh, the regulatory framework and the rules that have come out around this statute as to how that authority is either delegated or exercised. So I'm not able to give you an exact answer right now as to well, how that would well, specifically be I've read the plan, and the plan as I read it is for all of that to be done in the Department of Homeland Security. So my question would be, what is the statutory basis to allow that when under the statute, not, not some order, not some 
legal opinion, the statute, the law, word by word, it says the Attorney General is in the middle of that decision on a case-by-case -case basis. So again, Senator, as, I re as, uh, as pre presented to me by you uh, today, and thank you for that information, again, I'm not familiar with the ways in which that particular authority has been exercised by the Attorney General, whether it has been delegated or how it is uh, shared with the Department of Homeland Security. So I'm not able to provide you with the specifics at this point as to how I would exercise that authority. Well, again, I'll, I'll have to be following up for the fourth time, but that'll be a central question. Um, the plan is not for the Attorney General to be in the middle of this at all. The statute says that the Attorney General is. Why aren't we following the statute? Let, let me go to another um, case that, that goes to following the law, uh, which Senator Hatch brought up earlier, uh, which is um, your comments regarding the Department of Justice's um, initiative, Smart on Crime initiative. Um, now, as I read it, and based on what I know, this is, is just a way to, to clearly ignore mandatory minimums. I mean, there are crimes that have mandatory minimums. We can have a good debate about whether those should be lowered in some cases or not, but they are what they are. They're in the statute. So why aren't we following the statute with regard to crimes with mandatory minimums? Well, Senator, with respect to the enforcement of the narcotics laws that contain those mandatory minimums, uh, laws which I have had occasion to use on numerous occasions as an assistant U.S. attorney, as a career prosecutor, and as U.S. attorney, um, those laws are being followed, not just by my office, but throughout the, the U.S. attorney community. The issue with Smart on Crime, as well as by a number of offices who have sought to prioritize how to handle those cases in an era of, in an era of limited resources, is focused on when is it best to use the mandatory minimums and when do we not necessarily have to use them. But every office still retains and, in fact, exercises the discretion to impose a mandatory minimum sentence should someone who may not on the face of the policy fall into that category, but upon review of the case clearly does. So and that what, has and is being done. When is it best to use the mandatory minimums? So the mandatory minimums aren't mandatory. When you get done with that answer, then I'll call on Senator Coons. Sure. Go ahead. Senator, with respect to the narcotics policy, certainly as we manage, as we handle these cases in the Eastern District of New York, we rely heavily on the mandatory minimum statutes when dealing with numerous drug kingpins that we have built significant trafficking cases against, many of whom have been extradited from foreign countries or have been operating within our district. My fellow U.S. attorneys use the mandatory minimum statutes in a similar way. We all look, however, at the nature of the crime problem in our district and the nature of the narcotics problem in particular in our district. And a case that may require a mandatory minimum in my district may not occur in another part of the country. The other, another part of the country may have a different type of narcotics problem and would have a different population of defendants than you would find in Brooklyn subject to the mandatory minimum statutes. But they are still being utilized, Senator. But Mr. Chairman, just in closing, I just observed that, I mean, that is taking all meaning out of the word mandatory. It's replacing your and your colleagues' judgment for the judgment of folks who wrote the law. And that's what this whole discussion and debate is about. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, for the witness, if we, if there's nobody here and you want to take a break, take a break. But Thank just as soon as somebody gets here, I hope you can come back right away. Uh, Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Ms. Lynch, congratulations on your historic nomination uh, and your very fine conduct in this hearing today. Um, the Attorney General of the United States, one of the most important offices uh, for which this committee has oversight responsibility and consent responsibility. And the current Attorney General, Eric Holder, has served in that office with distinction under very trying circumstances. Uh, for better or worse, the Attorney General often serves as a lightning rod uh, for those in this body with complaints about the administration. And I think it takes special mettle to deal with that kind of uh, constant incoming fire while remaining composed and focused on a constructive and forward-looking agenda. Uh, I'm interested in hearing from you about uh, how you plan to carry forward uh, 
progress on some of the issues that the Department of Justice faces with respect to privacy, uh, collaboration with state and local law enforcement, IP protection, uh, and important civil rights issues, such as sentencing reform, voting rights, and racial profiling. Uh, as successful as Attorney General Holder has been, uh, there remains important progress uh, to make in just two years in this administration to make it. Um, first, if I could, about state and local law enforcement. Uh, given uh, my previous experience, I'm, I'm thrilled that someone with your seasoned and senior experience in law enforcement has been nominated for this position. I serve as co-chair with Senator Roy Blunt of the Senate Law Enforcement Caucus, and the Department of Justice plays a central role uh, in supporting state and local law enforcement. Um, can you just comment for me, if confirmed, on the importance you would place on the partnership uh, between federal, state, and local law enforcement, uh, including such programs as uh, the Bulletproof S program, the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, um, the Violence Reduction Network, which is particularly important to me, uh, and information sharing. Um, and then second, Senator Flake asked about this previously, but um, could you just talk about the Victims of Child Abuse um, uh, Act programs um, and comment on what experiences you've had with child advocacy centers and how they function as one of the partnership um, undertakings between federal, state, and local law enforcement? Certainly, Senator. With respect to the important partnership between the Department of Justice and our state and local law enforcement counterparts, it will be one of my highest priorities to ensure that there is not only collaboration and cooperation, but active and ongoing discussion about the needs that we can help fulfill, but also, Senator, what we can learn from our state and local counterparts. It has been my experience, uh, having had the benefit of, frankly, learning from some of the best law enforcement agents and police officers uh, around, that no one knows the crime problem like the cop on the beat. No one really understands what's going on in a community like the officer who walks those streets every night and knows those residents and understands those issues. Similarly, our federal law enforcement agency partners have outstanding uh, background effort uh, and ability to manage complex cases. And when we combine those two, we have, a, a, we have been able to achieve tremendous results for victims of violent crime, of terrorism, of cybercrime, uh, along with the cases that you mentioned involving vulnerable victims of child abuse. So certainly I feel that there has to be a collaborative relationship, but I want to, to essentially assure you that in my view, it would be one where we would not just provide assistance and training and grants, that is very, very important, but we would also listen and learn as well from our local uh, law enforcement partners. Well, thank you. That's both a good answer and a, a great attitude, and I look forward to working with you on this area going forward. Um, the USA Patriot Act, uh, and in particular its Section 215 authority, uh, is often thought of uh, as a spying program, uh, which in some ways it essentially is. Uh, but it also uh, is and can be a tool um, that DOJ and FBI routinely use in the course of domestic law enforcement and its investigative missions. Um, does the DOJ use Section 215 as a bulk collection tool? And could the department continue to make effective use of Section 215 um, if the enhanced privacy protections, the limitations on bulk collection set forth in the USA Freedom Act were to be adopted? Well, Senator, Section 215, as I understand it, is not a, a bulk collection tool in and of itself, but a way in which the government, um, using court authority, can obtain information already gathered that might be useful in ongoing national security investigations. But certainly I understand that as we work to protect our country from terrorists who seek to attack us here and abroad, that we have to be mindful of our civil liberties and the privacy rights of anyone who may be impacted by our, our uh, collection procedures. And certainly I look forward to, as the renewal of Section 215 comes up, I look forward to discussions with you and the other members of this committee about the best way in which to keep that useful tool and also reassure this body and the American people that it is being used in the most effective way. Um, I'm also concerned about um, IP, intellectual property protections, as we talked about previously, and trade secret. Uh, my understanding is um, several other senators have also asked about this issue, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, I'm concerned about the huge transfer of wealth uh, going on through trade secret theft uh, and the federal crime under the Economic Espionage Act. Um, is estimated to be responsible for up to $500 billion annually uh, in terms of losses to the United States, yet there's only one or two cases a month uh, federally uh, brought by prosecutors. Um, as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District, uh, what's been your experience in investigating or prosecuting a trade secret theft, and would you be interested in working together uh, to strengthen the resources and strengthen the legal authorities uh, for protecting America and our inventions and innovations and ensuring that we stem the tide of loss through trade secret theft. 
Certainly, Senator, in my experience as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, I don't believe we have any specific indictments under the Trade Secrets Act. We do, however, have a number of cases um, where we have, in, we, we have intercepted uh, foreign actors trying to obtain U.S. information, and we have prosecuted them under other statutes. So we deal with very, very similar issues. I will note that these cases uh, tend to be complex and long-term. Uh, they do require an investment of resources, uh, the devotion of time on the part of prosecutors, but also technological resources on the part of our law enforcement agencies. So I would look forward to, should I be confirmed, working with you and this committee to ensure that we have the appropriate resources we need to handle these cases. Well, as a member of the Appropriations Subcommittee responsible, uh, I look forward to working with you on that. I think it's vital that we strengthen the protections for America's inventions and inventors. Let me last uh, ask about criminal justice reform, uh, an issue that I think uh, is front and center and, and important for our country and for our justice system. Uh, we've seen in a number of ways in the last year that our criminal justice system uh, is broken in terms of how it deals with um, mass incarceration uh, and its impact in particular uh, on um, drug offenders and on the African-American population of our country. Uh, it's not just um, a civil rights problem, but also a fiscal problem and a social problem. And uh, if you look at the numbers uh, of who's incarcerated and for how long and under what charges, uh, I think there is a significant inequality that uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, I think we need legislation um, through this committee and in this body that will help rationalize um, overly mandatory, overly long um, drug sentences for nonviolent offenders. Attorney General Holder took an important step forward two years ago when he issued revised guidance to the field directing the prosecutors not automatically charge the most serious mandatory minimum triggering levels of drug possession against low-level nonviolent offenders. Uh, I wondered whether you would, uh, whether it's your intention to keep in place Attorney General Holder's 2013 memorandum or whether you would look for other or additional ways uh, within the law, uh, within the Constitution, uh, to promote the equal and just application of our criminal laws to every person, regardless uh, of background, of sex, of gender, of sexual orientation, um, race, um, religion, or nationality. Senator, you touch on the important issue of making sure that our criminal justice system protects the American people, but does so in a way that's fair and effective, and also protects the individual rights of everyone who has to pass through it. It is the responsibility of a prosecutor not just to win convictions, but to bring justice to every case, no matter what the result. Certainly, with respect to smart on crime, I have found it similar to many ways in which my own district has had to manage an ever-increasing problem of narcotics prosecutions of low-level offenders uh, and, and work with an ever-growing docket of larger narcotics cases also. And I found it to be a reasonable approach to do so and look forward to continuing that particular initiative. But I also look forward to further discussions with you and your colleagues on these issues as to how we can ensure that our criminal justice system is effective and yet also protects the people who have to go through it. That is the dual responsibility of the prosecutor. It's one that I've taken seriously all of my professional career, and, I, and should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I look forward to working with you as we explore that issue together. Well, thank you, Ms. Lidge. As, as he said at the outset, uh, Senator Leahy, uh, remarked that nearly a third uh, of the department's uh, budget at this point is dedicated to the Bureau of Prisons. Um, I think we have a pressing um, civil rights uh, issue nationally for us in terms of our criminal justice system, uh, but I've also long been a supporter of law enforcement and believe that you are uniquely positioned, qualified, uh, and prepared to help us balance uh, these twin obligations of ensuring that our communities are safer and stronger and ensuring that our justice system delivers on justice. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. U.S. Attorney, this is uh, David Perdue. We met the other day. Yes. I'm a senator from Georgia. Yes, thank you um, for your time. I want to thank you for your perseverance and patience with us today. Um, I hope it wasn't anything I said that uh, <laughs> cleared the room for you. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> I hope it wasn't anything I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for, uh, again, your perseverance. Um, I just want to join my colleagues and welcome you um, before the Judiciary Committee. And also, thank you for your years of public service. As we talked the other day, I am very impressed with your career and want to thank you for upholding the law in your career. I congratulate, congratulate you on this nomination. <clears throat> you spoke about uh, this morning your oath and the required commitment to the Constitution. I applaud that. You've demonstrated that in your career. Um, 
You were just talking about uh, mandatory minimums, if I'm correct. I just have a quick question. <clears throat> um, relative to a case that you had uh, in your jurisdiction uh, recently, I want to ask about a defendant who was convicted by your office in the late 1990s. His name was uh, Francis, uh, Francois Holloway, I believe. <clears throat> I hope you remember him. There was a lot of press coverage on this case during your current tenure as U.S. Attorney. In 1995, Mr. Holloway rejected a 10-year plea uh, and was convicted after a trial on three counts <clears throat> of armed carjacking and possessing a gun during a violent crime. Those offenses subjected him to consecutive mandatory minimum sentences, and he received a total of, I think, 57 years. In 2013, Judge Gleason, the district judge in Brooklyn, who sentenced Mr. Holloway, began what the New York Times called a campaign on Mr. Holloway's behalf and wrote to you asking that you consent to an order vacating two of Mr. Holloway's convictions for armed carjacking. No one argued that Holloway was innocent or that, wrongful, that he was wrongfully convicted or that his sentence was unlawful. No one claimed that there was a problem with the trial. All of Mr. Holloway's appeals were rejected. The case event went to the Supreme Court, which upheld the convictions. In fact, everyone agreed that the sentence he received was lawful under Title 18 of the sentencing guidelines. Judge Gleason didn't agree with the sentence the law required him to impose and was asking you to help him do it. In February 2013, to your credit, you refused to vacate the carjacking convictions. You suggested to Judge Gleason that Mr. Holloway could contact the office of the pardon attorney and submit a petition for uh, commutation of his sentence. I personally think that that was the appropriate response. I congratulate you on that. I think every prosecutor would have responded that way. In May of 2014, however, Judge Gleason again urged you to vacate two of Mr. Holloway's armed carjacking convictions. He said your suggestion that Mr. Holloway seek clemency was not a realistic avenue of relief because the fact that Holloway committed crimes of violence will disqualify him. The judge was definitely a passionate advocate for this defendant. This time, however, you backed down. <clears throat> you consented to the judge's order to vacate the carjacking convictions. I want to note that he was a violent offender, along with an accomplice, stole three cars at a gunpoint. You know, as the top law enforcement officer, I have a couple questions relative to that case and your perspective uh, 10 years attorney general. Uh, my first question is, what, what caused you to change your, your earlier position in that case? Senator, with respect to the Holloway case, it was a matter that had been of longstanding, uh, it was a longstanding case from the office. It did predate my tenure, my first time as U.S. Attorney, my, my second time, but not my first time as U.S. Attorney, I should say. Um, and it was a case in which it was the defendant who had made a motion um, to, um, to, have to allow the judge to revisit his sentence. So there was, in fact, a judicial proceeding before the court at that time, and the court wanted us to take a second look at it. We did consider it numerous times. Um, ultimately, the matter was before the court, um, and while the judge indicated he would like to have the opportunity to review that, um, our view was that we had to look at the case consistent with many of the initiatives that were being put in place now by the Department of Justice, um, certainly with respect to clemency and with respect to how we look at offenders who have served a significant time and whether or not they would be eligible for that. Of note to me, um, as I reviewed the matter, was that Mr. Holloway was the second person in that carjacking uh, incident and, in fact, was not the individual with the gun, but was, of course, legally liable for that. And while he received the sentence of 57 years, the, um, sh shall we say, the main actor in that received a sentence shortly under two years. Um, so there was an incredible disparity in the sentence there. But the real issue for us was, was there a legal proceeding in place? And there was. Um, and essentially, if we, did we have the ability to let the judge review the sentence again uh, by keeping it in the court system? Um, and we felt that we did. But before we did that, it was important to me to consult with every victim in that case. Um, and certainly, we found all of the victims but one, after extensive research, all the victims who also felt that the judge should have the opportunity to reconsider Mr. Holloway's sentence without a guarantee of what that sentence would be. 
Um, based with, on that information, based upon Mr. Holloway's record in prison, uh, based upon his role in the offense, we looked at how we would have handled the case under current times. Um, and again, given that there was a court proceeding, uh, we were able to go to court and tell the judge that we would not stand in the way of him reviewing the sentence again, uh, which Judge Gleason did. Uh, Mr. Holloway was resentenced. Uh, he then went into state custody to finish a uh, matter, and so I do not know his current status. Um, but we did, we did essentially allow the judge to take another look at that, um, and through the judicial process, the judge imposed a different sentence. That sentence was still, sub still significant, and it was still, I would say, twice as long as what Mr. Holloway would have gotten had he accepted a plea deal. Thank you. You know, as, as the Attorney General, you don't have great discretion, just as you did as a district attorney. The question I would have is illustrated by that case, I think, is, you know, where do you draw the line? How do you see this balance between the law and your personal uh, position in a case, your personal opinion in a case? Senator, I don't believe that my personal opinion is the, is the governing factor in a case, uh, be it Mr. Holloway's case or be it any case in which I would review, either as U.S. Attorney now or should I be confirmed as Attorney General. I will take, take a look at every case, and I will commit to you that I will review every matter brought to me with a full and fair examination of the facts and an application of the law, but also with a view towards, as with, in Mr. Holloway's case, um, whether or not there is a judicial proceeding there and the current status of that. But we will, we will uh, take every effort, and I will make every effort, should I be confirmed, to always act consistent with the law. Thank you. There are just one last question on this in this vein. Um, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of, of violent offenders in our federal custody who are serving sentences based on consecutive mandatory minimums that you just spoke about, like those imposed in Mr. Holloway. If you're confirmed and during your tenure as Attorney General, it comes to your attention there are cases like Mr. Holloway's, would you consent to early release of those offenders? Senator, it would not be my place to consent to an early release, nor was it our place in the Eastern District of New York in the Holloway case. Our posture was to consent to allow the judge to revisit the sentence and impose the sentence that as a judicial officer he, he felt appropriate. So as U.S. Attorney, I would not be making the decisions as to what, whether someone should literally be released. Should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I would not be making those decisions either, except as people go through the clemency process or the pardon office, and those matters come under review by the Department of Justice. We would then apply our best judgment to the situation, but ultimately the, uh, the ultimate decision on release would not be made, I believe, by me. Well, since uh, I'm the only one up here, I guess I'm the presiding officer, and uh, <laughs> uh, my time is almost up, but I have just one, one other question for you. I'd like to move on to national security, if I might. And, uh, We'll remind the chairman that I didn't go over on my allotted time, just in case. <laughs> we'll, um, the DOJ announced last week that uh, two Yemeni nationals charged with conspiring to murder American citizens abroad and providing material support to Al Qaeda will be prosecuted by your office in the Eastern District of New York. I'd like to ask you about your views on transferring terrorists to U.S. soil who have been captured abroad. Terrorists have been tried successfully in civilian courts before. But I'd like to know your opinion about what role you think military tribunals play in handling terrorism cases. Is there any role for military tribunals, or should civilian courts be used exclusively for these prosecutions, in your opinion? Senator, thank you for that question. Um, the, the case that you mentioned is being handled by my office. And at the outset, I would note that throughout the process of reviewing that case and deciding how to best prosecuted and where to, where to appropriately venue it, we consulted extensively with the Office of Military Commissions, as we do with all of the cases involving national security defendants who may be brought to U.S. shores and may be, may be brought to the Eastern District of New York. Certainly, I would say at the outset that my position is, if terrorists threaten Americans here or abroad, they will face American justice. We have done that successfully in the Eastern District of New York. And I look forward, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, to continuing that strong practice, utilizing all of the tools in our arsenal, and that includes the military commission process. Essentially, uh, Senator, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I look forward to working with the military and the other executive branch um, uh, divisions in government to make the best determination about where each case should be brought. Should that determination be an Article III court, 
I anticipate that the, that the receiving U.S. Attorney's Office would handle it with the skill and dedication that my prosecutors do every day. Similarly, should it be a military commission, they will also handle it with the skill and dedication that they have also shown. I've been honored to have hosted General Martins on more than one occasion in my office and have a positive relationship with him. And should I be confirmed as Attorney General, look forward to continuing that relationship with him and all of our partners in the War on Terror. Well, I'd like to thank you for your uh, patience, perseverance, professionalism, and your graciousness today. Um, you've run out of senators almost. Um, seem to have. I'm going to, in the absence of our chair, uh, there's only one other senator, I think, that uh, is potentially available for questioning. I know that they're on the floor right now voting. Um, I ran over to, to get a few questions in. So what I would suggest is that we take a 10-minute recess, if you're amenable, and uh, we'll find from the chairman if uh, Senator Tillis, who's the last remaining, I think, um, person to ask questions, um, and we'll see where we go from there. So I think we'll stand in recess for 10 minutes, and thank you again for your graciousness and perseverance today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you.
Just as soon as the room, just as soon as the room quiets, I'm going to recognize Senator Tillis. Uh, I think it's quiet enough. Senator Tillis, would you proceed? Please Thank be. you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Lynch, congratulations. It's uh, quite an honor to be in the, uh, the place that you are today. I want to compliment you on your distinguished career. And uh, I've also noted over the course of your uh, testimony just how much pride is in the eyes of your uh, friends and supporters here. So congratulations. I will. I've looked over. Um, I, I had a question for you, and it stems from, oh, oh, I also want to thank you for dealing with last week when we had to move the uh, venue and the time around for the meeting. I appreciate your graciousness and spending some time with me last week. And I really want to maybe start where we left off with some of the discussions. And I think that uh, Senator Flake and Senator Lee and Senator Schumer have also echoed the concerns about the, the limited resources and how you would prioritize things within, the, uh, uh, within your future prospective new responsibilities. And um, I, I guess the, uh, something that strikes home for me has to do with certain elections laws. And in and, and North Carolina, um, I'm, not, I'm not familiar or how familiar you are with some of the elections laws that have been passed over the past couple of years, but uh, in the context of at least one case that was brought against the state of North Carolina by Mr. Holder, um, where the law was, was more or less the foundation of that law was the Indiana law, which has been held up by the, or upheld by the Supreme Court six to three. Uh, given the limited resources within the AG's office and the Department of Justice, what are your thoughts on pursuing laws that are likely to end up in the same state, particularly laws like North Carolina that went much further than the Indiana law that was upheld? Certainly, sir. Um, I believe that the right to vote, obviously, is the cornerstone of our democracy. As do I. Um, and certainly I think that states obviously have an interest in protecting that right to vote also, as well as regulating it and making it safe and free and open for everyone. And I believe that many states are acting with exactly that view in mind. Um, certainly with respect to the, the, the North Carolina statute and case, I know that it's under litigation now. I believe there will be a trial at some point in time. I'm not familiar with the status of the case now, so I can't comment on that specific case or that specific statute. But what I can say is that with respect to how the department will look at voting rights issues is with a view towards protecting the right to vote and hopefully working with the states to ensure that all the interests are met. Certainly all voter ID laws are not problematic. As you've noted, as you've noted the court has outlined situations in which they are useful and serve a fundamentally important purpose. And the department has, um, under the previously utilized doctrine of preclearance actually approved voter ID laws. So I don't think that we can at this point, without knowing how a case will be presented, say which way the department will go in viewing it. But given the fundamental importance of the right to vote, should an issue be raised, it is something that the Department of Justice has an obligation to review and consider whether or not it should uh, get involved. In, in, the, uh, in the example of the uh the law that was passed by North Carolina um, and the case that was brought uh, against, this, uh, against North Carolina. In fact, I was named in the case because at the time I was Speaker of the House. Um, I'm just curious how, as you go forward and you're dealing with the challenges in this office of, as uh, I believe Senator Schumer said, trying to focus your resources on the bad actors, the hardened criminals, the difficult challenges that the department faces. Um, in a case that has some 10 uh, attorneys on it, focused on, uh, no less than 10, I believe, focused on that, uh, I would hope that uh, there would be some focus on is that the best and highest use if, given the, the merits of the case and other laws that have gone to the Supreme Court, that it's likely to end uh, in a situation where the, 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 it's going to rule in favor of the state and at the expense of those resources it could be used for other purposes. I mean, what, what is your thought on going into, uh, into this role and taking a look at cases like that and maybe determining priorities based, based on the likely outcome? Have you given any thought to that? Well, certainly, Senator, as we review a case, um, both throughout my career as a prosecutor and as U.S. Attorney, we always look to the possibility of how a court will view a particular matter. But first and foremost, 
whether the case involves voting or any other, for, any other important right, is the issue of what is the evidence that's presented and what is the relevant law, what is the interest being protected, and if it relates to a core function of the Department of Justice, such as protecting the rights of citizens, <coughs> keeping our citizens safe, or protecting the right to vote, it is a matter that we would be obligated to look into. Whether or not a matter would result in litigation would, of course, depend upon a variety of factors, which are not in front of me today, um, about the nature of the law and how it was written, um, and essentially whether it comported with those laws that were previously approved, both by the department and by courts. Certainly with respect to the North Carolina case, I believe the matter is in litigation. It's not something that I'm intimately familiar with. I have not uh, been involved in the management of that case to date. I look forward to learning more about it should I be confirmed. And I believe the matter will proceed to court, and we will await the results there. Uh, and Ms. Lynch, I do have a question just based on the, um, uh, the, the final comment that you made there. Um, with respect to the case, because it, it gives me some sense of whether or not we can look at this objectively and make sure that we're using the re resources of DOG, DOJ in the most effective way. I think in January of 2014, uh, you said that uh, people try and take over the State House and reverse the goals that have been made in voting in this country. I presume, since I was the person that took over the State House, I would be included by reference. And you go on to say, and in my home state of North Carolina, has brought lawsuits against those voting rights changes that seek to limit our ability to stand up and exercise our rights as citizens. So in, in my limited time, I know that I'll have another opportunity to ask questions. I had some sense that, uh, that maybe per perhaps you were somewhat familiar with what had been done in North Carolina. And again, with the backdrop of other laws that seem to have disposed of whether or not what North Carolina has done. I took great care to make sure that we, uh, we made heroic efforts to preserve everyone's right to vote. I may come back around and ask you a few more questions to, that, uh, uh, to this effect, but I want to move on to uh, something that's completely uh, out of there, and it has to do with something that's very important to me. I'm very, one of the reasons I ran was on veterans' issues and on um, taking care of those who have taken care of us. And one question that I have, I hope that you will look at and, and perhaps consider in my follow-up questions, giving me a response if you have time to speak with others. But the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program um, is a problem. We have people who are making claims there who are not getting their claims resolved on a timely basis. And I've heard a number of reports where uh, and this is in the event of a death that I would like to think that we would place a priority on resolving these claims and clearing the backlog. And if you have an opportunity, and you won't have a lot because you'll be sitting right there, but if uh, I could get some sense of what that will be as a priority if you are um, confirmed as Attorney General, it's something personally important to me. I think it's the most, at least we can do for the families. Um, the one other thing I'll tell you uh, that uh, I think that we're gonna find a lot of common ground should you be confirmed is on the issue of cybersecurity. I consider uh, this to be something that the, the Attorney General, all law enforcement, all prosecutorial districts across this nation need the tools to make sure that we get control of this quickly. Um, I'd like some idea that based on your knowledge of how we're currently doing, if you have any sense of where you would go as a priority uh, should you be confirmed. Certainly, Senator. With respect to cybersecurity, there are a number of areas in which, which would be my focus should I become confirmed as Attorney General. Within our law enforcement community, I would work to ensure that they had the technological resources needed to stay ahead of this threat, both uh, from a human resource perspective as well as computers uh, and the like. Um, with respect to the U.S. Attorney community and the Department of Justice community, I would make sure that, that our prosecutors receive the appropriate training to manage this important issue. As I've seen in my practice as U.S. Attorney, cyber issues are now in every area of practice that we have. That will continue to be the case, and I'm sure that should I become confirmed as Attorney General, I will see that throughout the Department of Justice. So I will work to strengthen the resources in the Criminal Division and the National Security Division that deal with these cases. But Senator, another uh, thing that I think is very important as we combat cyber attacks and deal with cybersecurity is the relationship between government and private industry. I believe that there's a very, very important collaborative relationship to be built there. It is being built. I've seen it. 
I have participated in conferences with both financial sector parties as well as pharmaceutical industry parties on this important issue. And we've had very, very good, positive, collaborative results involving the, the reporting of cyber attacks as well as law enforcement's ability to work with private industry to gain knowledge of their systems to prevent attacks as well. So I think we also, should I become Attorney General, one of my priorities would be strengthening this connection between government and private industry as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Schumer mentioned earlier, I meant to mention in my, my opening comments that uh, we have a number of very capable basketball teams in North Carolina beyond the Blue Devils and the Tar Heels, <laughs> many, of, many of whom I think this year could beat the Knicks. Well. <laughs> Well, Mr. Till, Senator, as, as, a, as an early Carolina fan, uh, I have to say that that is, that is likely true. <laughs> to uh, have uh, the various staff of both Republican and Democrat give us some inventory of the number of people that want a second round. And the second round will be eight minutes. I'm going to take about five minutes of that eight minutes and then go vote and I'll have to recess if nobody else is back here. So you can do what you want to do during that period of time. Thank you, uh, Senator. The first question was going to be a question, now it's just going to be a statement. So I'd appreciate if you'd listen to my point of view. Uh, you suggested earlier that prosecutorial discretion allows the administration to prioritize removal of criminal aliens from the country. Yet in fiscal year 2013, the administration released from its custody 36,000 aliens who had been convicted of a crime instead of removing them. According to the Department of Homeland Security, 1,000 of these aliens have already been convicted of another crime since their release. Just today, I received a 38-page document from the Department of Homeland Security that lists each of the offenses underlying those 1,000 post-release convictions, including things like assault with a deadly weapon, terrorist threats, failure to register as a sex offender, lewd acts with child under 14, aggravated assaults, robbery, hit and run, criminal street gang, rape spouse by force, child cruelty, possible injury, death. Uh, and so I'm going to put this in the record, but so my statement is this for you to consider uh, any, uh, you don't have to respond to it now. I could go on, but for the sake of time, that copy's in the record so anybody can review it. This suggests the administration is not prioritizing the removal of criminal aliens very well. So 1,000 out of 36,000 have committed further crimes, and who knows, maybe others. So if confirmed, my statement to you would be simply, you need to take a look at that policy. Uh, I'll, I'm going, I had two points in my second question, but Senator uh, Tillis asked about the uh, public safety officers Benefits. So he has heard the same thing from my constituents, uh, the same thing that I've heard from my constituents. In Iowa alone, there are three families who have been waiting for over three years and another that's been waiting since 2013 to receive benefits. Two weeks ago, I wrote the department about the delays and requested a reply by this Friday. Obviously, you won't be in a position that you can request that by or answer that by Friday, but I hope to get an answer because way back in 2004, uh, the Attorney General at that time made a decision that these claims should be processed within 90 days of receiving all the necessary information. So then I would go to the second one, which uh, is just, uh, well, let me go to it and then I'll, I'll ask you the question. Uh, there's a Brandon Ellingson of Iowa, you wouldn't know about this because it's an Iowa person, and a college student who drowned while handcuffed in the custody of Missouri state troopers after they arrested him on the Lake of Ozarks, May 2014. I've discussed the case with Attorney General Holder, had a couple telephone conversations. I'm very satisfied 
with his personally looking at it. Uh, it has gotten his personal attention. He has assured me that the department will look into the unanswered questions in this case carefully to see if there are any uh, federal laws involved. So all I'm asking you to do, uh, if and when you're approved, and uh, will you be able to uh, talk to Attorney General Holder, and if he doesn't make a decision by then, that you would personally examine Brandon, El Brandon Ellingson's case. I would certainly continue that resolve, Senator. Now I'm going to go and, and I'll recess for a while and then I'll come back and finish my second round. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.
thank you all. I'm sorry that we're in this um, unfortunate circumstance of having our hearing interrupted rather repeatedly, and um, it's not the best way to do business. Um, um, Ms. Lynch, I'm sorry that that's occurred. Um, we have been working hard in the Senate. Uh, Thursday, more votes were cast in one day than the entire year last year. And um, Senator McConnell promised that members would be able to offer votes. And so there's 18 more, I think, going to be cast today. And maybe that will bring come close to bringing the end to the, to the legislation that's out there. But um, I think it's part of our heritage as Congress uh, to have individual senators be able to offer an amendment and get a vote on it. So I think it's the right thing. But it's um, this hearing I wish could have been conducted more respectfully, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I have to have a clear answer uh, to this question. Uh, Ms. Lynch, do, do you believe the executive action announced by President Obama on November 20th is legal and constitutional? Just yes or no? As I've read the opinion, I do believe it is, Senator. Um, well, this is very troubling to me because it goes way beyond prosecutorial discretion, I think. Uh, it goes clearly to allowing someone to work who's unlawfully in America, uh, to take jobs that the statutes say they're not entitled to take. It gives people the right to participate in Social Security and gives them a number and as part of their work authorization to participate in um, other actions like Medicare. And I believe this is a fundamental question. It's been a part of the national debate. And the American people are very concerned about it. The polling number is very high. They do not believe. And in fact, the American people are shocked that we're seeing uh, this action from the president. After Congress was asked to pass legislation to this effect, and Congress rejected it. Do you believe that the president has a right to uh, uh, take action uh, in violation of law just because Congress refused to pass a law he asked them to pass? I believe, Senator, that the President is as limited by law as every citizen, and it is certainly the responsibility of both the President and the Department of Justice to follow the laws as passed by this body. With respect to other actions the President may take, depending upon the action taken, there may be a basis for, for certain actions or there may not be a basis for legal actions. And that is where I believe that the Department of Justice must apply its own independent, thorough legal analysis and, as with this particular opinion, ascertain whether or not there was a legal framework for some action and, as I, as I saw in the opinion, indicate that there was not a legal framework for some of the action that was requested and declined to provide a legal basis for that. Well. What it did approve, I think, clearly goes beyond the law. Congress authorized, uh, as, as, as passed certain laws that control uh, entry into the United States. We expect you, as a chief law enforcement officer, the president, who takes an oath to see the laws are faithfully executed, to execute those. And I've read the opinion, and it suggests that it suggests that faithfully execute means you use your resources as best you have to carry out the intent of Congress. Is that fundamentally? Certainly, so it sir. goes beyond just enforcing every single law. If you don't have the resources, you should try to use the resources you have to effectively carry out the law. Certainly, sir. Well, what I would contend is absolutely plain. I would contend that uh, You've gone far beyond that. You've actually created a new system of law, a new system of qualification, a new standard for who can work in America, a new standard for who can have Social Security and Medicare. And this is a fundamental matter of great importance. And uh, I just got to tell you, I'm worried about it. Uh, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Mr. Rifkin, uh, who's served two White House counsels, and, and uh, Ms. Professor, Law Professor uh, Foley concluded their piece this way. The OLC, that's the Office of Legal Counsel, who reports to Mr. Holder and would report to you that you're now affirming, uh, rendered a valid opinion, 
which you associate yourself with. This is what he said. The OLC's memo endorses a view of presidential power that has never been advanced by even the boldest presidential advocates. And if this view holds, future presidents can unilaterally gut tax, environmental, labor, and security laws by enforcing only those portions with which they agree. This is a dangerous precedent and cannot be allowed to stand. And frankly, uh, the Attorney General of the United States should have told President Obama that, urged him and, uh, to back off, presidents get headstrong, and he didn't do it. And now you're here defending this. And I believe it's indefensible. So I'm worried, I just want to tell you, that's a big, big problem with me. Uh, now, do you believe and do you support legalization of marijuana? Senator, I do not. Um, I know the uh, head of the DEA, who was a little bit out of step with some administration, I think, agreed with you on that. The president said this in January of last year. Quote, I smoked pot as a kid, and I view it as a bad habit and a vice, not very difficult from, different from the cigarettes that I smoked as a young person up through a big chunk of my adult life. I don't think it is more dangerous than alcohol, close quote. Do you agree with that? Well, Senator, um, I certainly don't hold that view uh, and don't agree with that view of marijuana as a substance. Um, I certainly think that the President was speaking from his personal experience and personal opinion, uh, neither of which I'm able to share. Um, but I can tell you that I, not only do I not support legalization of marijuana, it is not the position of the Department of Justice currently to support the legalization, nor would it be the position should I become confirmed as Attorney General. Well, I do think there's a lot, been a lot of silence there. I know the head of the DEA uh, did push back uh, and testified here pretty aggressively, but I think she felt like she was out of step within the administration. And I hope that you will cease to be silent, because if, if the law enforcement officers don't do this, uh, I don't know who will, and in the past, uh, uh, attorneys generals and other government officials have spoken out and I think kept bad decisions from being made. Uh, it's good to see Senator Leahy here. How many attorney generals have you presided over? Um, more than a few. How about a rough number? I'm trying to think who President Ford's uh, Go back to that. <laughs> or not preside, but I've been part of it. Well, um, he's been, it's been a pleasure to, to work with you on this committee over a number of years. Uh, Ms. Lynch, this is um, a big issue, this uh, immigration, because it represents, in my view, a presidential brute decision that he was rejected in Congress. And I do not believe and totally reject the idea that if Congress fails to act, then the president is entitled to act. Any more than I think if Congress fails to act, judges can just act. Mm -hmm. Because Congress, by not agreeing to pass a certain piece of legislation, has acted. It has made a decision. And that's where we are. There's still opportunities and still legislation moving. Um, they'll be considered as, as the years to come on all questions relating to immigration. There'll be a lot of debate and, and uh, that kind of thing. But under our system, uh, it is not justified in my view. Just one more thing I would say to you. Uh, I do hear a lot of talk, uh, a lot of loss of confidence in the Justice Department, a belief from professionals, prosecutors, and citizens that there's too much politics and not enough law. And I do think if you achieve this office, you need to know that. I shared that with you, I think, in our meeting. And you need to make it a central part of what you do uh, to reverse that trend and restore confidence that this Attorney General's office serves the law and the people objectively and not a political agenda. Thank hey, you, and uh, I'll recognize Senator Leahy. Let me uh, state, I'll be brief, but uh, when I was a young law student, I was invited into 
Attorney General's office was recruiting me to come to the Department of Justice. I asked the Attorney General how independent they were. I said, for example, suppose you had a prosecution that you knew was justified, but the uh, White House, you knew, might take a different view. He said, I'd have to prosecute because that's my job. That Attorney General is Robert Kennedy. He later prosecuted a man who was critical to his brother getting elected president. I contrast that to another attorney general in the last administration who testified here that, well, he's a member of the president's staff, so therefore, in effect, took orders from the White House. I kind of exploded on that. I said, it's not Secretary of Justice. It's the attorney general of the United States, not for the Republicans, not for the Democrats, but the United States. I think from what you told us you'd be that kind of an independent uh, attorney general. I also heard somebody criticize here this morning on the prosecution of Ted Stevens. I happen to feel he should not have been prosecuted. They neglected to mention that was during the last administration, and it was Attorney General Holder who got the conviction obtained in the last administration uh, removed from Senator Stevens. I assume from things you said before, and we are concerned in Vermont about the uh, increase of opioids and heroin, that you would continue to work with communities as the Justice Department does now. I mean, communities not just the federal level, but the state and local level to combat uh, this problem that's facing so many parts of the United States, not just my own state of Vermont. Senator, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, uh, certainly the issue of the growing numbers and uh, an amount of heroin abuse is of grave concern to me. I've seen it happen in my own district, and in talking with my colleagues in the U.S. Attorney community across the country, they have expressed similar concerns. As you point out, however, we are most effective when we work in partnership with our state and local law enforcement partners, and often de when dealing with the issue of opioid addictions in working with our public health community as well um, to find treatment for the offenders and possibly break the cycle of addiction. Many of my colleagues have, in fact, been engaged in efforts of exactly that type that have been very effective in lowering the addiction rates and, in fact, lowering the crime rate associated with heroin abuse. These are efforts that we can study and that we can share. We have to have a strong law enforcement response also, but we must involve state and local counterparts. Uh, we must involve families. We must involve treatment centers as well in dealing with this, with this seemingly intractable problem. Thank you. I would, there's no objection, we'll reserve the four minutes and 46 seconds left in my round of questions because I didn't realize another roll call was started. That'll be fine. We'll save that four minutes and 46 seconds, whatever, and uh, we'll stand in recess. Thank you, sir. So somebody returns.
The hearing will come to order. And first, I'd like to thank uh, my Republican colleagues for the courtesy here. We're all going back and forth voting. It would be rare to have uh, a third-ranking Democrat chair the committee, but we're all going and voting, and I appreciate that, and I'll try to be as quick as I can um, because of uh, my need to vote. So first, uh, um, Ms. Lynch, I read this morning that on the news you have something special from your late brother who was a Navy SEAL with you today. Tell us a little about that. Well, Senator, I have with me um, my late brother's trident, the insignia oh. of the Navy SEAL. It is something that I usually have with me in my office, but I often bring with me when I come down to the Department of Justice, and I have it with me here today. And it ensures that I have both of my brothers with me here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, having read and seen and met the SEALs, it's an amazingly difficult thing to achieve. And then, like you, in a different way, he was defending our country in one of the best ways you can. So we really appreciate that and appreciate your thoughts about uh, your brother. Okay, now I'd like to go to the next area. This morning, both you and uh, Senator Sessions and I talked about a topic, seems like a long time ago this morning. Um, so I'd like to just uh, talk a little more about that. Um, absent appropriate authorization from DHS, I just want to ask, is there any federal right for an immigrant who is not, a lawful, in, not in lawful status to work? No, there is not, to my knowledge. Okay, thanks. I think earlier you said you had a preference that all individuals here in the United States work regardless of status. I think a lot of us would share that preference. Uh, I think this is confusing for people because there literally are nearly a hundred categories of statuses or stati, whatever the right word is. <laughs> they didn't teach that at James Madison High School. Um, for people, uh, because you got to count green cards, non-immigrant visas, spouses of individuals on certain visas, parole, asylum, applicants for green cards, non-immigrant visas, immigration visas. Uh, many people who are uh, not U.S. citizens have a legal right to work. For example, green card holders work visas. We admit people to work on a work visa. So let me ask you just what did you mean by what, when you said uh, you think everyone should work regardless of status? Well, certainly, Senator, uh, when I made that comment, I was really making more of a personal observation. And I must admit, right. I have to be careful here because my father is here and my mother is watching. Um, but certainly in my family, as we grew up, we were all expected to um, try and find employment as part of becoming a responsible adult and as part of becoming a responsible member of society. So I was making a personal observation based on the work ethic that's been passed down to me by my family, not a legal observation. Right. So again, to reiterate, you don't believe that there's a federal right for an immigrant who is not lawful here to work? No, sir, not, not at all. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that because I think, I wish Senator Sessions were here. I think uh, uh, he wasn't certain about what you said. I think now the record is 100% clear. Um, Okay, one final question. This is uh, about uh, a myth, another of the myths that's out there. A generally deferred action policy eliminates case-by-case -case consideration is therefore illegal. That's what some people are saying. Uh, deferred action is actually, like many federal policies, such eligibility criteria, but then requires case-by-case -case consideration. So only a limited set of individuals, those with deep ties to this country, uh, and without a criminal record, can apply for deferred, deferred action under the President's uh, proposal. But that's not all. After they register, pay a fee, undergo criminal background and national security checks, the President requires DHS officers to scrutinize every single case individually to make absolutely sure the person is not someone we should prioritize for deportation. So I have two questions in regard to that. Doesn't it make eminent sense for a program to set out guidelines at the front end and then still require careful individual consideration at the back end before anyone is approved? 
Certainly, sir, that would make eminent sense and would provide for a careful review of every applicant. And I believe that's what the President is intending to do. We haven't seen all the regulations yet, but that seems to me what he said. Couldn't one argue that other discretionary guidelines and programs like federal contract bids take a similar approach? We lay out broad criteria, but then they review each contract, contract by contract. Contract by contract and with rigorous application and screening. Great. Okay. Uh, I want to thank again my colleagues for deferring, and uh, I will pass not only the questioning but the gavel <laughs> to Senator Graham. A dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> that will only last for eight minutes, so <laughs> I'm going to enjoy it while I can. Uh, your brother was a Navy SEAL. That's got to be, <clears throat> that's a major accomplishment. It's the, probably the hardest thing to be in all the military. So I know your family's proud of, uh, of him and what you've accomplished. Do you agree with me that <clears throat> one of the worst possible outcomes is for the United States to release somebody from Guantanamo Bay to go back to the fight to kill an American SEAL or anyone else, that we should really make sure we don't do that unless we absolutely have to? I certainly think that um, anyone coming from either Guantanamo Bay or any of our facilities, uh, we should take appropriate steps to make certain they do not place Americans in harm's way. I couldn't agree with you more. We've got a 30 percent release rate. And from a SEAL point of view, they're usually the guys in capturing these folks. It's got to be bad for morale for one of the guys that you captured to wind up killing your buddy down the road. So I really do believe that the policy we have at Guantanamo Bay needs to be reviewed and reviewed closely for not just all SEALs, but for all who have been fighting. Uh, now, about being at war. Do you believe we're at war? We are at war, okay. Senator. Now, I've been a military lawyer for 30-something years. You've been a prosecutor for a very long time. I believe in all the above approach, that military commissions have a place in this war and Article Three courts have a place in this war. Do you agree with that? I do, Senator. I do agree with that, Thank you. that by principle. <clears throat> now, under military law, the main objective when you capture an enemy combatant is to gather intelligence. It's not prosecution. Does that make sense to you? That is certainly one of the important objectives under military law. I would add, however, though, that with respect to the Article Three prosecutions that I have been involved in through my office, a primary goal is also to obtain cooperation okay. and thereby valuable intelligence. Here's what I would suggest to you, uh, ma'am. This is the Army Field Manual. It's over 300 pages. I helped write the Detainee Treatment Act <clears throat> with Senator McCain to make sure that we did not torture people. I, I believe waterboarding is torture and is illegal. But in this Army Field Manual, which sets the parameters for detaining people and interrogating them, not one time does it suggest that you should read the uh, enemy combatant their Miranda rights. Do you know why that would be? Well, I certainly think the Army Field Manual has proven to be a very effective way of handling high-target um, detainees. Uh, all I would suggest, ma'am, that anybody in the military would reject out of hand that it's a good way to gather intelligence by providing the enemy combatant a lawyer. In World War II, even though Miranda didn't exist, and all the wars since then, no one's ever suggested to our military that once you capture an enemy combatant that you give them a lawyer as a better way to gather intelligence uh, versus holding them under the law of war. So here's my recommendation to you, that we've caught several high value targets in the last year or two. We've read them their Miranda rights within days or hours of capture. You'll never convince me that criminalizing the war is the best way to gather intelligence. I want to talk to you about this. I want to have more flexibility than we have in the current system. If we do not hold some of these people under the law of war for questioning as an enemy combatant, then we're going to lose the ability to gather intelligence. And the only way you can protect this nation is to, det is to interrupt the next attack mm -hmm. because the people we're fighting do, my do not mind being killed. Can an American citizen be held as an enemy combatant? Senator, with respect to an American citizen, I believe there would be a prohibition against holding them, at least against us holding them as an enemy combatant. Ma'am, that is not true. We have held several American citizens for a multiple period of years as enemy combatants. Hum Humdi versus Rumsfeld. Before I vote on your nomination, 
I want you to read Hamdi versus Romsville and ex parte Curran, where American citizens collaborating with the Nazis landed at Long Island to try to attack the country. They were tried by military commission. Military commission trials are not available to American citizens. They have to go into Article Three, but we have under our law in Hamdi versus Rumfeld the idea there is no bar to this nation holding a one of its own citizens as an enemy combatant. What recommendation, I want you to read those two cases and get back with me and see if that changes your mind. What recommendation would you give an American citizen when it comes to joining ISIL or Al Qaeda? What would you tell them to do? Senator, with respect to an American citizen or anyone, who seeks my opinion on joining ISIL or Al-Qaeda, my recommendation would be do not do it or you will face American justice. Well, not so much you'll face American justice. You're going to get killed if we can find you. You may get killed before we can find That's you. That's right. But if we find you, we can kill you. Anwar al you, you you know that guy? Yes, he is. He do you was. think the president acted within his constitutional authority to uh, use a drone against him? So with respect to Anwar al-Awlaki, I'm familiar with him as he has figured in the radicalization of some of the defendants who've come before the Eastern District of New York, as well as a very active al-Qaeda leader. I'm not familiar with the, ra with the ways in which the decision was made to use the drones let, let, let against me tell you, him. Let me tell you how I, it was made. There's an executive process where there are executive agencies that evaluate the threat that every individual presents to the country. In the case of an American citizen, there are very strict criteria. But if they meet those criteria, the president can order the use of lethal force. I promise you, in every war we've been in, American citizens, for some reason, have decided to side with the enemy. And they've been viewed as an enemy combatant, not a common criminal. The president of the United States, I think, correctly authorized a drone attack against Anwar al who is the head of al-Qaeda in Yemen. Uh, would you want to look at that before you give me the answer? Are you comfortable with that process? Would you like to look at that process and get back with me? Well, Senator, I'm comfortable with the process as you describe it. What I think it illustrates, however, is the need to, as you put so eloquently at the beginning of our discussion, use all of the tools available to combat this war. And I just want to make sure that as the Attorney General of the United States, you understand one of the tools to combat this war is to use lethal force against an American citizen who our government has determined to be part of the enemy force. The second tool is to hold an American citizen or a non-citizen under the law of war for the purposes of intelligence gathering. Those are two tools in our toolbox that have been used for decades. I want to make sure as Attorney General you recognize those tools are available to us in this war as we go forward. Read these cases and get back with me if you could. Absolutely, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, online gaming. Are you familiar with the decision uh, by the Office of Legal Counsel in 2011 to basically say that the pro prohibition in the Wire Act was uh, limited to sporting events and contests? I'm generally familiar with the results. Do you agree of that. with that decision? I haven't read that decision, Senator, so I'm not able to really analyze it for you. Um, certainly, I think it was one interpretation of the Wire Act that was. Would that you was agree with me that one of the best ways for a terrorist organization or criminal enterprise to be able to enrich themselves is to have online gaming uh, that would be very hard to regulate? I think certainly that what we've seen with respect to those who provide material support and finance into terrorist organizations, they will use any means to get to finance those organizations. I'm going to send you some information from law enforcement officers and other people who have been involved in this fight and their concern about uh, where online gaming is going under this uh, interpretation. Thank you very much. From my point of view, you've acquitted yourself very well, but I do appreciate if you would look and be able to answer my questions about uh, enemy combatant status for American citizens, the use of lethal force. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very, very much. And now I will turn it over to Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, staying with us and uh, even through the uh, hectic vote schedule. Um, I'd like to go back to civil forfeiture, uh, if that's all right, which was the topic we were discussing earlier um, before I left for the last vote. Um, first of all, I want to get back to the question I asked at the outset, 
<clears throat> do you think it's fair, is it fundamentally just that someone can have their property taken from them by the government without any evidence that they've committed wrongdoing, based solely on a showing by the government, based on a probable cause standard, that their property might have been involved in the commission of a crime, perhaps without their own knowledge, their own consent, their own awareness on any level? Do you think that's fair? Senator, I think that we have a very robust uh, asset forfeiture program, both criminal and civil. With respect to civil forfeiture, I've looked at the program in general. Again, the Department is conducting a review of the forfeiture program. Um, and with respect to civil forfeiture, there are legal safeguards at every step of the process, certainly as instituted or, or implemented by my office and my understanding by my U.S. Attorney colleagues. So there will be judicial review before there can be attachment or seizure, for example, as well as an opportunity to be heard. And that, but that standard must be met before the seizure warrant can be issued. I understand. I understand. A lot of Americans um, uh, don't believe that that's fundamentally fair. And again, that's why in many states there have been laws enacted that restrict the use of civil forfeiture under those circumstances and impose additional requirements, which is why I raised the concern about the process by which the Department of Justice has on occasion in the past uh, used something known as adoption, uh, whereby they will take something that, that could not be forfeited under state law in state court, uh, and they'll, they'll utilize the resources of the U.S. Department of Justice to assist in the forfeiture. The U.S. Department of Justice retains 20 percent and then yields back 80 percent uh, to the state or local law enforcement agency. Uh, this is troubling, and, and, and you appeared to be aware when I asked you about uh, this, you appeared to be aware about an order that Attorney General Holter issued just um, about uh, a week and a half or two weeks ago, I believe it was on January 16th, uh, restricting that. Um, so I, I assume you're familiar with that order. Uh, there was an order um, or, or policy directive from the Attorney General to the field, and as U.S. Attorney, I did receive that, and it essentially ends the adoption program. As you point out, Senator, a number of states now do have a robust asset forfeiture program on their own. When the federal program was being instituted, at least the research shows, many states did not have this program. And so a lot of the local law enforcement agencies that have been using the adoption program initially did not have a venue to effectuate legal seizure of property that had been used in a crime. And the adoption program began several years ago primarily as a response to that. That has changed. That legal landscape is very different. That certainly was one of the reasons set forth in our discussions uh, when the policy change was made. Okay, so th this order that the Attorney General issued on January 16th, um, you refer to it as essentially ending this adoption program. Again, the program by which the federal government can assist state and local law enforcement agencies in circumventing their own state law restrictions on civil forfeiture. Uh, but when you read the order, you see that it's subject to several exceptions. One exception applies uh, with respect, I think you, you referred to this uh, uh, briefly before um, uh, when you and I spoke a, a few hours ago. Uh, one exception relates to property that directly relates to public safety concerns. Fair enough. Uh, then you turn the next page. You look at the, the second to last paragraph, which contains some additional carve-outs. This order does not apply to one, seizures by state and local authorities working under, working together with federal authorities in a joint task force. Two, seizures by state and local authorities that are the result of joint federal state investigations or that are coordinated with federal authorities as part of ongoing federal investigations. Or three, seizures pursuant to federal seizure warrants obtained from federal courts to take custody of assets originally seized under state law. So, as I see it, uh, Ms. Lynch, th this, this order, while purporting to end this adoption program, as, as you say, is riddled with loopholes. It's riddled with loopholes that effectively swallow the rule, uh, which seems to be a recurring theme today, uh, uh, which, which is something that concerns me greatly with this department. Now, I understand that this order was issued, um, uh, uh, it has been issued prior to your um, confirmation after your nomination prior to any confirmation vote on your nomination. But I would just ask you to, to take into account these concerns and, um, uh, and, and to, to work with me moving forward on making sure that our civil forfeiture programs don't get out of control. Um, 
but would you agree with me that we really ought to find ways to stop federal law enforcement agencies um, from helping state governments to circumvent their own state law restrictions on civil forfeiture? Senator, I believe that the policy change that ended the adoption program certainly ends that as the problem that, has, that had been raised. Um, as you pointed out, these were situations where local law enforcement made an initial stop or seizure. So the seizure was not essentially begun by a federal agent or partner. Um, and then the matter was brought to a federal agent for adoption and processing through uh, the asset forfeiture equitable sharing system therein. Um, the other situations to which you refer, where there is either a federal state task force or a joint investigation, really are situations where there's actually a federal case from the outset, and there would not be the issue of, of having to review the state laws, and they would not be an option in that case, because again, the case would be under federal jurisdiction from the very beginning. So as you've pointed out, uh, the initial adoption program did raise concerns, and I understand that those have been discussed in the public discussion uh, venue as well as in law enforcement circles as well um, about the issue where the state has a robust system of asset forfeiture, but that system is not being used and the federal system is being used instead. The adoption program ends that practice. It, it, it ends up, but subjects to some very large loopholes, and so I just ask you to be aware of that, and uh, uh, I, I'd like to discuss that with you more moving forward. Um, before my time expires, I want to get back to uh, another question I asked earlier. Um, just uh, in, in, indulge me in, in this hypothetical scenario. We didn't have time to fully explore it previously, but imagine uh, you're in a state in which there is a 55 mile an hour speed limit. There are a lot of people. Uh, who want that speed limit raised. Imagine that the chief executive of that state, the governor, really wants it raised to, say, 75 miles an hour. Uh, there is a lot of support within the legislature and among the public at large that there needs to be some reform to the speed limit law. They can't get to any one proposal that gets enough votes, and so nothing happens. The governor at that point decides that he will announce that um, anyone who wants to drive faster than 55 uh, will not be ticketed, and they can apply for certification that they won't be ticketed if they want to uh, drive up to 75 miles an hour. He says, I can't guarantee this forever, but I can guarantee it for the next three years. Uh, I, I will not be enforcing that. Would that, under that hypothetical scenario, n not be tantamount to a, a usurpation of the legislative role that belongs to the legislative branch? Well, Senator, with respect to your hypothetical, before I could provide a response, I would certainly want to understand not just the factual framework that you've outlined, but the relevant laws governing the, um, the situation, as well as any prior state action, any actions that had been sanctioned, all the types of things that would go into rendering a legal opinion. And certainly, as I'm sure you can appreciate, um, I'm a careful lawyer, um, and I would want to have all of that information before I could really give you a legal opinion as to your hypothetical situation. Okay, I understand, and I, I respect the great care that you uh, uh, devote to answering questions, and um, uh, but I, I would respectfully submit that uh, at some point there is a limit to what a chief executive can do, whether we're talking about a chief executive in the form of a governor at a state level or whether we're talking about a chief executive who's the president of the United States. At some point, I would hope you could agree with me that there are limits to what a chief executive can do. At some point, when saying, I'm not going to enforce this law, well, let's suppose it's not a speed limit, let's say it's, a, it's taxes. A future um, uh, uh, president of the United States, whether a Republican or a Democrat, says, I don't think we ought to have any tax rate above 25 percent. And at some point, that president can't get Congress to agree, so that president says, I'm not going to enforce any tax rate above a 25 percent marginal rate. We can think of lots of examples. At some point, there is a limit. And uh, I, I, I just, I, I, I hope that you'll recognize that and um, hope that moving forward, uh, should you be confirmed, uh, that you be one who's willing to point out to the President of the United States that you do have a client. Your client is the United States of America. The chief spokesperson for that client might be the President himself. But your client is the United States, and embodied within that are the constitutional restraints that, uh, that, that fall upon every officer sworn to uphold, protect, and defend that Constitution, including the President himself. I see that my time has expired, and uh, I recognize Mr. Blumenthal.
Thank you, uh, Senator Lee. And uh, as a careful lawyer, which I know you are, uh, I want to try to perhaps set your mind a little bit at ease about a question that you were asked earlier, the question related to a statute that purportedly, according to the questioner, made the Attorney General responsible for determining who can take deferred action. One of my colleagues suggested that the President's executive order is illegal because it's being implemented by the Department of Homeland Security and not the Attorney General, as the law he quoted seemed to suggest. Uh, just to clarify, the statute that was quoted to you actually was amended in 2002. It no longer uh, assigns responsibility for immigration policy to the Attorney General. The provision that he quoted and another provision which more directly authorizes what President Obama has done are to be implemented by the Secretary of Homeland Security. So uh, good news, the President has done nothing wrong. and. Uh, you don't have to run home and look up the statute and, uh, and uh, get ready to implement a whole new area of law. I, you have enough to do, or will have enough to do already. Uh, I want to uh, personally say that uh, I appreciate that my colleagues are not making immigration uh, policy the kind of uh, turning point for their decision, or to put it a different way, they're not making this nomination a referendum on the merits of the President's immigration policy and decisions. Uh, and I must say, I agree with the President's action and support him. And so do uh, sheriffs and chiefs of police across the country. And I'm going to ask, if there's no objection, that Letters uh, that I have from towns as varied as Marshalltown, Iowa, Salt Lake City, Utah, South Bend, Indiana, be made a part of the record, and also a letter from the National Task Force to end sexual and domestic violence against women. Uh, both letters, all these letters make the case that the President's executive action not only helps immigration officials target their scarce resources, but it also helps state and local law enforcement to secure cooperation with immigrant communities and identify potential criminals within their jurisdiction. So the beneficiaries of the President's policies are not just the immigrants, but also law enforcement officials and people who are better protected by virtue of the activities of those law enforcement officials. If there's no objection, uh, I ask that these materials be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, turn briefly to another area where you have some very profoundly valuable experience. In the wake of the events in Ferguson, Missouri, and New York City of last year, many of us on the committee and many around the country who have backgrounds in law enforcement are deeply concerned with making sure the public understands the vital role that our police and our law enforcers in general play, as well as proper training and discipline that should be provided to those police and law enforcers. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about your experience in addressing the concerns about law enforcement in the wake of the Abner Luima case where you had a professional involvement and I think uh, how uh, you feel that that experience and new policies at the Department of Justice might better help the Department of Justice and state and local police. I would mention that I led an effort to pass during the last session a uh, statute relating to death in custody. It's a death in custody reporting act mm -hmm. that requires local and state police to report deaths in custody along with correction officials. It is actually a reauthorization of a law that expired in 2006, just a modest step toward gaining more facts. But I think there are obviously two sides to this kind of issue. 
and I would very much appreciate your perspective on it. Certainly. Thank you, Senator. With respect to um, my work on the Louima case, I was certainly privileged to be a part of the trial team that handled that case. Um, and I think what often is not commented on, and perhaps it is not even widely known, is how essential the support and contributions and the actual work of the NYPD was to both the investigation and the prosecution of that case. Our investigative team was comprised of both FBI agents and New York City police officers who knew that unless we held each other accountable, that unless law enforcement acted to hold bad actors accountable, all of law enforcement would suffer. And certainly one of the most painful things to watch during that case was, uh, as is often as is happening now, the understandable anger and tension over it, but uh, the backlash against larger groups of police officers. Um, and that is, in fact, one of the dangers um, of not addressing police misconduct, is that not only are the officers who work hard every day <clears throat> and, and, and work to, to not only follow the rules, but to enhance the relationship between law enforcement and the community, those officers are not rewarded, uh, but they often get painted with the same brush as officers who may cross the line. And that is one of the greatest harms that we see from these types of cases. I've been privileged to work with dedicated police and agents my entire career. Um, and I, I think that there are, there are no greater teachers and no greater instructors for a young prosecutor than an experienced police officer. One of the things that we found most useful after the Louima case was encouraging community policing, which the NYPD was doing on its own. And a number of officers did very, very well. I've seen situations where when I was handing out awards to officers and agents for working on a case in a, in a mostly minority area, um, cleaning out a housing project of a violent crack organization, the residents asked if they could also come and hand out plaques to those same officers and agents. And they did so with plaques that said basically, thank you for giving us back our safety, our security, and our houses. Because there was a collaboration there. There was a recognition that this is a joint effort. This is a shared project that we all have between law enforcement and all the communities that we serve to keep all of us safe. We also have to work more and certainly if confirmed as Attorney General, one of my priorities will be to ensure that our police officers have the tools that they need to do their jobs and to do them safely. Senator, I spent several weekends this past month attending the funerals of Detectives Ramos and Liu in New York City. And the, to use the word heart-wrenching is frankly an understatement. The sense of loss and grief uh, with this, this crime that has really touched the heart of New York City was palpable on every street corner. We cannot allow our law enforcement officers to be targets like this. We must provide them the protections they need to do their jobs as well. So certainly it is a priority of mine. I look forward to working with you to address the legislation that you describe as well. Because the more we can get, get adequate information about these deaths in custody, the more we can put effective regulations and rules and training in place to prevent them. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent answer. And I can tell you that the grief over the loss, the assassination of those two brave and dedicated police officers was shared in Connecticut as a former United States attorney as well as state attorney general. My own experience has been that some of the strongest condemnation of improper conduct or impropriety on the part of police officers comes from the police and other law enforcement themselves. And they have the toughest job, one of the toughest jobs, in my view, that exists in public service. And I hope that the public appreciates it and that, as Attorney General, you will work with Congress to try to educate and make the public aware about the tremendous challenges they face day in and day out and the courage and strength that they demonstrate. So I thank you for, for that answer. And Thank you again for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, whoever the chairman is. <laughs> it's a flexible answer. That, well, I know that the chairman is the senator from Texas. <laughs> that, that's a nice answer to that question. Uh, Ms. Lynch, thank you for uh, your endurance at what has been a, a, a long extended hearing. Um, I, I, I would ask in, in, in 
this round of questions, if you could try to keep your answers brief because we've, we've got to return to uh, votes on the floor. Uh, in the prior round, uh, you and I had a conversation about the OLC opinion and the President's executive amnesty, and, and you stated your agreement with the legal reasoning in that OLC opinion, and, and I would like to explore the limits of that reasoning. As you know, any legal theory that is being put forth to justify government power naturally raises the question, what are the limits of that power? And one of my greatest concerns about the Holder Justice Department is at every turn when asked what are the limits on government power, the answer has been there are none, there are none, there are none. So let's talk about the limits uh, of the prosecutorial discretion power. The OLC mem memorandum justifies uh, executive amnesty in part based on prosecutorial discretion. And initially that was limited to some 800,000 <coughs> people in the original DACA. Then in the subsequent executive amnesty that expanded to four or five million people. Uh, my first question to you is, is in your understanding of prosecutorial discretion, is there anything to prevent that from being expanded from four or five million people to all 11 or 12 million people who are currently here illegally? Well, Senator, as I read the legal opinion, um, it was focusing on how the Department of Homeland Security could best execute its executive discretion in prioritizing removals of the most dangerous of the undocumented immigrants among us. Uh, then with respect to those who would be a low priority, it focused on the legal framework for setting up a deferral program. Um, and as I also read the opinion, it went through a legal analysis that indicated that part of the request did not have the requisite legal framework um, and should not be implemented. And my understanding is that that, that particular um, part of the request was not implemented. Um, so I think that with respect to any action, certainly should I become confirmed as Attorney General, I would undertake a very careful legal analysis based on all of the facts presented to me by whether the White House or whatever agency raises the issue. We would look at all of the precedent, congressional action, the relevant statutes, and carefully explore whether or not the requested action did have a legal framework. If there was, in fact, a reasonable basis for it, as was outlined in the opinion that I read, that information would be provided. But, as also was outlined in the opinion that I read, where the legal framework did not exist to support the request or the proposed action, that would have to be told to the requesting department. Uh, Ms. Lynch, let, let me try again, because you described the memorandum, but, but I asked a pretty straightforward question. Would prosecutorial discretion allow the president to decline to enforce immigration laws against all 11 to 12 million people here illegally? Senator, prosecutorial discretion as a tool, certainly as I have used it as a career prosecutor and U.S. attorney, would focus on which cases to prosecute and which types of charges to bring. It would not apply to the situation that you have outlined, so I'm sorry if I'm not able to answer your hypothetical um, in the way in which you are requesting. As I have utilized prosecutorial discretion throughout my career, it has been with the presentation of cases before me and determining the best way to focus limited resources. Well, and, and of course, this is not simply prosecutorial discretion, because in addition to stating that federal immigration law would not be enforced with respect to somewhere between four and five million people, uh, the president also announced that, that, that the administration would be printing work authorizations and direct contravention of federal law. Now, are you familiar in, in your practice as, as U.S. attorney, when you have declined, when you've used prosecutorial discretion to prioritize prosecuting one crime versus another, have you ever engaged in printing up authorizations for one set of individuals to violate the law, to affirmatively violate the law, which is what these, uh, these work authorizations consist of? Senator, in my practice as a career prosecutor and U.S. attorney, I have focused on bringing the strongest, most effective cases based on the facts and the law against that, that have been presented to me. Also, in referring those cases to other law enforcement agencies, should my venue not be the most appropriate one there? Ms. Lynch, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we, we're on limited time, and, and 
What I asked is, is if in your practice you ever issued authorizations to violate the law, and, and that, I, I'm certain the answer is no, and, and, and it, but am I correct in that? Certainly, certain Senator, in my practice, I focus on the bo building the most strongest, the most effective cases against the perpetrators who come before me and referring them to other jurisdictions if I'm not the appropriate venue. Ms. It would not Ms. Lynch, be part you're of an, you're my an, responsibility Ms. to make Lynch, a determination Ms. Lynch, in the you, matter you are, you're referring to. You are a very experienced prosecutor. You have asked questions and had witnesses decline to answer. This is, this is a simple question. Has your office issued authorizations for individuals to violate federal law? Senator, as, as the U.S. Attorney, our office does not involved in issuing authorizations for anyone to work or not work or to engage in various activities. We're not a licensing authority. So I'm just not able, unfortunately, to answer the question as put to me. So your office has not. Is, are you aware of a precedent for the federal government doing what the administration is doing right now, which it's hired over 1,000 people? It is printing millions of authorizations for individuals to violate federal law. That, that is a remarkable step, and it is a step that goes much further than simply prosecutorial discretion. Are you aware of any precedent for hiring over 1,000 people to issue authorizations for individuals to violate federal law? Senator, I'm not aware of the practices that you are referring to now, nor am I aware of how the particular uh, remaining portions of the executive action are being implemented, so I'm simply not able to comment on the hypothetical as presented to me or the particulars that you've given to me. So I'm sorry I don't have the information to answer your question. Well, th then let me understand uh, the limits of the legal theory you're putting forth because you, in, in prior questioning, embraced the prosecutorial discretion argument. And so Senator Lee asked you a minute ago, let's take the hypothetical Senator Lee asked you about. If a subsequent president, uh, let's say President Cornyn is sworn in in January of 2017, and if President Cornyn decided that he was going to instruct the Secretary of Treasury not to collect any taxes in excess of 25 percent, to exercise prosecutorial discretion and not collect the taxes, in your legal opinion, would that be consistent with the Constitution? Senator, before I could render a legal opinion on the hypothetical as presented to me, I would want to know the entire scope of the action, but also have the time to, to gather all of the legal precedent, the cases, congressional actions, any other similar or dissimilar actions uh, where that particular type of action might have been considered. So I would certainly want to have all of that before I provided a legal opinion in, the, in terms of the hypothetical that you've presented to me. So, so you're unable to give any legal judgment to this committee today on whether a subsequent pr uh, president could decline to enforce the tax laws as they're written? I think with respect to um, current or subsequent pr uh, presidential action, there would have to be, as in every case, a thorough review of the relevant law, the precedent, congressional precedent, the statutes in issue, in conjunction with whatever action was being proposed to see if there was, in fact, a legal basis or whether there was not a legal basis for the action being proposed. Well, and, and let me ask, and this will be my final question, your understanding of prosecutorial discretion. Would it allow a subsequent president, President Cornyn, to state that there are other laws that the administration will not enforce, labor laws, environmental laws? Would it allow a President Cornyn to say, every existing federal labor law shall here, heretofore not apply to the state of Texas because I am using my prosecutorial discretion to refuse to enforce those laws. And in, in your judgment, would that be constitutional? Well, I can, certainly can't imagine President Cornyn taking that step. Um, but with respect to the hypothetical that you present, again, uh, Senator, I would have to know what legal basis was being proposed for that, and certainly I would review that law and if I were the person providing advice to future President Cornyn, advise him as to whether or not there was a legal framework for it or whether there was not a legal framework for it. If there was not, that would be the advice that I would provide to him. I must say I find it remarkable that you're unable to answer that question. I can answer it straightforward. It would be patently unconstitutional for any subsequent president to refuse to enforce the tax laws or the labor laws or the immigration laws for the very same reason that President Obama's actions refusing to force immigration laws are unconstitutional. And, and it is discouraging that, that a nominee who hopes to serve as Attorney General, 
either will not, will not give a straightforward answer to that question. My time at this point has expired, so I recognize Senator Franken. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Senator, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, I'm just a little shook up about this President Cornyn thing. <laughs> your worst nightmare. <laughs> okay, I just, I got here and, and suddenly Cornyn was president. <laughs> My world had changed. Um, I, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, Ms. Lynch, about something that, that's uh, uh, been a focus of mine since I first got to the, the Senate. Uh, and you may remember, I got there a little early. I got, uh, it took me a while to get seated. Um, and, and it's about uh, the, uh, the financial meltdown and how it happened and how it caused the Great Recession. Um, and it's about the, the credit rating agencies and their business model. And basically what happened uh, in the lead up to the, the meltdown was that um, banks uh, would put out financial, structured financial uh, products, uh, mortgage, uh, subprime mortgage-backed securities, say. And then they would pay, or, or I'm sorry, yes, they would, they would choose a rating agency like Standards & Poor's or Moody's or Fitch to rate it and give them a rating, and they would pay them. And, but they would choose them, and it, it turned out that a lot of junk got AAA ratings. And th this is uh, all kinds of, uh, not just uh, uh, subprime mortgage-backed securities, but uh, then bets on those, uh, derivatives. And then bets on the bets, and then bets on the bets on the bets. So when you had, the reason you had a house of cards collapse is because you had all these bets based on the original piece of junk. And what, uh, there was an incentive, a total conflict of interest, which is the, invest, uh, the uh, uh, credit rating agencies knew that if it, they gave a AAA rating, they'd get the next gig. So that's what they did. And uh, then Chairman Levin of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations uh, got some, uh, subpoenaed some uh, emails from within S&P, and they basically we're emailing each other, we've got to give these better, we've got to give these things that aren't good, these financial products, better ratings so we can keep our share of the business. And um, I've been fighting to get the, I, I, I had actually a bipartisan uh, piece in, in uh, the Senate side of, of, uh, of uh, what's now called Dodd-Frank, the Wall Street Reform Bill, to fix this, it hasn't totally been fixed and I'm on the SEC to do it, but this is what I'm getting to, is the Department of Justice is, has a big lawsuit <laughs> against S&P, and I think it's for about five billion, six billion dollars, and my understanding is it may be being settled. Um, but I just don't want this to stop with S&P, with, with the one agency. So what I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, and, and, and actually SEC just did a settlement also with S&P on uh, the same practice that still exists. So what I want to know is will you take a, an aggressive approach to holding these rating agencies, including but not limited to S&P, accountable not for their role in the financial crisis from before and, as, and, and, and their current role? in what they're doing. Senator, certainly with respect to the uh, financial institutions, including the ratings agencies, if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed as Attorney General, I do look forward to taking in a very aggressive stance in reviewing their conduct, as you indicated, not just past conduct, but current and prospective, so that we can prevent these types of harms from occurring again. Because um, Minnesotans lost their homes, they lost their savings, they lost their jobs. This is, and millions of Americans did this because of these guys. And I don't think they've uh, learned their lesson. I don't think they've been incentivized to learn their lesson. Um, 
Okay, I'm told I have to leave in two minutes, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, transparency in NSA. Uh, I have one minute. Uh, that, that took a minute, what I did. Um, uh, well, I just want to encourage uh, us to work together, if you uh, should be uh, uh, Attorney General, on uh, transparency in uh, government surveillance, because I, I, um, I think that uh, Americans uh, have the right to know to the extent that's not harmful, obviously, uh, what the what the surveillance what surveillance is like for example how many um, Americans data was captured say in the metadata but how much was actually accessed mm -hmm. and I think that that uh, had we done that and I had voted against these two programs 715 702 originally because they didn't have enough transparency and I think it's absolutely essential that uh, that uh, Americans ha know to, to the greatest degree possible without jeopardizing our safety, what is going on. So just your commitment to work together on that. Absolutely, Senator. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lynch. Uh, thank you, sir. Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> How are you holding up? I'm you, fine, sir. You hanging in there? You. Good. Um, Forgive me for jumping around a little bit, but there are a number, I know there have been a lot of different areas that you've uh, taken questions on, and I just want to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, first of all, do you recognize the uh, Second Amendment right um, to keep and bear arms as an individual right? Yes, Senator, and, and I believe that's also been decided by the Supreme Court as well. The Attorney General, the current Attorney General, um, and Department of Justice have been involved in a program known as Operation Choke Point that you're probably that you are probably familiar with to some extent. But this is a uh, collaboration by the Department of Justice and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, who partnered to discourage banks and other financial institutions from doing business with certain types of businesses, including uh, lawful uh, firearms dealers. Uh, documents from Operation Choke Point obtained by the House Oversight Committee showed that the DOJ and FDIC used intimidation tactics and categorized licensed and law-abiding gun dealers as having engaged in, quote, high-risk activity, similar to financial scams, prostitution services, pornography, racist materials, gambling, and drug paraphernalia. I'd just like to ask you, do you agree that it was inappropriate for the Department of Justice and the FDIC to associate licensed and law-abiding businesses with these types of uh, other, uh, obviously, illicit activities? Senator, I appreciate your concern um, over any department initiative. My, my familiarity with the Choke Point Initiative um, is based upon my understanding that it focuses on payment processing companies that are involved in defrauding consumers. And I'm not aware enough of the underlying types of businesses that the consumers themselves may have been patronizing to know about the facts that you raise. Certainly with respect to any initiative that the Department of Justice engages in, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, um, there is no room for improper bias or, or even personal views. We must look, we must follow the law where it leads us. And I certainly hope that should you have concerns about this program or any other, that you would feel free to share them with me and that I would look forward to working to provide you with as much information as we could about them. I appreciate that. I've heard uh, from constituents in, back home in Texas from financial uh, institutions that uh, they have been unable to continue longstanding banking relationships with their own lenders uh, because of some of these tactics, and I will take you up on your offer to uh, visit with you more about those, uh, the specifics of those cases, as well as uh, the topic I mentioned earlier um, at a later date. I appreciate that. Senator Leahy, who just has arrived, uh, and I have uh, joined in an unlikely partnership uh, on uh, freedom of information uh, areas. Um, he and I both agree. Um, that it is absolutely critical to the functioning of our democratic form of government that uh, the people 
have access to as much information as they can possibly get so they can uh, make their consent to the laws that are passed by Congress uh, informed consent. And so I want to uh, ask you, in the Department of Justice's evaluation of the Eastern District of New York under your management, compliance with the Freedom of Information Act was one of the few areas to receive criticism. Uh, in fairness to you, um, it is one of the few areas in which there have been critical comments. Mm -hmm. But do you believe that the government should operate under a presumption of that information should be open to the public unless otherwise uh, precluded by law? Senator, I share your concern and your view that the Freedom of Information Act is an important tool for the American people to know about the functioning of all government agencies, including the Department of Justice. With respect to my, my tenure as U.S. Attorney, uh, during the evaluation system, which I found very, very helpful, um, I specifically asked the evaluators to look at our management systems and our support staff systems to make sure that we were in compliance and to bring any issues to our attention. Uh, and they raised this issue, which was of great concern to me. Uh, we immediately took steps to rectify the issues that we found within our own office functioning. We have added increased personnel to handle Freedom of Information Act requests. We work closely with the Department of Justice to ensure that they are handled as expeditiously as possible. And so I actually found it a very helpful evaluation process. And I find that I've learned the most when someone has pointed out to me an area in which I might improve. And you as took correct, to corrective action? Absolutely, immediately. President Obama in 2009 mandated that uh, government agencies, uh, executive branch agencies, should operate under this presumption uh, that information should be open unless otherwise prevented by some uh, rule or some other law. Uh, the current Department of Justice has taken the position that, um, that information should be withheld if release of the information will cause foreseeable harm. In other words, they've articulated a different standard uh, than the president himself called for in 2009, which is this presumption of openness, uh, absent some uh, legal prohibition against disclosure. Senator Leahy and I have been working on some legislation which would actually codify uh, the president's mandate, the presumption of openness. Uh, is that a standard that uh, you could support? And would you work with us in uh, your administration, if confirmed? to make sure that this presumption of openness applies across government agencies and that information would only be withheld from the public if some uh, law or other rule or regulation uh, precluded it. Senator, I share your view in the importance of the Freedom of Information Act and in transparency. And certainly I look forward to working with both you and Senator Leahy to review that type of legislation. And I hope that in the full and fair exchange that I, I believe we will have, as we have had over the past few weeks, we can discuss ways in which to make as much information available possible while protecting vital interests. I certainly feel that, that with respect to the Department of Justice, um, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, one of the areas that we always have to be concerned about are ongoing investigations and witness safety and security. But I feel that through discussing these issues, um, it is something that we could work together on. And finally, I know the chairman uh, alluded to uh, the gun walking program known as uh, Fast and Furious, um, which was the subject of a lot of oversight efforts by this committee and others in the House. And uh, then to our surprise, the Attorney General, uh, Attorney General Holder, uh, claimed executive privilege as to certain communications and documents. Uh, even though the documents in question that did not involve the president or his staff, and the president himself confirmed that claim of executive privilege. As you may know, uh, that claim is currently in litigation, and um, I would ask your commitment to take a look at that with a fresh set of eyes uh, to see whether you believe that, that uh, uh, the department's defense and um, continued to refusal to deny Congress access to these documents is uh, um, justified under uh, a claim of executive privilege. Would you, uh, would you pledge to take a, a fresh look at that and uh, render your own independent judgment about, the, uh, uh, about that? 
Well, certainly, Senator, with respect to that matter, it is a subject of ongoing litigation, and I really do not know when it is likely to be resolved. So I don't know what status, at what stage it will be in, should I be so fortunate as to be confirmed. Certainly, however, I look forward to learning more about it once I'm able to, again, should I be confirmed, um, and, and reviewing that as well as any other matters. But just, just so we understand each other, and if this will be my last question, if you're the next Attorney General, you can decide to settle that case if you decide that the claim of executive privilege was not well taken. In other words, if, you, if there's no legal impediment based on a claim of executive privilege to disclosing those documents, you, as the next Attorney General, could uh, resolve that, couldn't you? Certainly, I believe that the ability to resolve any number of cases would rest within me should I be confirmed as the next Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I hope that when, you, when we're done here, that you don't get this attitude that the way this chaotic place is run, <laughs> that why, why should you be working with the Congress of the United States? It doesn't always work this way. So I'm just... It's a little, it? little tongue-in-cheek. It doesn't I, always work this way. <laughs> well, well, Senator, it's been a privilege to watch the peaceful transfer of power okay. that's going on this afternoon. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. But I, I, I didn't give him the great big gamble. <laughs> not, not so peaceful. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, before I read my question, I want to kind of tell you my view is that there's very legitimate reason for between uh, a, a, a consul that's, that's advising the president for that to have a very tight consul-client relationship. Then we get into Fast and Furious and then 64,000 pages that I'll go into some detail here that I want you to comment on that is maybe an argument it was privileged, but is it really privileged? So, let me go to where you maybe had uh, not a direct role, but you were chaired, you chaired the Attorney General's Advisory Committee. So you had a chance to watch your predecessor closely in the job that you're now seeking. And I assume that you learned lessons from that experience. What's the biggest mistake that Attorney General Holder made in the handling of the Fast and Furious controversy which involved this privileged information that we're talking about and what would you have done differently? With respect to the privileged litigation which is ongoing, while I as a, as a chair of the Attorney General's Advisory Committee and a member before that, mm -hmm. I was given general information about the nature of the investigation itself and the problems that, that lay therein. Sim simply put, uh, Senator, the focus in terms of providing information to the U.S. attorney community was more on the problems with the actual underlying firearms investigation. And so I was not privy and have not been privy to any of the decisions or discussion or rationale behind the litigation over documents or privilege. That is something that has not been shared with the U.S. attorney community. So I'm not able to really no. categorize, categorically answer one way or the other as to how that's been managed. I certainly think that the Attorney General himself has said that he's made mistakes in general, um, and he's, he's been very open and frank about that. With respect to that litigation, I simply don't have information about that. You are correct. I did receive general information about the underlying case because it did represent um, an investigation that certainly the review, the Inspector General's report, um, indicated was not handled in the best way and was not the way in which um, those of us in the U.S. attorney community would have wanted to see that case operate at all. Okay. Well, then, uh, you have probably have answered half, half of that in this sense. Would have you done anything differently? With respect to the uh, firearms the way, investigation? No, the way that the attorney general handled it. Well, with respect, certainly I, I think that having the inspector general review the firearms investigation itself and come up with the issues that occurred within the office and the handling of the case was something that I think will be useful to the Department of Justice as it seeks to prevent similar mistakes being made and improve training and the like. With respect to the litigation over the documents, again, I simply am, have not been involved in those decisions, and so I'm not able to say yeah. what the options were that the Attorney General had 
that I would have chosen in a different manner. So I'm sorry for not being able to provide okay. you with a direct response to that yeah. question. Well, let me go back to the privilege, and you may have answered this, but I want to read my question anyway. Uh, in my opinion, one of the Attorney General's biggest mistakes was not following through on the President's promise to be the most transparent administration in history. Instead, he became the first Attorney General in history to be held in contempt of Congress with a bipartisan vote that included 17 uh, Democrats. Attorney General Holder finally delivered 64,000 pages of documents to the House three years after the House subpoenaed, two years after the contempt vote, and only after the House went to court. So when push came to shove, he didn't even try to argue to the judge that those 64,000 pages were privileged. Now, do you think it's appropriate to withhold so many documents for so long, especially even if the Justice Department admits that there was no valid privileged claim? And if so, why? And if not, please explain why you'd do it differently. With respect to any issue where this body seeks information from the Department of Justice, um, certainly in documentary form, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I would carefully review the request and work to provide as much information as, we, as, as could be provided consistent with our law enforcement and investigative responsibilities. That would be my pledge to you going forward, Senator, uh, with respect to every issue of oversight that you would bring to my attention, and I certainly hope that you would bring those issues to my attention. Can I, ans can I ask the same question in my own way, uh, in the sense of uh, the way I might talk about it at a town meeting? Uh, so people are mad about, you know, a lot of things the uh, uh, president might do that you call executive uh, edicts, or in this case, uh, withholding information. In this case, the attorney general decided to withhold it. Okay, if somebody asks me about Fast and Furious at a town meeting, then I get into the fact that, as far as I know, the president knew nothing about it, and that this is between me and the attorney, or the attorney general and the Congress, I should say. I only say me because I started this investigation before the House took it over. Uh, then, then when they withhold 64,000 pages as opposed to a few pages that, where maybe the president really knows something about something that you can legitimately withhold it. Then I say to my town meeting, uh, you know, when 64,000 pages are supposedly privileged, then I wonder, what does the president know about it, if they can be protected that way? Well, now the, the, the attorney general didn't argue that they were privileged. They were just given up. So you see the problem it causes for me? And how far does executive privilege go? And it surely doesn't go to 64,000 pages, or if it does, can't you assume that the president knew a lot about Fast and Furious when he says he didn't know anything about it? Do you see the problem that I have? I certainly can, can um, understand the frustration when any party is seeking discovery or seeking information and another party is not able to provide it based upon a claim of privilege or whatever that claim may be. Um, particularly a body that has oversight responsibility over the Department of Justice and is seeking to fulfill that obligation and that mandate. Um, certainly with respect to the volume of documents, not knowing the documents, I'm not able to comment on how appropriate or not that would be. Um, and, I, and certainly, um, fortunately, it was not civil litigation when it might have been a larger number of documents. It was my experience as a young attorney. But I hope you at least understand why it's frustrating to me of the way this whole thing was handled. Uh, let me move on. Uh, as Senator Graham mentioned in 2006, you co-signed a Supreme Court brief on partial birth abortion. I believe you told him your primary concern was the impact of the law would have on law enforcement bro more broadly if upheld. That brief argued the federal partial birth ban Act was unconstitutional and that partial birth abortion, quote, procedures are sometimes the best means to preserve a woman's health, end of quote. The Supreme Court, along with the majority of Americans, disagreed mm -hmm. with uh, any position taken in opposition to that legislation, I assume, in, as well as your position. The Supreme Court held there is, quote, uncertainty in parentheses in the medical community over whether the barred 
procedure is ever necessary to preserve a woman's health. Just one question. Judging by your questionnaire, it doesn't look like you've added your name to a lot of Supreme Court briefs. Of all the cases that you could have become personally involved in, why did you pick this particular case? Was that the only case that raised the concerns you mentioned to Senator Graham? And I'd like to get this on record because I assume you read the brief, otherwise you wouldn't have signed it. Would that be right? Yes, Senator, that would be correct. Okay. So then can you, uh, uh, can you say why did you pick this particular case if, if you haven't done it very often? And was this the only case that raised concerns that you mentioned to Senator Graham? Thank you, Senator. With respect to the amicus brief, I joined a group of former Department of Justice um, uh, personnel, former United States attorneys, uh, as well as former assistant attorneys general. And our focus was on our concern that the way in which the law would be implemented might put prosecutors at variance with doctors and their medical treatment, um, and might raise an issue that prosecutorial that prosecutorial discretion had been constrained in some way by the political debate. We were not focused on the actual issue involving the procedure itself. Uh, in fact, it was our concern that as lawyers we did not have medical information or the medical capability to evaluate that procedure and could be dealing with a situation where a doctor may say something different from what the law might require us to do. And that was the concern that was being raised in that brief. Okay. Um, the Supreme Court did resolve the issue on the, on, the, on the part of the statute itself, and certainly that is the law of the land now. Okay. Uh, Senator Leahy. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And, uh, and for your uh, sense, for both your benefit and for the uh, nominee's benefit, I've been told that I have two additional members that want to come over to ask a uh, second round. They're going to come today? They're going to come just as soon? Yes. I'm going to make sure they come today. Uh, just as soon as the vote's over, I've been told. And we'll ha you and I'll have to go vote, too. Yeah. Uh, okay, why don't we just recess and we'll go vote and we'll come back. Okay. We'll recess. Thank you for being patient.
Thank you, Senator. In the exchange we just had earlier this afternoon, uh, you detailed a, a very broad understanding of the President's potential authority and that, try as I might, I could not find a hypothetical that you considered to be beyond the power of the President. I'd like to ask you now a question that I've asked Attorney General Holder and that he repeatedly declined to answer, and it's in a different context. It concerns the civil liberties and privacy rights of Americans and drone policy. And my question to you is, in your legal judgment, is it constitutional for the federal government to utilize a drone strike against an American citizen on U.S. soil if that individual does not pose an imminent threat? Well, Senator, cer Senator certainly I'm not aware of legal authority um, that, would, that would authorize that, nor am I aware of a policy seeking uh, authorization to do that. If you could share more information with me. My question is about the constitutional limits on the federal government's power. Attorney General Holder repeatedly declined to answer the question about whether it is constitutional for a drone to use lethal force against an American citizen on U.S. soil if that individual doesn't pose imminent threat. Now, let me be clear. I think the answer to this 
is very easy. My question to you is, is it constitutional for the federal government to do so? Well, Senator, I think with respect to the use of lethal force by any means, one would always want to look at the law enforcement issues involved there. And certainly, if you could provide more context there, I could place it in the, in the scope of a, either a case or an issue that I might have familiarity with. Ms. Lynch, it, it is in the nature of a hypothetical. But you are certainly aware that the federal government is currently using drone strikes overseas. The federal I'm government also maintains drone surveillance domestically here at home. This Senate had an extended debate on the limits of federal government authority with respect to the privacy and civil rights of American citizens. And I'm asking you, in your view, does the Constitution give any protection to American citizens? Is, is, does the Constitution allow the federal government to do what it has done overseas, utilize lethal force from a drone? Could it do so against an American citizen here at home if that individual did not pose an imminent threat? Senator, with respect to the use of, again, as I said before, with, of lethal force by any means, be it drone or someone on the street, the, the use of lethal force is generally regulated by either police guidance or by the nature of the interaction. Based on what you were describing to me, I don't see interaction between the American citizen that you are referring to and anyone to generate the type of lethal force that you are referring to. I, I, I'm disappointed that, that, like Attorney General Holder, you are declining to give a simple, straightforward answer, and in fact, what I think is the obvious answer of no. The federal government cannot use lethal force from a drone to kill an American citizen on American soil if that individual doesn't pose an imminent threat. I, I don't view that as a difficult legal question. And indeed, it demonstrates what I think has been the consistent failing of this administration's approach to constitutional law is that it always, always, always opts in favor of government power. Let me ask you a different question. This administration's Department of Justice went before the United States Supreme Court and argued that law enforcement could place a GPS on any American citizen's automobile with no probable cause and no articulable suspicion. And your legal judgment is placing a GPS on, on the automobile of the men and women gathered here with no probable cause or articulable suspicion. Is that consistent? with the Fourth Amendment's protections of, of American citizens? I believe the Supreme Court has resolved that issue, Senator, and I believe that the, that law enforcement agencies seeking to use that type of technique would need to obtain a warrant. You are correct. The Supreme Court resolved that issue. It resolved it unanimously, 9-0. It rejected the Holder Justice Department's position. My question is, if you were Attorney General at the time, would you have agreed with that argument? that law enforcement can place GPSs on any American citizen's car? Well, certainly, Senator, I wasn't involved in the legal analysis or discussion then. Based upon the practice prior to the Supreme Court argument and the fact that law enforcement had used various techniques, this was a new technique that was being evaluated and had been used in a variety of ways. So my understanding was that after a careful consideration of precedent and practice, the Department made a strong argument. The Supreme Court has reasoned and has ruled um, that a warrant is required. And certainly, that is the law of the land. Should I be confirmed as Attorney General, that is certainly the practice that I would follow. The Obama Justice Department 22 times has gone before the Supreme Court arguing for broader government authority. And 22 times, it has been unanimously rejected. 9-0, the court has rejected those claims. Another case was a case called Hosanna Tabor, where the Obama Justice Department argued before the Supreme Court that the First Amendment has no relevance, says nothing about whether a church may select its own ministers or pastors. Do you agree with that position that was put forth by this Justice Department? Well, Senator, I have not read the briefs on that, so certainly I'm not aware of the full articulation of that position. But I believe the Supreme Court has spoken and has resolved that issue. Certainly, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I would follow that precedent. You are correct again. The Supreme Court resolved that 9-0 rejecting the opinion, and I would note Justice Elena Kagan, an appointee of this president, said from the bench in that argument mm -hmm. to the Department of Justice's lawyer, I find your position amazing 
that the Justice Department would argue the First Amendment does nothing, says nothing about a church's ability to appoint its own ministers and pastors. Let, let me ask you, if, if you are confirmed as Attorney General, will you commit to this committee to provide greater scrutiny to the positions the Justice Department takes before the Supreme Court, and in particular, to stop the practice over and over again of advocating for broad government power, which has resulted in 22 times the Supreme Court unanimously rejecting that, that, that argument. Senator, should I be so fortunate as to be confirmed as Attorney General, I will take every case that comes before the Department of Justice seriously. I will consult with the career prosecutors there, also within the Solicitor General's office, on the facts of the case, the relevant law, and in conjunction with them, Give, provide my best judgment as to the approach to take. Is it your understanding of the role of the Attorney General that the Department of Justice should always advocate greater government power? Senator, my view is that the Department of Justice um, advocates to defend statutes as passed by Congress and that its greatest function is to represent the American people. With respect to specific cases, again, I will always do as I have done in, throughout my career as a lawyer. I will carefully examine the facts of the case, the relevant law, precedent, and make the best reasoned argument that there is to support the position that's being advocated. Well, let's shift to another area where this Department of Justice has not been, in my view, faithfully enforcing the law. In May of 2013, the Inspector General of the Treasury Department concluded that the IRS had wrongfully targeted citizen groups for their political views. When that news broke, President Obama publicly said he was outraged. He said he was angry, and he said the American people had a right to be angry. Ms. Lynch, do you agree with what President Obama said then, that the American people have a right to be angry at the IRS targeting citizens for their political views? Senator, my view is that uh, political views or bias have no place in the, uh, in the way in which not only the Department of Justice, but all agencies carry out their duties. And certainly, when people hear of something that raises that issue, I can understand their concerns. In the nearly two years that have transpired, the individual who led the IRS office in question, Ms. Lois Lerner, has testified twice before Congress and has pleaded the fifth which, as you are well aware, means she raised her hand and said, if I answer your questions, it means I may incriminate myself in criminal conduct. In the nearly two years since that, that time has transpired, not a single person has been indicted. The nearly two years since that time has transpired, many of the victims of the illegal targeting have yet to be interviewed by the FBI or the Department of Justice. And in the nearly two years that have transpired, we have discovered that the Department of Justice appointed to lead the investigation, a partisan Democrat who has been a major donor to President Obama and the Democratic Party. Indeed, she has given over $6,000 to President Obama and the Democratic Party. In your view, is it consistent with fairly and impartially enforcing the law to have an investigation into the abuse of power by the IRS headed by a major Democratic donor? Senator, my understanding of that investigation is really from public records. I'm not familiar with the specifics of it. I can certainly tell you that complex investigations often do take several months, if not a year or more, to resolve. And I don't know the status of the witness interviews at this point, so I'm not able to provide you information on that point that you raise. With respect to how an investigation is staffed, again, I believe that, that um, while I'm not familiar with the details of this, Certainly, I, my view is that the department has career prosecutors who are devoted to the Constitution and to the fair and effective exercise of their judgment, um, and that the department has made the decision as to how to best staff the case and manage the case. I'm just not able to comment on the length of time or other issues that you raise. Certainly, should I be confirmed, I look forward to learning more about the matter. And I, as, as I've said before, Senator, I appreciate your raising concerns with me, and I hope that you will continue to do so should I have the opportunity to work with you in the future? You know, one of the terrific things about the Department of Justice is that it has a long and bipartisan tradition of remaining above the fray from partisan politics, of demonstrating a fidelity to law. 
so that when serious accusations of abuse of power, and in fact of abusing the IRS, were raised against Richard Nixon, his Attorney General, Elliot Richardson, a Republican, appointed an independent counsel to investigate those allegations free of any taint of propriety or partisan bias. Likewise, when serious allegations of wrongdoing against William Clinton were raised, his Attorney General, Janet Reno, a, a Democrat, made the same determination to appoint an independent counsel, Robert Fisk, to investigate the matter free of partisan bias or taint. The question I would ask you, if you are confirmed as Attorney General, would you commit to this committee to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate the IRS abuse of power, who at a very minimum is not a major Obama donor and who can be counted on to actually investigate the facts and follow them wherever they may lead. Senator, again, I'm not familiar with the investigation in great detail at this point. My understanding is that that matter has been considered and that the matter has been resolved to continue with the investigation as currently set forth. Should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I can commit to you that I will take seriously every allegation of abuse of power brought to my attention and in conjunction with career prosecutors and this body where appropriate, make the best decision about how to handle that investigation. Ms. Lynch, you're correct. The, the, the matter has been considered. Indeed, I sent a letter to Attorney General Holder laying out the facts and asking him to follow the bipartisan tradition of his predecessors and uphold the rule of law. And he responded in writing that he was declining to appoint a special prosecutor. And the basis of, of his declining to do so was the, quote, discretion of the Attorney General. So despite the internal DOJ rules that require recusal if there's even an appearance of, uh, of bias. The Attorney General refused to appoint a special prosecutor. You've stated you're not familiar with this investigation. I think that's unfortunate because when you and I visited over a month ago in my office, we talked about this investigation. I told you it was a very serious concern of mine and I asked before your hearing if you would take the time to familiarize yourself with what had occurred. And yet, your answer today is that you're not aware of what's happening. Let, let me ask a more general question. Would you trust John Mitchell to investigate Richard Nixon? You're referring to former uh, Attorney General Mitchell? Yes. Again, Senator, again, I'm, based on that hypothetical, I'd have to know what the issue was and what you were requesting him to do. Would you trust John Mitchell to investigate the allegations of wrongdoing in the break-in at Watergate against Richard Nixon? Would you trust John Mitchell, who had run Richard Nixon's campaign, to investigate the allegations that ultimately led to Richard Nixon resigning the presidency? Well, I think that matter has been resolved. Uh, indeed. Um, um, and certainly with respect to how that matter should have been handled and Attorney General Mitchell's involvement in it, I believe his role in it um, has been resolved as well. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not able, I'm not, I don't think I'm understanding the basis of your question, sir. Ms. Lynch, th there are many of us who are alumni of the Department of Justice who have most respected the department when it demonstrated independence from the president, when the department was willing to stand up to the president, when the attorney general behaved not as if he or she were the personal lawyer for the president who appointed them, but rather when the attorneys general in both parties have behaved as independent, impartial law enforcement officers who owe a fidelity to the Constitution and the laws. Prior to becoming attorney general, Eric Holder had a reputation as a U.S. attorney of upholding the law. And I was hopeful when he was appointed that he would carry that reputation forward as Attorney General. It has saddened me greatly that he has not done so. And I will say it is disappointing in this hearing that try as I might, there has been nothing I have been able to ask you that has yielded any answer suggesting any limitations whatsoever on the authority of the President. That does not augur well for this committee's assessment of your willingness to stand up to the President when the Constitution and the laws so require.
Do you agree with that characterization? Senator, as I've indicated before, I believe that the role of the Attorney General is to provide their most objective, well-researched, independent legal advice to the President or any agency who may come before them with a with request for an opinion. And where there is a legal basis for the request being made, to indicate so. But where there is not, to also tell the President or any other executive agency that what they are asking for is not within the framework of the law. I believe that that's the role of the Attorney General. I believe the Attorney General must represent the people of the United States. And should I be so fortunate as to be confirmed, they will be my client and they will be my first thought. The they that you refer to as your client, I, I just for clarification, uh, to, to whom did the they refer? I'm sorry. They refer to the American people. And yet, and I'll, I'll ask again, can, can you articulate any limitations on the authority of the President that as Attorney General you would be pre prepared to stand up and tell the President, no, there is some modicum of power you do not have? Senator, I believe that the role of the Attorney General does encompass the role of advising the President of when actions do not have the appropriate legal framework and when they may not be undertaken. That is something that I believe is an important part of the functions of the Attorney General, and certainly should I be so, confirmed, so fortunate as to be confirmed, is something that I would not hesitate to do. It is part of the function of the Attorney General, even though a Cabinet member, to be independent of the President and to provide their best independent legal judgment on any issue presented to them. Well, I hope that you will very much carry through on that. It is discouraging that in the course of this hearing you have been unwilling to say that the President lacks the authority to refuse to enforce tax laws, labor laws, environmental laws, immigration laws, that you have declined to say that the President cannot order a drone strike on an American citizen on U.S. soil, and that you have refused to commit to a fair and impartial investigation of the IRS abuse of power by a special prosecutor. I hope, if you are confirmed, that your conduct in office differs from the answers you have given at this hearing. My time has now expired. Um, I see Senator Leahy is here, so I recognize Senator Leahy. I'm, I see Senator Tillis here, too. I'll withhold my time that I have. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Ms. Lynch. They, uh, I wanted to go back to, and I, and I do apologize for all this cycling. If you saw all the activity over in the Senate chamber, you know why we're going through it. Certainly not for an, uh, a lack of interest in this important topic. But I, I want to go back to the, the idea of the limited resources within the DOJ and some matters that um, I'd like to get some sense that uh, if, if you should be confirmed, that you would take a look at it and potentially reconsider some of the priorities of uh, the current Attorney General. And I'll, I'll give you one example. In, in North Carolina, we did change the election law, early voting. We went from 17 days to 10 days. In that law, though, we made it uh, by law, you could never offer fewer hours of early voting than the, the highest number that you'd ever offered in that particular county. Um, and, and what that had the effect of in this last election cycle is historic uh, turnout even among minorities. And so uh, I've got a, we've got a lawsuit um, filed by this Department of Justice uh, where I'm named in it, um, questioning that. But then we have 12 states that have no early voting whatsoever. And I'm wondering why it, it, it seems to be inconsistent when you have one state that's preserving the most that it's ever had before, other states that have never offered it, that we would, in, the, in, a, in a time of limited prosecutorial resources that we would actually allocate that way, given all that's been said today about the limits of resources and the need to allocate them to their best and highest use. Can you give me some sense of your thinking on that? Well, Senator, with respect to the current litigation that's been filed, um, I haven't been involved in it to date. I do know that it is proceeding through the courts, and I believe there will be further action this summer. There may be a trial. I'm not sure. Um, and so I think we will have to wait and see the, the judicial determination on the impact 
of the changes in the North Carolina state law. As I indicated earlier, states obviously have a grave interest and a great interest in both preserving the right to vote and protecting um, the integrity of the vote. And many of them do so in ways that are effective um, uh, throughout several states. Um, the Department of Justice will, will always have a concern if it, the matter is raised as to whether or not there is a negative impact, that is to say a foreclosing of the right to vote. And certainly people can differ on the impact that will be had, um, and that will always be the issue um, in a case that to be brought along those lines. And certainly nothing, I don't believe anything would have been personally aimed at you, sir. Oh, no. uh, but, um, so with respect to that, when, when the issue is whether or not a change in statutes somehow infringes upon this, our most important right, mm -hmm. it is something that the Department of Justice will always review. But certainly, sir, I look forward to having discussions with you about the nature of, not in this case as it's under litigation, but other matters um, in which the department is taking an interest and in getting views of you and others on this committee on them. I think it's very important because uh, should you be confirmed, I think, again, I think we'll, we will always be in the state of not enough resources for all the things that we want to do. And it just seems to me that, there, that this may be one example where if you looked objectively at the Supreme Court case, uh, states that are doing everything that they can to respect and promote uh, a citizen's right to vote, that to spend our uh, additional time and resources re-prosecuting um, laws doesn't seem to be the best use of resources in the context of the limited resources that we've discussed and, and, and many several members on this panel have discussed today. And I would uh, look forward to, uh, should you be confirmed, to having a discussion with you about how we can be sure that we are putting it to the best purposes for, for the good of the American people that, are, that you're trying to serve or that you will try to serve. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Senator Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to serve with you and also to serve with uh, our former chairman uh, and uh, appreciate the opportunity today. I just want to pursue, to me, some legal rights here. It seems to me that if there are two people applying for a job as a truck driver, one um, is a lawful immigrant or uh, a citizen and another is not, um, under the president's order, uh, the person unlawfully here magically at this moment becomes eligible to compete against an unemployed American truck driver. And um, I think that's bizarre. And the idea that there are rights that might attach to someone here <coughs> unlawfully to take jobs from Americans on the difficult working conditions as we are today is antithetical to common sense. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, we, somebody needs to be asking themselves who is protecting the American worker? The people who are paying the salaries of you, the president, and all of us. And as a matter of law, the people who elect us are the people we are most directly accountable for, and that's the citizens of the United States. Uh, so I'm, I'm worried about that. What kind of lawsuit, uh, what kind of claim have you thought about this that might somebody who loses out to a person who claims that they're legal to work now because of the president's order and they didn't become a truck driver and the person that was recently legalized did get the job. Mm -hmm. Well, Senator, at the outset, I, I, I um, do want to state that it's my understanding that and there, there is no right to work for an undocumented immigrant in the country, so they would not um, have the right to work. For well, those they would who, under the president's order, would they not? For those people who can obtain documentation, be it a green card or a visa or other cards, they would have the ability to apply for positions. Um, with respect to... Well, could I ask you about that? Um, the president is going to give work permits to 5 million. They would be, under his theory, entitled to work. He would have created 5 million persons to compete against 5 million Americans for a limited number of jobs, right? 
Senator, I believe that if the process were to be implemented as what I reviewed, there would be criteria set up for people to apply for work permits. They would, they would apply. There would have to be a decision as to whether or not they would receive them. And then I do not know what level of employment they would be able to apply for, but assume that they, they could apply for positions. Well, the uh, estimates are, I think, from the White House, it would be as many as total of five million. And uh, they would be given work authorization, photo IDs, social security numbers, and the ability to participate in social security, and Medicare. Are you aware, uh, and to me, I find no lawful basis for this. And as the attorney general and the person who supervises the Office of Legal Counsel, whose opinion you've basically affirmed here today, then you become, in a sense, the point person for this effort. And some have suggested, well, it's Homeland Security. But Homeland Security asked your department, Attorney General Holder's department, the Office of Legal Counsel, for an opinion that would allow them to do so. So in effect, had the Department of Justice said no, uh, that uh, this is not appropriate and cannot be justified, Homeland Security would have been bound by that re rejection, would it not? Homeland Security would have been bound by that opinion, as I believe they were with respect to the portion of their proposal to which the Office of Legal Counsel did say, no, there was not a legal basis for another portion that they sought to implement. And I believe they did not implement that. With respect to the deferral... Well, I'm only talking about what they did agree to. That apparently would be to create this new number of workers. Um, well, are there plans to... What if somebody not in the five million uh, is arrested for speeding next week? Would they be deported? Well, Senator, I don't know how the Department of Homeland Security would manage the removal. Certainly a criminal record, if there were to be an arrest and a conviction, would place someone at jeopardy of, of, um, in jeopardy of losing their deferral status if that's what they initially had. Well, the point is, that you're not going to deport any of the seven million either. Uh, that's the policy that's become clear in the last few years. And um, so the administration, I would suggest, quite plainly, is nullifying American immigration law to a degree that's breathtaking in effect. Uh, for example, you're saying that um, we, uh, not only will we not find the resources ask for the resources. Nobody's asked for more resources uh, to enforce the law if they need them. The president isn't asking for it because he has no intention if it were given to him to use that money for that effect. So that's the problem we've got. That's why the American people are wondering who's going to defend them? Who is going to defend their children who are out trying to find a job? African Americans who have the highest unemployment rate among young people? Uh, the data is clear. Uh, this large flow of immigration at this time uh, of low employment is hurting the poor the most. Uh, so I would say to you that uh, I'm not raising this just to make an argument about what kind of immigration policy we need. I'm raising this as a constitutional and legal question of incredible importance. As I read to you, professors have said this is one, perhaps the greatest presidential overreach in history. Uh, the Congress refused to pass what the president wanted to do. And I'm not saying that you made that decision. You didn't. But your department uh, gave the legal opinion that justified it after he, 28 times, said he didn't have authority to do it. It's un a really an amazing event. So. Mr. Chairman, I, I respect the nominee. Uh, uh, she's got a good family. I know was raised right, and um, I appreciate that. Maybe you're just in a difficult position that's not necessarily your fault, but I am not satisfied that we at this point in history uh, can just slide by and let this go. I think we need to... Uh, uh, confront this issue as a Congress that use, needs to use the powers that it has to defend its legitimate rights under the Constitution 
and um, that's why I have difficulties with your nomination. I respect you and appreciate your um, appearance today and your willingness to answer questions. Thank you. Be before I go back to Senator Tillis for three or four minutes, uh, call on Senator. That's right. Uh, but, but let me assure everybody that uh, Senator Tillis, Senator Leahy, I I've got a couple requests of you, uh, and then I think we're done. Thank you. Another roll call vote has started. I'll, I'll be leaving soon. I'm sorry there's been so many questions that really have nothing to do with your qualifications. Um, you were shown a book and told them this is terrible what's happening, the implication being something this administration did. The prosecution of Ted Stevens, of course, is the last administration that did that. This administration exonerated him. Um, be that as it may, we talk about immigration. We've had millions of people here that every administration known you can't just remove 10, 12 million people. That's what President Reagan said, both President Bushes said. I've been here since President Ford. They've all taken that same position. Um, as far as jobs are concerned, the Chamber of Commerce strongly supported uh, the immigration bill that this committee passed two years ago and the Senate passed by a bipartisan, uh, bipartisan majority. Uh, Grover Norquist, a very conservative economist, said it would add billions of dollars, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars to our uh, economy passed and would increase jobs, not decrease them, but increase jobs. Uh, I wish the Speaker of the House had allowed it to come to a vote over in the other body, it would have passed. But that's not an issue for you, an issue, are you qualified to be Attorney General? I've, uh, I've seen a lot of Attorneys General in the 40, now going on to my 41st year. Some are very good in both parties. Uh, I think of Ed Levy, for example, in Jerry Ford's administration. Others, I remember one that I I think all my Republican colleagues voted for. But when he was here before this committee and asked questions, we gave him 50 or 60 of the questions in advance, and he answered 70 to 75 times. I don't know the answer, or I'm not sure I can't answer that, even though it had the questions weeks in advance. They voted for it. I must say that I ca cannot think of anybody in all these years I've been here who has struck me so much as being qualified to be Attorney General as yourself. Uh, I said earlier, you're a prosecutor's prosecutor. Uh, I think of the Attorney General as the Attorney General of the United States, there for all of us. I just refer to my days a young law student being recruited by then Attorney General Robert Kennedy, but I was just too homesick for Vermont, so didn't, didn't stay. Uh, I'm not going to ask further questions because I'm satisfied with what you said so far. You will have my vote. You will have my strong support. And I hope in the remaining part of this administration, None. You will be there to enforce the laws of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have nothing further to say. I'll put the rest of my statement on the record. Senator. Thank you, Senator. Senator Thank you, Senator, and I, and I apologize. I should have taken care of this question. But my, my final question, Ms. Lynch, is really around the philosophy that you may bring to the Department of Justice. In December 2014, the Government Accountability Office issued a report that was titled, The Department of Justice Could Strengthen Procedures for Disciplining Its Attorneys. Uh, there were a couple of examples uh, going back to even, um, I think, the handling of uh, New Orleans police officers related to the Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, uh, where either misconduct or uh, they had perjured themselves. Would you agree with me that the Department of Justice employees who would engage in this sort of activity, uh, either through prosecutorial mis uh, misconduct or uh, through perjuring themselves in court, are they the kind of personnel that you would allow to continue to be employed in the DOJ? 
Certainly, Senator, with respect to personnel issues, I take very seriously the integrity of every member of my staff and if confirmed as Attorney General, would also take very seriously the professionalism of the members of all the staff of the Department of Justice, all of whom I have found uh, to have been a privilege and a pleasure to work with and to be dedicated career uh, professionals and dedicated to not just improving their skills, but the higher standards of professional conduct. When they cross a line, they are dealt with, and that will continue to happen should I be confirmed as Attorney General. But I will say that with respect to the staff, and the attorneys at the Department of Justice, they are some of the most effective and professional individuals that I've had the pleasure to be affiliated with. Well, should you be confirmed, since this report was just dated last month, I hope that it's something that you would take into account as you go into the organization and look at the, uh, the resources that you've inherited responsibility for. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much, and thanks to the family yeah. in particular. This I know it's a long day, and those seats aren't that comfortable, so thank you all. And again, congratulations on the honor that uh, that you have uh, from the president's nomination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. I, <clears throat> I've changed my mind. I'm not going to ask you two questions. I'm going to submit them for, along with some other questions, for you to answer in writing. Uh, I thank you very much for being patient today. It's been a long day, and I suspect some members of the committee were more impressed with your answers than others. We're going to recess for the day and have our second panel tomorrow. I think you should, I hope you'll count yourself lucky, let's say compared to Judge McKaysey, uh, to when he testified, he was forced to come back for a second day of questions. Finally, I'd like to note that after tomorrow's panel, I'm going to give everyone one week to submit questions for the record. That's standard practice in this committee, and once again, Thank you for being so patient and, uh, and putting up with the chaos that I've formerly referred to. Thank you, and we are recessed now. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.